and welcome back to the third and final day of the Student Entrepreneurship Week 2020. I'm Sikim Kizia, I've been your co-host for the past three days and I've been captaining the ship alongside my co-host Sakumzi. How are you Sakumzi? I'm good Ziggy. Good morning. Khwemore, Molweni, Dumelang, Ninja Nomshanje, I hope on Saroka. Are you still fastening your seat belts and you're ready for this flight? Because today we are about to land. Um, and as we are landing today, keep on being active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know the page, EDHE Student Entrepreneurship, our hashtag, as you know, EDHE Afrotech, hashtag SEW2020. Yes, 100%. And please keep engaging on um, our Hoover app. So a quick look at the leadership board as it stands this morning. Hazra, you are in position number one. Girl, I hope you hold it until the end of the day. And then you can be our winner for today. By the end of today, we will be announcing our final um, leadership board winner who will get a 150 rand take a lot voucher. Um, and then today we'll be doing a social media winner instead of a photo competition. So as the committee said, please do engage with us on social media. Um, and we'll pick somebody who has the highest and the best engagement across all our social media and you'll be receiving a 150 rand take a lot voucher as well. But for now, here are the highlights from yesterday's episode. So I loved it. I loved today. Uh, I loved our presenters. The entire team behind the scenes is also fantastic. We have uh, our AD team pulling strings behind the scenes, and it's and the program is looking great. So love it, love it, love it, love it. Today was incredible for me. Um, the fact that different universities are in support and are providing resources and spaces for even entrepreneurs to fail but get back up again. So, but I was really impressed by the launch lab at Stellenbosch University and the fact that it's not only mainly just to push you to be an entrepreneur because there was an incredible story of a lady there that had a failed project but then she became an intern now and now she has an amazing job in a space company, something that she's passionate about. So that was a highlight of my day. The one thing that did stand out for me was UCT's contribution and they had Prof. Pekeng speaking a bit and encouraging student entrepreneurs. So I think that it's encouraging to see that the VCs of the different institutions are also taking part and taking lead and you know leading those conversations and leading in those spaces to encourage entrepreneurs. So I believe in doing this we are dropping little seeds all over South Africa and there's going to be a great, great ripple effect where we'll harvest a lot of students where we're going to meet them one day. So you know because of SEW 2020, I'm I'm now growing an incredible business. I'm now global. I've employed about a thousand people. So that's what is exciting to me. And, and I believe that this is a purposeful or a rather purpose driven event and a purpose driven conference where we, we are going to create or encourage and inspire young entrepreneurs to just take on the world and disrupt and grow and go to the global market, learn and just be big and big and big and big. And big. That is the madness behind the scenes, but we do have a good time putting this together. And these past three days would not have been possible without our sponsors. So we do want to say a big thank you to University of South Africa, to EDHE, to UCDP, as well as the Department of Higher Education and Training. And we also do want to give a shout out to one of our students who won the Afrotech Design Competition, who designed wow. the wonderful t-shirts that Sakumzi and I are wearing. So a big thank you to Bapile Dube. Congratulations. And we will keep wearing your t-shirts and showcasing your brand. But you really did come up with a wonderful concept to display Afro take. So our program today has come together with a combination um, of different universities that have been contributing to the various sections and this morning we're going to be looking at creative entrepreneurship and our first contribution comes from the Vol University of Technology. Here's a video that they've sent through for the program. Good day, my name is Maggie Lennington. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor teaching, learning and student support services at the Vile University of Technology. The Vile University of Technology is really excited to be part of Student Entrepreneurship Week. Part of our mission as a university is to produce entrepreneurial graduates. 
Entrepreneurship at student level allows students to develop ideas or see new ways to extract value from existing concepts. Student Entrepreneurship Week allows them to take it to the next level. This helps build confidence and gain experience. We are looking to build entrepreneurial graduates in students by building passion, leadership, self-motivation, helping them to understand issues of risk and applying knowledge to new areas. The Global Entre Entrepreneurship Monitor evaluates entrepreneurial activity across the world and in 2013 they suggested that a third of the difference in economic growth and economic activity among countries may be due to differences in entrepreneurial activity. Currently we are facing huge job losses and high unemployment that has been made worse by COVID-19. So now is the time to support entrepreneurs and to stimulate economic growth. Entrepreneurship is to do with the business of change. And with artificial intelligence, big data and data science, and the opportunities presented by the fourth industrial revolution, it is an opportunity and a window of of opportunity for us to exploit, for entrepreneurs and businesses of the future. So as a university, we believe we need to go beyond our role of just producing science and technology graduates, but to produce graduates that can produce novel commercial applications. As a university and participating in Student Entrepreneurship Week, we seek to provide a protected environment where students can experiment with new ideas and follow their passions. We need to take our students to communities because it's often through community outreach and engagement that new ideas develop. Finally, we need the faculty to act as coaches and mentors so we can create an incubation climate and culture within the university that is broader and wider than just an innovation hub. I hope that all participants in this Student Entrepreneurship Week students and faculty find this an inspiring experience that unlocks their creativity and passion. Thank you. My name is Onika Tandiwe Machege from Val University of Technology. Hashtag Student Entrepreneurship 2020. My category is Creative Entrepreneurship. These are the presentation outlines that I'm going to present. I'm going to look at the background information, describe what is entrepreneur and what is entrepreneurship, define creativity and describe how to become, how are you going to be able to generate your business ideas using methods and using the techniques. The last one is how to screen business ideas, looking at products and services. So it's highlighted in red because I'm not going to cover that part. I will cover it in the next session. South Africa is in extreme need of entrepreneurs in order to arouse the country's economy, while at the same time focusing on reducing high rate of unemployment. Students graduating from higher education institutions are faced with ever-changing job environment. Job permanency is no longer a crucial factor of career these days. Reduction of unemployment rates and alleviation of poverty in South Africa can be achieved by the development of entrepreneurial spirit among the students who establish new business ventures. Some students, they don't know what is an entrepreneur. They want to know what is an entrepreneur. In higher education, there are emphasizes that students should be entrepreneurs, but students, they don't know. So an entrepreneur is an individual or a person who has an ability to be creative identify opportunities, create and develop business by adding value to the business, using the scarce resources such as finance, effort, people and skills, as well as time. And they take calculated risk. Entrepreneurs are not gamblers, but are people who evaluate their environment and look at the opportunities and threats and look at the weaknesses and strengths and start their business. But then what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is a process of establishing a business from identifying of business opportunity and innovation, through planning, managing, and growing the business. Entrepreneurship is a discipline. The science of entrepreneurship concerns the function skills of business and management, and this would appear to be teachable via conventional methods. 
but the art, however, relates to the creative and innovative aspects of entrepreneurship. And these do not appear to be teachable in the same way. You can give students a lot of information about what is entrepreneurship, the characteristics of entrepreneurship, advantages and disadvantages of entrepreneurship, but it's difficult to give them the art of becoming creative. It is up to the students themselves to be creative to be innovative, to look at opportunities and be able to establish their new ventures. So what is creativity? Students are being told to be creative, but what is creativity? Creativity is a process of being sensitive to problems, deficiencies, gaps in knowledge, missing elements, disharmonies, and so on. Identifying the difficulties, searching for solutions, making guesses and formulating hypotheses about the deficiencies testing and retesting them, and finally communicating the results. In a nutshell, to be creative is to be able to look at the problems or to look at the uh, opportunities and capitalize on those uh, opportunities. When you are looking at a problem, you must be turned the problem into opportunity. These are the techniques that one can use to be creative. I won't go one by one, but the, the second one is brainstorming. You can sit down and have a number of ideas as to how to start a business. That can be ideas relating to your field of study. Because some students, they are studying engineering. Some, they are studying business management. Some, they are studying biotech. But when coming to create business, they want to start something different. No, you don't have to go far. You need to look at the knowledge that you have already gathered. You need to look at the skill that you have already gathered. And as students, you can brainstorm. You can brainstorm within your faculty. You can brainstorm inter-faculty, where you go with your ideas to other businesses, where you go to the, with your ideas to other students who are studying other businesses. So we find that most of the students who are in engineering, they've got product ideas, but they don't have expertise in accounting. They don't have expertise in marketing. So these students, they, they need to collaborate, combine themselves, and work together in order for them to be able to identify those business ideas, screen them, and start business new ventures. So one could ask, what are the methods of generating products and service ideas? Because some students are not from the background of business management. They don't know how. But the first one is accumulation of knowledge. You can accumulate knowledge from internet. You can accumulate knowledge from trade shows or exhibition. The reports that are from a research, postgraduate research dissertation. Isn't it that the students, they are engaged in research? Maybe they are researching about water and they found solutions. They make recommendations. So when you conduct research, you don't only stop where you come up with their findings and their recommendations, but you can take those findings and those recommendations and try to apply them to find out whether they are working or not. If they are working, then you will be able to solve water-related problems because you have undergo an in-depth research pertaining water. Near observation, I put some pictures to see that we've got a lot of problems. So rage problems, cable theft problems, dumping problems. I've just mentioned few problems. You can observe few people queuing, long queues. You can observe within your field of study different problems and different opportunities. By mere observation, you can be able to generate the business ideas. Generate business ideas from common needs. Everyone needs something, but not everyone needs the same thing. What are the needs of the people out there? You can start with your own needs. What irritates you? You can start with the needs of your family, the needs of your family members, and you can go out. What are the needs of the students? What are the needs of your community, your society? In trying to satisfy those needs, you will be generating the business ideas and you will be able to start your business. You can also start your business ideas by looking at the existing problems. Instead of thinking of un, uh, unfulfilled needs, you can think of existing and unresolved problems. What are unresolved problems? We have a lot of problems in South Africa, but it takes students from different faculty to be able to identify a gap and fill that gap with the knowledge that you have already gathered and the skill that you have already gathered. Think of things that irritates you. Now think of ways of, remo of, removing, of removing those irritations. You can generate your business ideas from talent. So I posted uh, 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 pictures of young people who've used their talent, whether it's working in TV, whether it's singing, whether being a comedian. 
You can look at yourself, assess yourself. What is your skill? What is a God-given talent that you have? You can start from there. Are you beautiful? Did you win a beauty contest? You can start your business from there. So you need to assess yourself and find out what are the skills within yourself? What are the God-given talent within yourself? In conclusion, I would like to say the first step in setting up a business, merely identifying and developing a business idea was discussed. So we have discussed how one can generate business ideas. Though because of time we didn't identify every aspect that you can look at when you generate your business ideas. Secondly, a business idea does not always have to be innovative, but it must stand out from other comparable and competitive products or services in one or other way. So by starting a business, you don't have to be too much creative, starting, uh, trying to invent a new world. No, look at the problems. What are the problems out there? You can still be innovative, but you can be a copying cat entrepreneur. Look at the missing element. Some problems were solved, but they were half solved. So you can come in with your idea to complete what have already been started. I'd like to thank you, Onika from Valley University of Technology. I'd like to thank all the students who are going to participate in Student Entrepreneurship Week. Hashtag Student Entrepreneurship Week is encouraging students to become entrepreneurs. Good morning, Sambonani Dumelang. My name is Noluta Andesikwacha, and I am the Director in Business Development for Jamfet Civil Engineers. We are a 100% young black and female-led construction company located at 122 Phase 1, Chaville in Gauteng. We have been in existence since 2016, and our main focus or what we specialize in is uh, building construction, civil engineering, as well as building maintenance. My partner and I are very passionate about creating employment or giving this young graduates an opportunity to do that in self training. We have been involved in, in, in a couple of projects in the Val Triangle in the City Bank district. Um, we have done some excavation works, um, we've done some office renovations, some house renovations, electrical works, we've done some plumbing works, we've done some building works, and um, it, is, it, is, it is a great thing to say, Jorge, we have been able to give an opportunity to a few students um, to be on the field and to get experience in what they've been studying for. The black child in South Africa has been put and put under a lot of stress by a lot of negativities that are happening around her. Especially if she's from a disadvantaged environment, it's very hard for them to come out and become successful in future. So what me and my partner want is to see a South Africa that puts their young graduates, especially female black students, in front and say, and this is an opportunity for you to better your life. And that is what we are doing. So you can find us on social media and all social media platforms. You can search for JFI Civil Engineers. You can send us an, 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 a text on WhatsApp on 072-910-5868. You can send us an email um, to info at jfcivilengineers.co.za or if you have any work opportunities for us, you can send us an email to tando at jfcivilengineers.co.za. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from people and to hearing from other students and what their experiences are in the industry uh, because we are a company that cares for its youth. We are youth, we are female, and we are black, and we would like to see more of us out there. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to make a presentation today and a pitch about our business, which is Uhuru Tires. Uhuru Tires is a business that was founded in 2018 by myself, Martin Politzbanda, as you can see there. And this is Uhuru Tires and everything that it represents. Now, what is the description of our business? The description of our business sits in this way. We seek and we, 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 we pursue to manufacture distribute sell vehicle tires of all vehicles that we have you can name it buses trucks private passenger vehicles taxi industries we also target them 
but we also go beyond the vehicle tires we also look at the conveyor belts which are used in the mining uh, industry in the mining sector industry now our value proposition when we speak of value proposition for uhuru tires we are looking at the three key elements which is reliability for our product sustainability for, for our product and also affordability we have reliability sustainability and affordability this is the kind of a value proposition that we give to our clients our customer segmentation we also distribute and and and, and 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 work directly with private clients government and corporate industries as well our key activities at uhuru tires is strictly manufacturing and distribution of tires our key partners who are our key partners we've got value university of technology we've got department of education we've got numsa we've got sida we've got cooper rapper industries and other very very important stakeholders that have been with us as we work towards the establishment of Uhuru tires the cost structure when we speak of the cost structure of running the business on a day-to-day -day basis we're looking at between 250 to 350 thousand rands on a monthly basis for us to be in a position to to, 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 to supply the tires into the market as the market and the demand it's so high for our products at this particular point our channel of distribution we distribute directly to individual as uh, through individual sales we also work on contract basis with different organizations as well but we also work directly with various outlets that are found all over the country that sells and distribute tires then our revenue streams our revenue streams is also derived from the bulk sales we also have accounts but we also have laybys whereby people can pay a little bit of what they have then they keep on paying from time to time until the, 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 the balance is finished then they can be in a position to take their tire and fit into the car so part of also our value proposition is that on our out outlets our customers they get their tires fitted in their cars for free of charge and we also offer wheel alignment and wheel balancing services so in a nutshell this is what uhuru tires does for us thank you so much good day my name is musa and i represent nose technologies at nose technologies we've developed an app called notes this app allows students to share lecture summaries study notes and book summaries. This app uses a subscription model. A user pays 15 rands a month and gains full access to the entire library that other students have created and uploaded. Students who have uploaded notes earn a commission based on the amount of usage their notes get and also the amount of reviews and how good the reviews are. Users that have uploaded notes earn a commission based on the usage of their notes and also the amount of reviews that they get. For instance, if a student was to get a three-star review, then they would, that would increase their commission. But if they got a one-star review, then that would not affect their commission in any way. This platform allows students to create new revenue streams for themselves. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mordecai Sizulenko Sinjovo, and I am the founder and director of Vula Access Digital, an IT company that seeks to create access and opportunities for young people and women within the ICT sector. Today we're going to talk about internet penetration in rural areas and how much they under uh, they underserviced and we need to find interesting innovation innovative solutions to make sure that each and every South African the more than 52 million South Africans get access to the internet because the internet is not only for entertainment, it's not only for um, for for finding um, information, but it's also to ensure that education is spread through um, our people. And the internet allows us to have access to many opportunities, more information, and also allowing our young people to also take the, the, the information they find and they create innovative ways. We also know that with the fourth industrial revolution, there's a lot of opportunities and skills that we can take and grow our country moving forward.
So us as Vula Access Digital, we realize that there's many things that we can do. But the first thing we need to do is find connectivity. How do we ensure that our people are connected to the internet? So this is what we did. We established and we, we established the company. Secondly, we um, did uh, as, uh, we we actually registered with um, with Zedna and um, with the Domain Authority in South Africa. It's been said also once again that there's about six hundred million web addresses .co.za in South Africa. By now, it's about a billion, and this is a service that actually allows people to identify their businesses, their um, their different kind of people within on online. And us as a registered and an accredited .co.za um, domain hosting company, we said we also want to be registrars and ensure that we offer these services on a cheaper way and also educate our people using um, web solutions. So we at Vula Access Digital have two solutions that we want to bring, an innovative solution, but at the same time, something that many people do not know about web solutions and web services wireless internet service providing that's what we are all about so connecting our communities we said that let's find two areas in our rural areas where we can start our services so we first registered with um with ikasa to ensure that we are able to build infrastructure and also to ensure that we can also service our people with web services networks small networks if i may call them so now the next step that we need to take is to ensure that we um, are able to develop the infrastructure in our in those areas and from there on out we are able to offer those services so we also partnered with another company called cisco an American company that builds and um, and develops um, 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 technologies that are within the wireless internet service providing. So with them and and, and our company, we want to um, service all those underserviced areas through wireless internet service providing. And we've checked out our costs and we looked at our revenue stream. We also looked at our cost structure and this is possible if we as a company ensure that when we build our services, it allows um, our people to have access to internet. We also know that um, the internet, the fourth industrial revolution says that um, everything is gonna be automated. If everything gets automated means that um, the internet of things, devices become a, a way of communication. My name is Andile Maduna from VUT and my product is a flat NFT hydroponic system. Here we are introducing clean eating amongst our people because this system produces organic food free of harmful pesticides and herbicides. It provides you with convenience and it saves you time. It is so easy to install and it's operator friendly. It also saves 80% of water compared to the traditional way of farming. Now currently in Val there's only one farm that is on a pilot project about hydroponics and our main competitor is a company called Hydroponics in Action. So why choose us? Because here we give you food security, meaning that we give you food availability, food access, food utilization, and stability. Now the main uh, target of, of, of this product is going to be students from the VUT and the NW Val campuses, the Wicking Force and Fanabel Park, Garden Beginners, the farmers in Val area who want to produce clean organic food, the Department of Education when they are doing uh, business development and community development, in farming, the city bank municipality when it is doing community development as well. Now here's the revenue structure. We are going to be doing uh, seedling reselling at 45% profit per seedling, uh, training which is going to be charged at 500 per person, uh, maintenance which is going to be 150 per system. You also get the option to buy the system. You can buy it once off at 2,000 rand or you can buy it monthly for 300 rand per month for 12 months. You also have the lay-by option of 600 rand uh, per month for four months. Now what is the community or the Val area uh, uh, getting from this uh, project? Meaning that there's going to be education about uh, healthy and organic eating and how it affects their bodies. Job creation from this and we can also start having the community rooftop garden. 
that was our contribution from the Vol University of Technology, and it's really nice to see what they have going on in their campus, and it's so wonderful to hear from their studentpreneurs. Um, I'm really excited that the TVET colleges have come on board, and they are showcasing their projects as well, and I'm looking forward to seeing this grow and seeing more and more of them being part of Student Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, Sakumzu, who do we have up next? Great stuff. Up next, we have DUT, Deben University of Technology. When Dabezita bring on the creativity, um, the video is going to come up soon. The DUT Entrepreneurial Centre and Desk Office, led by Ms. Nons Kanile, has given birth to KZN's young successful businesses. The institution has groomed and supported businesses such as Sky High Innovations, Tacky Wash, Get Too Natural, Dorker Paint, KZN Beverages, Turn Up Speakers, Durban Weekend, and yours truly, Level Innovations. As we know, with every business, a strong foundation is to be made. And with the DUT Entrepreneurial Centre and Desk Office team on your side, be 100% sure you'll get it, as they will assist with developing a prototype, creating a business plan, writing a professional company profile, train you in digital marketing, customer care, and financial management. But with the Entrepreneurial Desk, it doesn't end there. The institution will not only expose your business locally, but internationally too, by affording you the opportunity to travel abroad to places such as London, Denmark, Thailand, Singapore and Ireland, just to name a few. Here young entrepreneurs get the chance to mix and mingle with prominent industrialists while fostering their own business ventures. Oh and relax, it's not all serious times at the office. The team will also show you how to have a great time to revive your mind. <laughs> That's how it's done. So if you ever have a business idea, big or small, visit the Entrepreneurial Desk at 41ML Sultan Campus and get one of their friendly staff to help get you started. From us, the Level Team and the rest of the entrepreneurs will always have the Entrepreneurial Desk as part of our success story. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the Durban University of Technology Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation Offices. We exist to contribute towards social economic development and job creation. Our offices are situated in Durban and Pietermaritzburg DUT campuses. The Durban Entrepreneurship Center and Desk Office is headed by Ms. Nontlandla Kanyile and the Pietermaritzburg campus and how the business world is. Trainings such as creative thinking and the deep and hardcore boot camp are held for students to spark new ideas or add creativity to their already existing ideas. In creative thinking, Students are taught a way at looking at problems or situations from a fresh perspective that suggest unorthodox solutions. The bootcamp's sole purpose is to teach students how to write a business plan and to take a look at their financial needs and prospects. It's also a chance to address their shortcomings in their ideas and develop answers to the tough questions anyone would ask before they would pitch to possible investors. Students come out of these sessions ready to take on the world and become the best entrepreneurs that they can be. The students are taken through the lion's den pitch to present their ideas. The entrepreneurship center and desk has given birth to a number of businesses who are currently thriving and doing well. These businesses are Ewa Cosmeceuticals, providing the best cosmetics and beauty products. Level creates unique corporate gifts and branded promotional items. InvenClick, a video production company. Stack of Brands, providing your business with the best branding solutions. TurnUp, manufactures and designs Bluetooth wireless speakers along with other products. Ayondre, manufactures and sells deluxe retailing walls. Techie Wash, 
a business you can trust to take care of your dirty sneakers and shoes. K Chelsea, the lip doctor with organic cosmetic products. Carl Greens, providing you with solar energy solutions for your business and home. Sentence, colognes and perfumes for men and women. No new fashion, fashion at its best. GNS Cleaner, cleaning services for your business and home. Get to natural, organic hair products to keep your natural hair looking its best. Darker paints, painting solutions for your business and home. DNS Solar Masters, solar energy solutions for your business and home. HML Vault Engineers, providing you with the best engineering services. Inland Boulevards. Great boulevards for those bright days. Here you see the business incubator located at the ML Sultan campus, which is for entrepreneurs incubated within the program. Service related businesses operate from here. And this colorful and youthful business park that you see here is another student incubator, which is located at the Ritson campus, where more students who offer products will be operating from. In this park, you will find a salon, a laundromat, coffee hub, and much, much more food outlets to satisfy the tongue. Be sure to look out for the launch soon. So, if you are a registered DUT student, be sure to contact the Entrepreneurial Center and Desk on the details listed. Hashtag Building Entrepreneurs. The DUT Midlands Entrepreneurship Center and Student Desk is a center of excellence that offers both theoretical and technical entrepreneurial learning, business supports and activities to students based in Midlands, neighboring communities, and local entrepreneurs. The center was established in March 2018. We offer a diversified portfolio of solutions and services designed to meet the needs of our diverse innovative students and the neighboring community. These include but are not limited to business startup training, business mentorship, seed funding, business compliance, business exchange programs locally and internationally, engagement platforms, and technical skills training. The center has four business incubation phases that it uses to categorize student businesses. All students in different stages of business incubation receive mentorship that assisted them in growing their businesses and elevating to the next phase. In the year 2020, the center has incubated a number of 86 students and trained over 615 students in collaboration with the DUT Midlands Academic Department. We have awarded 24 students with DUT seed fund and provided mentorship to 86 students. Three of our student preneurs received external funding. We have also been able to create 47 permanent and 12 part-time employment. 2020 was a year full of uncertainty due to the COVID-19 pestilence. However, our students were resilient and innovative, receiving awards, endorsements, and signed contracts with reputable businesses. One of the objectives in the DUT and Vision 2030 states that our people will be creative, innovative, entrepreneurial, and adaptive to changes in the world. The DUT has implemented several projects towards achieving this objective. One of the projects was to establish two entrepreneurship centers in the Midlands and Durban campuses. The DUT Midlands Entrepreneurship Center and Student Desk in the Midlands and the DUT Entrepreneurial Desk and Center in Durban. The Midlands Entrepreneurship Center offers the following training programs to its entrepreneurs. Accelerated Entrepreneurship Training, Business Startup Training, Google Skills Training, Design Thinking, and CIPC Intellectual Property Training. Percy Kazondi is the founder of ST Travel Solutions, a company that specializes in transportation and logistics services. 2020 has been an amazing year for his business as they've grown immensely and almost fourfolded their monthly revenue. They've managed to secure a contract with one of the biggest companies in South Africa known as Hulamin. Before joining the center, they had one vehicle and now currently own four vehicles and have four permanent employees. Kukanya Ndawa is a fourth year Bachelor of Education student and the CEO of Decorum Financial Services established in 2019. He is accredited with the National Credit Regulator as a micro lender and he joined the center in 2019. 
The center has assisted him with mentorship, seed funding, various trainings, and continuous business advice. He has three systems in place that allow him to conduct individual affordability study, collect monthly installments, and allow his customers to apply for credit online. Vingisele Dube is the founder and director of Forward Slash, a company that specializes in IT and computer repair services. Dube currently has three part-time and two full-time employees. He attended the SUT Global Entrepreneurship Training in Thailand, received an NYDA grant fund of 10 laptops, he also won the DET Startup of the Year Award. They recently received a contract from Sakumno to use training to facilitate trainings for end-user computing level 3 or a CETA accredited learnership. Kukuzungu and Spagamese Sosibo, the owners of Simabelo Catering, are both doing their fourth year in Bachelor of Education. Their company employs two part-time and two permanent employees. Zungu won Female Student Preneur of the Year at the 2019 DUT Research and Innovation Awards. Monseni Ngobane is the founder of Inzuzo Yogusa Enterprise, a company that provides pest control and disinfecting services. This company was established in 2019 and has been doing extremely well, receiving a high demand of service nationally. He is also a financial accounting final year student at DUT. Sietemba Shezer is the founder of Guamanda Events and a final year Bachelor of Education student. Guamanda Events is a company that specializes in events management and deco. That was Deben University of Technology. They are really doing well in terms of business ventures. Ziggy, there literally there was a student in ST Transport Solutions who had ventures like ventures. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they also been ranked by the Department of Higher Education as one of the top five leading universities in student entrepreneurship, and you've seen that in that video. Um, Ziggy, um, what are we going to have next? Yeah, no, congratulations to them. That was a really fantastic um, accomplishment to be part of the top. Five. Yesterday I had a conversation with Linda Zaza, who is the Student Engagement and Communications Officer at EDHE, and we spoke about Student Entrepreneurship Week, um, where it sits, where it came from, but really just positioning why we're here and why we're wanting to engage and bring forth the voice of studentpreneurs. If you missed it, um, here's a recap of what happened in that conversation. Joining me live in studio um, is Linda Zaza, who is part of the EDHE team, and he is Really got heart behind this event. Uh, can I say that to people? Because right, students are your <laughs> thing. <laughs> so he is, uh, I, you actually just told me your title and now like, it's, got, it's, <laughs> gone, it's gotten out of my mind. Yeah. So I'm the student engagement and communications Patience officer. officer. Yes. yes, and you definitely do engage the students. Tell us, where did Student Entrepreneurship Week come from? So um, Student Entrepreneurship Week uh, started in 2017. Um, you know, nationally there is, I think across the globe, there's Global Entrepreneurship Week, and usually it is in November, uh, the second or the third week of November. And I think when Dr. Clark was working on the project, felt that um, during this time is really hectic to have students engaged in any activity. So uh, it was decided that um, we'd create Student Entrepreneurship Week. And usually it happens during August and September. And that's where universities decide on a week where they choose to celebrate it at their different campuses. Um, so this year, because of um, you know the pandemic, as well as um, you know we had our annual Lakhotla in September, um, we then felt as a team that let's have a national um, student entrepreneurship week, as most of our campuses in the country were shut down, were closed, and there was no activity that was able to to take place on uh, on those campuses. So hence we're having it this week, uh, bringing together all the institutions together. That's fantastic. I think that's the beauty of technology, right? Yeah. That we are yeah. able to bring everything together because under normal circumstances, um, every campus would have had their own SCW and they would have been isolated. It would have just been their university and their studentpreneurs and we would have missed out on all the engagement and all the projects. Mm -hmm. So this in a way works out really well because we have the opportunity to mm -hmm. plug into all the universities and find out what's happening um, across the different yeah. campuses. Yeah. Another key thing that's linked to SEW is the Student Entrepreneurship COP, Community yeah. of yeah. Practice. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
So the community of uh, the student premier COP, which is the community of practice, is made up of um, one representative from the 26 universities. So that's a student entrepreneur. Um, so Dr. Clark and team, we wrote to each VC and we said, please nominate a student who can serve on this body. And this body actually advises EDAG when it comes to student projects because we always need to hear what is the voice of students. Uh, we don't think up all these things by ourselves and say, yes, let's go do this. Yeah. But we always, once we've come up with a plan, thought through, uh, we then engage with the students, how do we approach it, how do we do, will this be relevant, is it something that you would also participate in? And they the same um, COP also comes back to us and say, we have this great idea, this is what we want to do. So there's something coming in 2021 that uh, they would like to introduce. So that's the relationship that we have um, with, that, uh, with the student premier COP. And that's really cool because you guys actually have actual students on yeah. the student entrepreneurship mm -hmm. um, COP. And the nice thing is that they get to make the contributions mm -hmm. of what they would mm -hmm. like to see. What have been some of the big things that have come out of the, the student entrepreneurship COP? Like what are students wanting? Um, yeah. What is sort of the most common message that you often get, or the common yeah. request that you often get from students? So the major uh, request that we get is, um, you know, opportunities because they don't just want to have um, you know, businesses that are not operating and don't, um, you know, generate that income. Uh, they also want to learn, are there opportunities to learn, to grow. The biggest one is funding, but yeah. we always say, you know, uh, we're not a funding institution, so we always refer them to institutions that do funding. Uh, but one of the things that Dr. Clark has taught um, and also emphasizes to me all the time when we engage with students is boot bootstrapping. Yes. That <laughs> is very, very important. So we try to encourage them uh, in that way. But some of the requests have been, um, you know, an opportunity to trade on their campuses. And uh, I must say that uh, institutions have been listening and are making space available uh, on different campuses for students to be able to trade on the different campuses. And the one major one, uh, which is a project that I mentioned earlier that they'll um, engage in is a student um, platform that will, um, you know, coordinate all the student entrepreneurs in the country uh, where it's a database of their businesses, their information. So if like yourself, Ziggy, you want to, um, you know, looking for your bags, you're looking for to do your hair, you're yeah. looking for a makeup artist, you're looking for a fashion designer, you can easily log onto that platform and search and you'll be able to find any student in any business throughout the country. That's really exciting because I think a lot of students kind of fly under the radar. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I know I've been at university and then only after I left, I found out that somebody had a particular business. And I'm like, yeah. what? We went yeah. to the same campus and I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. So I think that presents a really fantastic opportunity sure. um, to highlight student entrepreneurs, their businesses and the work that they're doing. Another thing that you guys do that helps to encourage student entrepreneurship and gives voice to student entrepreneurs mm -hmm. as well is the InterVarsity competition. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit more about that. So you don't get me started <laughs> on that one. So the EDHE Entrepreneurship Intervarsity is one of our flagship uh, programs, uh, one that gets us excited, one that gets us, you know, working where students from uh, the 26 universities submit their entries uh, and then they go through the internal um, process. Uh, then we go into the regional rounds, which this year were really um, challenging because we had to do uh, things virtually online and it was a, an amazing experience. I mean, a number of hours watching pitches over three hours each day. That was Monday to Thursday and announcing the winners on Friday. And we're always excited to announce the winners. Sometimes the judges would um, go over time, yeah. would set an hour for deliberation, but we'd have to call, Doc, wait, uh, don't start yet. There's uh, more. There's <laughs> more. We're, 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 you know, we can't decide who to win. So that shows the number of students that have um, entered and the quality of the businesses that we've received this year. And on the 26th of November, we'll be having the finals of the InterVarsity and the 27th will then be having the awards, the EDAG annual awards, and that is where we'll be announcing the winners of the business idea category, existing tech business, uh, existing social impact business, as well as the existing business general, and the one amazing prize, which is the overall studentpreneur of the year. Yep. So that's basically, um, and the reason for this is that we want to showcase, we firstly want to um, find those student entrepreneurs, like you said, they go under the radar, they do these amazing things and nobody knows about yeah, them, right. but we want to find them and once we found them, we profile them. And you know, we invite them to enter, we get the information, we allow their universities to see who they are 
And from there, we showcase them. We showcase them, we promote them, and we bring partners to come on board and to say, hey, this is what's happening in our universities. Get involved, partner with us, and let's make sure that these entrepreneurs succeed and they flourish so that by the time they graduate, they're not going the other way, but they're still going into entrepreneurship. Yeah, and I mean, speaking mm -hmm. of um, partners that have come together to mm -hmm. make this happen, you know, who are some of the key sponsors that you know contribute to um, not just InterVarsity but making all of SCW a reality? So our partners, um, which is our universities, um, South Africa. So that is uh, the mother body of the 26 universities. Um, Department of Higher Education as well, uh, you know, who always allows us and gives us the mandate, um, as well as the UCDP branch. And this year we've been hosted by um, University of the Free State. And, you know, it was an awesome session that we had. It was very intense. They have a very beautiful campus. <laughs> so I have a little bit oh. of FOMO because we couldn't actually go because of COVID. Um, but it was nice to see their, their campus and engage with them as well. Um, and I know someone is thinking about this. Someone's going, okay, Linda, I want to enter is their prize money. What do people get when they win um, a, 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 a program at InterVarsity? So the InterVarsity, each category winner will walk away with 20,000 rands. That is towards their business. They can do what they would like to do uh, towards their business. And they will also get a 10,000 rands marketing voucher. Um, so that's, that's a 30,000 basically. And then they will also, the overall winner, who's the studentpreneur of the year, will have their, their 20,000, their 10,000, and a grand total prize of 100,000 rands. I mean, the Come on, <laughs> guys. New Zealand, an opportunity yeah. to secure the bag and grow your business. So not just the cash prize, but the opportunity to network, um, to receive exposure, and to really be part of a space that can actually help you to grow your business. Linda, for people who are listening to this, they've missed the deadline for this year. When do um, entries open for next year, and how do people go about applying for it? So people can just visit our website, www.edhe.co.za. And, you know, the dates haven't been confirmed for next year uh, because, you know, um, uh, calendars of the universities have changed. So we have to wait for the academic year to end. And once that has ended, we can then go out with our dates to make sure that they align with the universities because at the end of the day, we cannot work without our universities. So uh, the dates will be announced uh, in end of January. That's when we make our big announcement of the project of the EDAG and those specific dates. So uh, students should also watch out on our social media pages we do share as much as possible so that is EDHE student entrepreneurship on Twitter Facebook Instagram and now on LinkedIn as entrepreneurship development in higher education and all that information will be provided uh, end of January so they can start watching out uh, from that point Fantastic. And then I do want to find out, I'm sure somebody at home is interested about the community of practice that exists for student entrepreneurs and they would like to contribute and they say, hey, I've got a great idea. Mm -hmm. This is how I think you should help students. How does somebody sign up to be part of the community of practice? So the student um, studentpreneur community of practice is uh, selected. It's individuals that are selected by their indiv uh, different universities. But those who are interested can just email us if they have any ideas, and then we can just link them up with that studentpreneur on their campus so that they can engage and work together. And that studentpreneur um, who is part of the COP member can then take that message, that idea, and bring it together to the collective of the 26 studentpreneur body. Fantastic. Linda Zaza, student engagement and communications officer. Thank you so much. And if you are interested, go lobby, go network, go find out what's happening on your campus. Get known, meet the right people who are involved in student entrepreneurship on your campus. Let them know what your interests are. Let them know what you're passionate about. And they can plug you guys, because that's what we're about. We're here <laughs> to give you the plugs. Um, and if you are part of InterVarsity, please do share with us um, on the Hoover app, as well as on social media, at EDHE Student Entrepreneurship, as well as using the hashtag SEW2020 and hashtag AfroTech. We want to know what your business is and how you're feeling um, about the InterVarsity finals that are coming up. And who knows, you could find some customers right now who are a captive audience who would want to support your business and the work that you are doing and if you have any other questions if you have um, suggestions for what you would like to see um, coming through the student entrepreneurship week in the years to come please hashtag that as well and tell us on the Hoover app we want to know we want to create an experience that reflects your physical experience on the ground at your university Jason, did you see the email from the conference organizers? They're asking us to download the Whova event app. Yep. 
Actually, I used the app in my last conference. Really? What can the app provide that a paper event brochure and website can't? For starters, you can set up your personal schedule and set up reminders. You won't need Wi-Fi or data service to check the schedule. You can see who else is attending the event, send messages, and set up meetings. Planning fun things to do together, sharing a ride, exploring job opportunities, asking for help, all is easy with the community board. Wow, please show me how to use it. Sure, to sign in, enter the email address you used for event registration or your social media account. That'll take you to a profile page. Other attendees will see your profile and network with you, so make it look good. All right, done. That's it. As you are an attendee, now it will show the event page automatically. Oh, but I registered late. See, it doesn't show the event. No worries. You can search for the event here by typing the name. Click the Join button and enter the event invitation code the organizer sent us or request a new one and wait a bit. I remember the code. Perfect. Now we see the basic event information. And on the bottom of the screen, here is the agenda tab. Whova lists all the sessions on each event day. And we can search an individual session by keyword. The session includes all the details like overview and handouts. You can add this session into your own personal agenda and set a reminder. All the sessions you saved are in my agenda. Now that is handy. During the session, you can click like, ask questions or leave comments, and rate the session. Here you can take down your personal notes too. Cool. Look at that! Speaker profile. Not only for speakers, you can see all the attendees' information. Here's the attendee list. With a little planning, you can make many valuable connections. Here, we can search by keywords including company name or title. See? Here's me. There's you. You can see my professional background information and say hi with a click or even start chatting through private in-app messages. And here, you can invite more people to join to the conversation. Just convert it to a private group chat. Okay. Here, what's this? Ah, that's the meeting schedule. You can use it to suggest a time and a place to meet someone. If your request is accepted, you'll see a notification, and it'll also show up in your agenda. Good thing. Now here's the community board. I love this for posting things like, hey, let's have a dinner together. Any good places to hang out? Or, I lost my wallet. Has anybody seen it? And post a job, too. Here, create any topics that you'd like to talk about with other attendees. It's a good place for networking, even before an event. Wow, that'll be useful. Of course, there are other cool features. Things like exhibitors showing coupons and giveaways, live polling, photo sharing, tweets, indoor maps, and surveys. Looks like I'm all set. Great, now enjoy the app. If you have any questions, here, contact Whova right through the app. Now it was a quick how-to on using the Whova app, so please do keep engaging um, on the Whova app. There's a lot of engagement happening on there in terms of sessions that are happening today. And just to highlight that for you quickly, if you go onto your homepage on Hoover and you click on community and then you click on meetups and virtual meets, uh, today around one o'clock there's a session that's going to be speaking about financial management, so you can join that group to discuss. Um, at 12 there's one on social entrepreneurs. At two o'clock this afternoon there's a group that's meeting to talk about um, NP and sustainable business models. Later on, there's one on protection from personal information act awareness, and that's something that you want to know because the, the Poppy Act has been updated. Um, and then this evening, there's one on business planning, um, and then there's also one on social entrepreneurs in Pretoria. So we are broadcasting live from Pretoria, and if you are in the area and you are wanting to touch base with social entrepreneurs here, do join that group. And if there's a topic there that doesn't appeal to you or that doesn't reflect your interests, Start one, invite a group, invite people, network and create those connections. We're continuing with, uh, with our program. I'm an exploring creative entrepreneurship. Up next, we have contributions from Orbit TVET College as well as from Tswane North TVET College. Here you go. Welcome to Orbit TVET College, Center for Entrepreneurship Rapid Incubator. The center was established in 2016 by the Honorable Minister, Lindy Wazulu. The center is situated in the northwest province in Rustenburg at Ovid Tibet College. The college has three campuses, being Brett's campus, Rustenburg campus, 
and Mangwe campus, which is where the automotive workshop is based. The incubator is home to 20 in-house cohorts for a period of 18 months and all incubatees have registered companies. The key focus is automotive and generic enterprise development. Among some of the services offered by the incubator are company registration, business idea development, marketing, access to funding and entrepreneurship trainings. The automotive workshop is fully equipped with mechanical equipment such as hoist, diagnostic tools, wheel alignment, maker space machine, etc. The students will graduate from the program to become mechanics. The workshop is divided into two sections and the creative space is where the learners bring out their creativity and innovation for their aspiring businesses. It is equipped with full speed internet, computers, boardroom and a 3D printer. The incubator is overseen by the center manager, technical manager, business development manager and marketing admin officer. The center is home to generic business supported clients. Here is some of them. Good day, my name is Gunze, the co-founder and director of Badira Moho Enterprise Works. Badira Moho was established on 2018 February with the purpose of offering generic general support services, which include grocery, beef, tombstone, and a burial support, which is a shop. And we are planning on expanding our services offering as per our customer needs and expectations. And you know, dealing with difficult customers, making sure that our clients are satisfied at all times and that our employees are happy. In our organizations, we have learned that our employees are our clients because a happy employee is a productive one. Currently, we have employed five young people who are helping the organization into uh, translating its objectives into reality. We have received immense support from Orbit Center of Entrepreneurship Project Incubators. They have assisted us uh, with generic business development, which include HR planning, bookkeeping, uh, financial administration, and others, just to mention a few. I urge you guys to go out there and embark on your entrepreneurship journey, as it is the most exciting and rewarding thing to do. You are going to learn a lot and unleash your full potential. You know, Entrepreneurs are not dreamers but doers, but if you can dream it, you can do it. Thank you. Greetings everyone. I'm Diga Mogwena, the principal of Orbit Tibet College. I come to you during a time that we now refer to as the new normal. And since this new normal, it has not been business as usual. By the second quarter of 2020, South Africa's economy lost 2.2 million jobs. 
And one of the main reasons for this is the COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, the global village is rapidly growing small. As a result, skills demand shifts from one country to the other. And society needs changes as well. Obit College is an institution of higher learning that offers students various programs to equip them with the necessary skills to join and contribute to the economic growth of the country. We are situated in the Northwest province and have three campuses, namely Brett's campus, Mankwe campus, and Rustenburg campus. Our central office is located in Rustenburg. One of the units which we have established as a college is the Center for Entrepreneurship Rapid Incubator. The center assists entrepreneurs with the process of doing something new or innovative for the purpose of creating wealth for the individual while also adding value to the society. Central activity for entrepreneurs is that of business creation. Hence, the center's approach to assist entrepreneurs hinges on individual development, technological identification, and industrial needs. Further on, the center seeks to, amongst other key areas, foster a culture of entrepreneurship amongst students and entrepreneurs, build future fit entrepreneurs, challenge the entrepreneurship landscape with thought leadership and innovation, create future leaders in social impact and economic growth, develop bridges from past ground breakers to future entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship education, business registration, and concept development, including automotive incubation services. Through the Center for Entrepreneurship, the college wishes to play its part in assisting government to keep the high failure rate of small businesses by continuing to be a powerful tool for supporting SMMEs growth. Entrepreneurs are now even more challenged to make groundbreaking business propositions to meet the needs of consumers in a post-COVID-19 world. So, to our students, graduates, and other budding entrepreneurs, our Center for Entrepreneurship is here to assist you to overcome barriers identified in your entrepreneurial journey, as well as to reduce youth unemployment. We are therefore throwing down our gauntlet and encouraging you to seek opportunities for entrepreneurship beyond schooling. All the best with your entrepreneurial endeavors. I thank you. Tony North Tibet College Student Entrepreneurship Promotion. The future of our economy is in the hands of the youth. As a Tibet College, our mandate is clear. We skill the nation. We inspire greatness. We unlock the potential of our youth. We give our students an opportunity to unearth their skills their entrepreneurial skills so that they can make meaningful contributions to our country. Hi, my name is Mungalo Henrietta. I'm an entrepreneurship and business management lecturer at Tony North Tibet College. I have also been responsible for organizing and hosting the business plan competition. Entrepreneurship promotion is my passion. I believe that the future of the country is in the hands of the youth. The future of our economy in the hands of entrepreneurs.
As an EBM lecturer, it is my responsibility to create platforms for students to unearth their entrepreneurial skills. I have to teach my students that we don't just educate them to be certificated. We give them relevant skills that they can use to change their lives, to change the country. At Swan North Tibet College, we host the business plan competition for our students. The event is a formal event attended by students and staff. In 2015, the event was supported by Oxford Publishers. In 2016, the NYDA came on board, as well as Levi M Foundation, who sponsored our prizes. In 2018, we successfully integrated fashion and clothing, art, as well as engineering into the business plan competition and entrepreneurship day. The students know that a class assignment is to be taken seriously. It is not just for marks. A special day is arranged to select the business, the best business plan. Students, management, and staff attend the event as delegates and wait anxiously to know whose assignment came out tops. Students pitch their business plan to a panel of experts. Mr. Derek Nzavi, the well-known entrepreneurologist, as well as the founder of the Business Plan app, is one of the regular panelists on, for the competition. NCV students participate in organizing the event as part of their ISET. We give them an opportunity to practice the knowledge learned in class. The event successfully brought government youth entrepreneurship promotion programs to the entire student population. Table 1 million is a housing youth entrepreneurship promotion initiative which supports the college's initiative. They come and assist students to register for their programs. One of the previous winners of the business plan competition, Tatleho, is still presently busy building his chicken business. He was recently in the top five business pitch competition in Limpopo. Mohao Lidwaba received business mentorship for a period of one year from Ekasi Lab for his bicycle business idea. He is still pursuing his ambition of one day being a job creator and not just a job seeker. Business plan competition winners are encouraged to take their initiatives forward and take advantage of youth entrepreneurship promotion opportunities in South Africa. We have invited successful young entrepreneurs to motivate our students, such as Tsepo, who is popularly known as the gin maker. Levi Mguni, the founder of Tuto Stationery and CompuBooks, as well as Levi Foundation, is also one of our former supporters. We sincerely believe that the future is bright, and as I Tibet College, we will continue to show our students the light. The college has a fashion factory where students do their practicals, and most of our students already have their own successful enterprises, such as Flolani Sunisitole, 
who is a fashion and clothing intern at one of our campuses. And this is his program. Uh, my name is Tolani Lucia Sitole and I come from Sushangu. I have a, a tailoring business which is HL Tailors. Uh, it's a made to measure service. I design and make tailored fashion garments for both men and women. I specialize in your special occasions, occasion where, such as your black tie event, our shows and weddings. I also offer special services such as your personal shopping, your personal uh, styling, your wardrobe makeover and your wedding styling. Thank you very much. We wish all students and entrepreneurs success with their ventures. Thank you. Thank you for those contributions. That was Twane North TVET College. Um, and just before that, we had a contribution from Orbit TVET College. And it's really nice to see the projects that they're working on. I mean, really just seeing them bring entrepreneurship closer. You know, we talk about township economies all the time. We talk about um, people that are in the outskirts. And it's nice to see those opportunities brought to people who live outside of business districts. And I really like to see the examples of what our TVET colleges are doing. True. Um, the, uh, the inclusion of TVET colleges is really evidence of radical change in the higher education sector. And many thanks to EDHE, the brilliant team law, uh, led by Dr. Nora Clark. It's really amazing work that they're doing because our TVETs are really close yeah. to um, our um, communities. And really commu um, the universities and colleges are microcosms of society. So it's really amazing. Yeah, 100%. And it's really nice to see that engagement. Um, speaking of engagement, please go to Hoover. We've been running um, polls this whole week. And just to do a quick recap, yesterday we had a poll on how, asking how many of you were student entrepreneurs. And it was really nice to see that um, about 80% of you who've joined us are student entrepreneurs. We also had a poll asking what phase of business you are in. Um, and that was also interesting because most of you are in that ideation, growing and starting your business stage. So that was really nice to see. Um, and then today we have our final poll up. And our question there is, have you learned anything new throughout SEW 2020? So please go find that on the poll section on the main page within Hoover and let us know what have you learned and how's that going. A big thing that came up, you know, day one and day two was this idea of more and more students being interested in farming. And we've had fantastic um, stories come through of entrepreneurial students who've gone into agriculture. Earlier on when we had our EDHE Lofotla, we did have an interview with a multi-award winning farmer, Mbali Mwoko, and we had a fantastic conversation with her. I mean, here's that clip again for you, because I think that's very applicable to our studentpreneurs. And here's a young woman who's changing the game and who is doing fantastic things in the farming space. Enjoy this clip. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Nora. My name is Mbali Mwoko and I am a farmer. My business is called Green Terrace and um, thank you for allowing me the pleasure to speak to you this morning. Um, just to give you a brief background of where Green Terrace started and how it started is that um, we were established in 2016 and started off producing vegetables, particularly Swiss chard, baby marrows, green beans, as well as peppers um, on a two hectare plot. And then we grew there to full um, producing on an eight hectare uh, farm. Um, the total um, size of the farm was 14 hectares, but in terms of arable land, we started at eight hectares. Um, so we grew to eight hectares, apologies. Most of our clients predominantly were in the, vet, uh, in the f uh, retail space food processing companies who then processed for retailers, mining companies, catering hotel companies, as well as we would supply our produce through to the fresh produce markets um, nationally. And um, Green Terrace primary uh, production is that we are a primary producing agricultural business. And so therefore we don't do any form of processing at this stage. However, this is the backdrop and background of Green Terrace. And this is how we started when we um, first uh, produced our first crop back in 2016. So I am the sole owner of Green Terrace, just by the way. So I'm the farmer and um, have a full team of um, eight employees. And we would hire anything between 10 to 15 employees on a um, on peak harvesting seasons. And I can definitely say that being a first generation farmer without having any prior experience or background in farming, 
I definitely started farming going into the traditional farming methods as much as we might have used irrigation system produced in tunnels in shade nets and in open fields uh, our approach to the way we farmed was still very traditional uh, and what I mean by that is general crop rotation um, we were focused really on scaling and all about volumes simply because we wanted to get a good name out there you know um, and by getting a good name out there we ha I had to break certain stereotypes um, as well as certain barriers, you know, uh, when you read about farming today, you'd hear about farmers struggling to supply through to the retail chains um, or getting markets, having access to market information, finance, etc. So I'm still a, um, a self-starter, uh, um, an entrepreneur in the agri space, I'm still self-funded as well. So my primary objective back when I started in 2016 was really to get the name out there, ensure that we could produce good quality crop on a consistent basis so that the buyers and the off takers could really um, like us and want to procure, procure from us on an ongoing basis. So the, the strategy for Green Terrace, and I could say definitely for 2016, in 2017 was just really trying to produce make sure that we are at um, uh, at our clients premises in terms of our product and that we just establishing a good name and brand for green tears so there wasn't any um, specific strategy um, um, yeah, strategy, yeah, strategy to, to be able to uh, gain a specific market share. Um, but it was just mainly about getting the good crop, um, the clients approving our spec, the quality, and really trying to produce in volumes from there on. Today, Green Terrace is something completely different. As mentioned in the previous slide, is that we produced um, from a mix, we, our production was encompassed a mixed farming production, where we were producing in greenhouses, in shade net structures, as well as in open field. Um, right now, what I've done is, I think it's late, um, late 2019, I bought a new pre of property. Um, so the previous farm that we're farming on was on a 10-year fixed lease and it was on a rented property. And so what um, I then decided is that I wanted to procure my own, uh, buy my own farm so that I could establish, um, cert, uh, put in, in, in inf certain infrastructure that would meet, meet to our needs. Because what I had done is that I started to look at the general trends back, back in 2016, 2017, everything that occurred on the farm, even in 2018, looking at the way we serviced our clients, um, we definitely had major challenges and setbacks in the old farm. And those, some of them were um, through because of climate change. Um, in the later parts of our summer production, we had excessive rain, excessive hailstorms, which then also destroyed our crops. So at a time I'd find myself um, completely in debt within 24 hours because we would have planted one day and then the next day the hail would have completely wiped out our crops, especially in the open field production. And what, that, that, what then that did to the business was um, halt certain supply, which then affected our, affected our ability um, to ensure ca cash flow and li the liquidity of the business. And it was really quite straining having to speak to the clients and say, today we can't bring our produce on your floor or on the market or on your shelves, simply because um, we've been destroyed by hell and therefore we have to resuscitate our plants and then start again. So the strategy was to develop my own farm where we could have full on uh, um, infrastructure that will prevent us from stop to stopping to pro, uh, stopping our produce um, season after season through because of things like hailstorms etc. So uh, right now, how Green Terrace looks like today is we are uh, one hectare full on production niche hydroponic farm. And the word niche specifically comes from the types of crops that we will, will be producing on the farm, which is sweet peppers. We will be farming red, green and yellow sweet peppers simply because those are high value crops. Looking at the previous date and the past historical records from a sales perspective, um, green beans and the peppers were the crops that stood out. 
but um, from a location point of view, I then the strategy was to definitely start producing sweet peppers simply because we're not too far from major um, processing facilities, as well as we're very close from the, to the airport. And the strategy for Green Terrace within the next three to five years is to start exporting. And so the sweet peppers and focusing on a niche crop is a way that we could diversify ourselves and being able to position ourselves in the market from a competitive perspective. And then um, I think today, even farmers are put under immense pressure to be able to still produce, but still maintaining the um, looking after the environment in our surroundings and also preserving our natural resources. So this farm is definitely going to be a hydroponic farm. And this is what we're building now. Um, not growing directly in soil, but using a, a growing method called growing medium using cocoa peat. So it is an intensive production. Our summer season is going to start in September, end in May. And the intention is there from there on is to start um, producing throughout winter as well, so that we can ensure that to our clients, we have consistent uh, produce or peppers being supplied to them. We are definitely using the principles of smart farming. And what we're going to be doing is that farming um, through our irrigation and how we fertilize all that inf infrastructure and systems is going to be automated. So I'm leveraging off the use of technology through farming apps. So previously on the old farm, we would have to um, directly measure how much um, fertilizers or insecticides we were putting onto the ground. However, with this new farm, the systems that are put in place will automatically read that for us. And I would get that through, I would get that information through my phone and it will determine what the pH level of our water, um, the EC, the humidity, the environment, ensuring that our crop throughout the growing season is definitely a healthy crop to, to be able to produce the amount of tons that we project for that specific season. And Looking at farming today as opposed to when I started, I think there's a great opportunity for farmers to leverage off technology. Yes, when you put certain infrastructure systems or software in your production methods, it may come at a cost which you need to budget accordingly for that. However, what we're doing at Green Terrace is also leveraging off the free technology apps that are, that are available. And um, um, with that, we're able to record certain data, our planting and our harvesting cycles, the tonnage as well that we've recorded on the farm, any pests and diseases that we've also um, been able to see on the farm and be able to correct that. Uh, and also share that information with our agronomists, um, which are certain ex experts that we um, liaise from a consulting basis on a monthly basis as well, um, to be able to um, ensure that we have a good season and we achieve our required tonnage from a harvesting perspective. So the applications is one way um, as, that we as Green Terrace are leveraging off to ensure that we can make good strategic decisions in the next and forecast for the following seasons on um, how we're going to farm, how we can improve, how we can better ourselves and um, and also take out any um, production methods that really don't contribute towards the success of the business. So um, I think the opportunity for farmers today is definitely leverage also a lot of technology and make use of free farming apps. The opportunity in, Af in South Africa and in Africa predominantly is that we're still um, a continent that is rich with untapped land. Um, so there's a lot of land that is yet to be cultivated uh, and this is regardless of any land or policies um, specific to um, how land is used and distributed in, in South Africa particularly as well. But the opportunity still exists for new farmers and new entrants wanting to cultivate the lands, whether they focus on crop production, um, field crops or um, livestock. And the opportunity as well for young individuals like myself being a first generation farmer is that we can now take control of all these opportunities and um, new innovative things that are coming into the agricultural sector and make sure that our farming enterprises succeed. Um, and I think with a high unemployment rate now in South Africa, almost reaching 50%, and with the demographics being mostly youth, I think there's a great um, opportunity that lies with the agricultural sector because it is one sector that 
is not, not only serves as a backdrop of other sectors. However, I think agriculture is an industry or a sector that can absorb a, lo a lot of professions. Today, um, there are many farmers who are experiencing challenges like access to market, information, inputs, finance. And in those problems, an opportunity lies for people in finance, for example, coming up with different um, funding models or mechanisms as opposed to the traditional um, funding uh, mechanisms to come up with innovative lending solutions that could be attractive to farmers. Today, um, farmers that are struggling in, in, in the ability to access certain markets is because some of them um, don't, do not have the selling abilities. So you find that they are fantastic farmers on the field, but when it has to come to skills, sales, marketing and negotiation, they don't um, score highly on those points. So there's an opportunity as well for marketers to enter into the space to be able to market uh, the fresh produce on behalf of farmers to external clients. Um, the opportunity also lies within um, those that are passionate with law. There's many um, contracts agreements that uh, come into play from a farmer to an off taker. And there's so many, uh, um, uh, I suppose, fine lines and specific writings that also complicate the process from there on. Furthermore, from um, a research perspective, season after season, farmers also find challenges in being able to um, grow their enterprises because of um, the setbacks that they receive from a pest and disease perspective. And so um, there's a number of institutions that are there to help um, provide and give, um, uh, I suppose, support um, to farmers where research and development is concerned. And so there's an opportunity as well for people who are studying, um, uh, who want to become researchers or scientists to add value into the agricultural chain. And most importantly, leveraging of technology. Technology, I think, could, could be the central point in combining all these professions, these skills, these expertise, um, and being able to bring uh, a certain um, level of service to the farmers in which they can then position themselves and grow their businesses from there on. Um, and then furthermore, I, I definitely put the last point there as it's an opportunity to make money and in addition to making money, make an impact. An impact not only from the farmers but to their neighboring communities and to the agricultural sector and its value chain as a whole because the global food demand is rising and it's it's quite sad to also know that as much as there's a lot of food wastage and food being grown um, there are a number a lot of farmers exiting the the, the sector um, because of an array of reasons but most importantly a lot of households especially in South Africa still do not have access to particular food items so I think the sector is one that is diverse, that has a, a myriad of, of challenges. But within those challenges, I think that we could definitely take, um, take note of those challenges and turn them into something positive and um, come up with different solutions as well to grow the sector and the industry at large. Part of my social responsibility as a farmer, especially a new generation farmer, is to ensure that I share my experiences and learnings. So I am a columnist for Farmers Weekly and all those articles predominantly relate to um, business articles, business articles related to farming, how farmers can leverage off their resources, how they can grow their businesses, but most importantly serve as a reference point for new entrants coming into the industry. My YouTube videos as well where I answer frequently asked questions on how to access markets, land, um, what to do with water, how to farm without soil, etc. And I've just recently announced um, my podcast which is where I'll be having uh, meaningful conversations with industry experts in agriculture and across its value chain. And all these serve as a platform to give back to the agricultural community because when I started, it was very difficult to get certain information around farming and um, agriculture in South Africa over and above the already um, uh, art written articles. But I found that there was a lack in the industry where farmers didn't talk about their experiences, didn't share about their experiences for new entrants like myself to then read up and learn to say, okay, um, this is how I can uh, position myself in the market or these are the challenges that most farmers face. Therefore, if I wanted to become a new farmer, these are the things that I'll be experiencing in the industry. So this is part of my social responsibility, giving back through my, farmers, my articles and 
Farmers Weekly, my blogs on a personal page, the podcasts and the YouTube videos. And it's just about educating and inspiring and giving information out to people who want to start farming um, or grow their farms in, in, in essence. And so I really hope you found value in today's talk in my keynote and I'm happy to um, respond to any questions. Thank you so much for your time and for your participation and I'm available to take any questions. Mbali Noko is really the epitome of the saying Sebenza Gel, <laughs> meaning work girl. You know the song work, 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 work. There's actually a new trend going on now, Yiluantombo, meaning fight girl, fight to be beautiful, fight to be successful. But I'd like us to adopt that hashtag today, Yilwa Entrepreneur, let your business work. Yilwa, Yilwa. Um, some of the people that are working at Falls Bay TVET College, they will be bringing us a presentation now uh, called Practical Innovative Startup Support for Designers, Artisans, and Engineers. It will be facilitated by their technical manager, Ngebagazi Matanzima. Good morning, Ngebagazi. Good morning and thank you very much for having us. And good day to everyone and our students as well. Great. I'm Zabakal, as you said. I'm just going to, you know, um, work around this uh, interaction for today. Um, this is the Center for Entrepreneurship at Falls Bay College. Um, we want to talk about the, you know, um, bringing, um, you know, technical resources um, to help entrepreneurs start up their businesses. So our topic is practical, innovative startup support for designers, for artisans, and for engineers. So we've got a hub, and the hub, um, you know, houses all kinds of entrepreneurs, and generic businesses. Um, but today we want to focus on bringing support to entrepreneurs that are coming from an engineering background, coming from a skilled background where they can, in fact, the makers in our country and especially um, where we're located in the Western Cape. So today I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to A.B. Oliver, uh, who's our program manager. Um, welcome, A.B. And I just wanna ask him a few questions just to give you an idea of what we do in the center and how we do it. Okay, so A.B., um, can you tell us the reason behind the CFE? And please do introduce yourself before you give us that um, reason. Thank you. Thank you, Nebukazi, and um, good morning to everyone in the room, the entrepreneurs, the students, um, the organizers. I'm Abraham Oliver, and I'm the Entrepreneurship Program Manager mm -hmm. at the Center for Entrepreneurship and Rapid Incubator. Mm -hmm. And very importantly, Nebukazi asked me, why? Why do we have a center for entrepreneurship? And the why is critical because the why speaks to where we are currently with COVID, unemployment, but also university students are aware of this fact. Once we graduate, where do we find employment? And the Center for Entrepreneurship was launched in 2015 with the core goal of assisting graduates and students to move from being a job seeker to a job creator. And in November 2016, we've added the rapid incubator. Because when you look at when people start up a business, challenge, where do we find money? Where do we find equipment? Where do we find resources? So I wanna make all students aware, all aspiring entrepreneurs aware that there are institutions out there fitted with the maker space fit it with mini factories to assist you to start and launch your business. So don't just look at the gateway of finding a job. Don't just look at the gateway of studying further, but also look at the gateway of how can I start a business? So Nebuchadnezzar, that's the why Falls Bay College looked at bringing in entrepreneurship as a strategic gateway for students to create a job for themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, A.B. And I, I, I'm sure we will have later on um, an entrepreneur that's making use of the space just to see how, um, you know, our resources and how our program, our learning um, comes together to help these entrepreneurs build their businesses. 
I don't want, I want Abe to come again and just talk about, um, you know, with some highlights of, of, of um, the CFE since it was incepted, since uh, um, we started with the program and with the hub as well. Can you give us some highlights there? Definitely. Um, Nebukazi mentioned we're talking to engineers, artisans, the creative industry. I think one of our first highlights in 2019, we were the recipient of the winning the productivity essay award in the Western Cape for the public sector. And in the national competition, we came in the top three. So that's a major highlight. So it talks to efficiency. How do we utilize resources? How do we minimize waste? And how do we increase the economic wealth for our beneficiaries? So that was one of it. But Nebukazi, I think more importantly, when a young graduate comes to us or an aspiring entrepreneur or student, we want to create a business. And since our inception, we have created more than 80 businesses. These are businesses that are formally registered, that are generating an income in excess of 5,000 Rand and more. We have created more than 70 jobs. Remember the big challenge from the National Development Plan, SMMEs are the engine SMMEs are the backbone for the economy. So how do we create jobs? So in this period, we've created 70 jobs. I'm sure there's still many more that needs to be created. So we need you as a student. We need you as an aspiring entrepreneur to take the next step and start your business. We've also trained more than 4,400 um, students, supported more than 600 community business. But this is the big one. Everybody wants to know about money. And through our engagement with corporates, we have established partnerships with companies like the Beers, mm -hmm. companies like Alcabo, and through the Triple B scorecard, enterprise supply development, wait for it, we have secured more than 1.4 million Rand, and that money was distributed to beneficiaries. Brian Corrallison will speak to you later on when Nebukazi bring him into the discussion. He was a recipient for more than 100,000 Rand. Why? To start his business, to launch his business, and to build his business. So those are just some of our highlights. Over the five years, I must also say, Nebukazi and Steve will keep me account to it, we have generated our SMMEs that have been part of our center have generated over these five, year, five years over 12 million rand in turnover. So those are just some highlights to, to encourage you and to ignite some entrepreneurial thinking in your thoughts. Thank you. I don't want you to move. Oh. You, must, you must stay with me. I've got a few more I'm questions. <laughs> I've got a few more questions for him. You know, um, it's really, really great. I hope you have picked up that, um, you know, we have been in the hub We've operated um, a year outside of the hub and we have built the hub and we moved into the hub and we've been here now for five years. So those are just some highlights and um, that's 170 jobs created. That's over 4,000 uh, students that have been influenced, if I'm hearing you correctly, um, with entrepreneurship. And all of those things, it's just, you know, we always say that we want students to walk out of a university, of a college, um, of any institution thinking that I can create a job and not thinking I have to get, get a job. So we're trying to do that as well. Aiden, how does the methodology work? How do we actually get to, to, to train and change the mindset of the students to make sure that they do not become job seekers, but they become um, job creators? What's the methodology behind that? I think that's such a critical question, Nebukazi. I think it's all about the mix. It's all about the elements that you combine. Mm. And what we've learned over the five years that we are operational, mm. entrepreneurs want a practical training. They want experiential training. Mm. They want targeted training. They want transformative training. And what did we do? We've listened to the entrepreneurs. We've packaged a program that is targeted, that's transformative, that takes an engineer with his skill to monetize it. That takes an artisan with his skill to monetize it. And we bring in the business skills. 
So our methodology, our mix has four elements. The first element is a practical learning to assist those who haven't studied business to understand how to position the opportunity in the marketplace, how to make sure the customers derive value from the product or service. Because remember, if you build something that nobody wants, it doesn't make any sense. So we are here to assist these young entrepreneurs to build something that the community wants, that the economy wants, that adds value. So our learning is critical. Secondly, the second component talks to mentoring and coaching. Lots of our students come from disadvantaged rural backgrounds, community townships, and their parents want them to find a job. And they, the schooling have prepared them over 12 years to be a job seeker. And now we come and say, change your vision. So they need a mentor. They need a coach to guide them. And we've got an amazing partnership with Rotary International since 2017, where we have trained more than 100 mentors, and they provide the service pro bono, for free, mahala, that costs nuts, that is gratis. So that is the mentoring and coaching. The most important part of a business is finding markets and getting finances. So we also build that into our methodology. We don't give the money, but we link you to financial institutions like CIFA, and we also link you for market linkages. To give an example of the, the finances, amazing, during COVID, 5th of June, 2020, one of our entrepreneurs, Olga, WH Engineering, secured 2.2 million rand from CIFA with the 800,000 rand grant. What did that entrepreneur require? She needed a business plan. We prepared the, the, um, the students how to do a business plan, how to put the business model canvas together so that you can go out there to any CEDA or CIFA and say, here's my business plan. And lastly, most important, student who's listening to me, you are the most important equation in the entrepreneurial DNA, the jockey. We provide personal development for the jockey. Currently now, whilst we're standing, our center manager, Steve Reed, is busy talking to our entrepreneurs about how do you personally brand yourself? Why? Because people buy into people. And we will connect with an engineer who's in the back of a side, connect with a designer who's busy with his craft only. How do you connect with your customer? And how do you deal with sales? How do you deal with failure? How do you persevere? So that's our four key areas. Learning, mentoring and coaching, market and financial linkages, and personal development. Mm -hmm. And so far, we are doing quite well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. And um, hearing, hearing you, I've got one more question. But here, hearing you talk about um, un entrepreneurs and students coming into the center and getting all this learning and training and links to markets and, you know, preparing their business plans and all of this, what would you say um, for a student who's listening right now, what would you say is a criteria for them to, to start a business, a criteria for them to, to be involved with a center or a hub like this? What would you say is, is, is like a criteria? Because a lot of students look at the center and they don't want to come in because it's, it looks, you know, highly set up with the hub, with the equipment and everything. So what would you say is a criteria for them to come onto the center and start their own business? That's a critical question. And I'm sure many students are listening to us. Mm -hmm. And many students are looking at themselves and saying, I'm not an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I can't be, uh, run my own business. Mm -hmm. But you know where it starts. It starts in your mind. And all of us have ideas. So if you have an idea, I think you need to. And as a citizen, it is obligated on you the responsibility to make the world a better place. Doing good is good for business. And all that we are saying, if you have an idea, step into any center, make them aware of the idea because we will assess your idea. In fact, Nebukazi, we have, because of the same challenge, Students not coming because they don't feel that they have the necessary qualifications. We have started since 2016 
a big idea competition. What's your big idea? And this coming month, in this month, the 26th of November, we will host it for the sixth time where we give students with an idea the seed capital to start of your business. But the first thing, you need to start believing in yourself. You've got the passion. You've got a hobby. See where that meets the customer needs. And where it meets the customer needs, you can commercialize it and turn it into a business that will employ, which is so critical for our current situation, those that are not in employment and those who are seeking a job. So start with yourself, believe in yourself, and know that you can be a game changer within yourself. Thank you, Nidhi Thank you. Last question for AB. Um, before we can go into um, the offering, the technology offering of Akleta, I just want to, to ask, how do we, how, how does the center go about inculcating, you know, entrepreneurship in the minds of the students? And what do we actually do to make sure that we are visible to the students and we're actually bringing out, uh, you know, those ideas, those thoughts from entrepreneurs and putting them out in the center? How do we, how does the college or the center um, do that? Amazing question. Mm -hmm. Students learn much better from their peers. So we've got entrepreneur. We had an entrepreneur, young Disa Langa. And again, coming back to your previous question, he simply had an idea to sell tomatoes. And you might say, AB, I can do tomatoes in my backyard. Mm -hmm. But what, what was different? He found a market for those tomatoes. And he's now selling tomatoes and agricultural products to pick a pay. To restaurants. He was our first winner in 2016 of our post stand pitch competition. Mm -hmm. Success leads to success. So what do we do now? We take our students who have started businesses, we're still running these businesses, mm -hmm. and we take them to our various campuses. They will tell you it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not the silver bullet. But with the determination, with the support, with the encouragement, with the right environment, you can reach your goal. So don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you have and start where you are. That's the bird in the hand approach. And when you start where you are, action leads to traction. And once there's traction, you will become an attraction. So start where you are, young people. You've got a potential. Just unlock it and make the world aware of your existence. Thank you so much. Thank you, A.B. Thank you, A.B. so much. Um, you know, he was just giving us, um, you know, an overview of our center and how we, how we work, um, you know, in building and helping entrepreneurs generally. But I want to bring you to the focus for today. And I'm going to call um, Brian to, to come and just share with you his experience in entrepreneurship and being a tech entrepreneur and how that affected you know, his business as well in the center. So um, I'm just going to show you, I'm, I'm also going to do a walkabout just to show you the equipment that we have available in the makerspace specifically. So at the hub, we've got two factories, mini factories, and we've got a makerspace as well. So, but today the focus is going to be on the makerspace. So the mini factories consist of a woodwork um, mini factory and the engineering, welding, and fabrication um, mini factory. But Brian here, I'm going to introduce you to Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, he is an entrepreneur at our center, and he's just going to introduce himself and just tell, and tell you about his background, how did he come into entrepreneurship, and how he uses the space to um, build his business and sell his products as well. So Brian, just give us a brief background of who you are, where you come from, and how did you, uh, you know, how, how was your education? How did that go? And how did you come into entrepreneurship? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and students as well. Uh, my name is Brian Rosen. I'm the director of Weltnet. It's a manufacturing company. I'm based at the center. Um, it all began for me when I started in 2017. I decided to uh, uh, went from employment to, to, to starting my own business because I was sick and tired of seeing overpriced full quality products flowing, uh, flooding our South African market. Mm -hmm. So I read an article in the Plainsman and then the manager of the centers, Mr. Steve Reed. Mm -hmm. He published how to start a business and 
course I um, got an education at Falls Way College. I studied here, completed ERD level four. So you were at Falls Way College student. I'm a graduate too. Yeah. And then I, when I graduated, I went to Sweden, in Brasteitia, through a cultural learning program. It was also um, Yalpais, the college. Okay. And then when I returned, I also got a second opportunity to study in Chicago. Mm. Uh, it's a college of the faith. It's a suburb in um, the, yeah, um, Chicago. So I studied value technology, which included subjects like industrial design, uh, machining, pipe fitting, mm -hmm. and then also cultural learning. Mm -hmm. um, so then when I read an article in the Plinsman, I then decided to come back to this uh, Boston College. So what was the article saying? What triggered you from the article? What triggered me is just saying that you want to be your own boss and then and really have an idea mm. of just being your own business person and mm. just getting your product out of the market mm. and reach out to the center mm. for support to, okay. to, to develop your business. Okay, so what I hear you saying is you got, you started at a college mm. and you, you got an opportunity through the college to go and study abroad where you practice your skill, your welding fabrication skills. Okay, that's cool. So how, um, when you started, how did you start? When you saw the article, you thought, I'm going to go to the center and, and what were you expecting and um, how did you actually start your business and what were the products that you wanted to create? I came to the center and then I didn't know what to expect, yeah, obviously. Um, and then I came in there, I remember, still remember the first day and one of the guys told me, look, if you don't have a budget plan, if you don't have that paper, and that you can't be part of the program. Mm. But in fact, that, that never happened. I came in with nothing. And then from zero to where I am now, mm. the college has helped me. And then I also, they helped me to register. And then I got like, how to do invoicing, how do you do your, 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 your how you put mock-up on all mm. of that, calculate the materials and, mm. and stuff like that. Oh, we also did business plan model canvas. Mm. And then also uh, tools that we introduced is growth wheel. Mm. We did and yeah. Okay, okay. So so can you summarize the value of the offering and the space, and then just show them um, some of the products that you've created as well, because we've got a few that I can see in front of us. Just tell us about the products that you create, and while you're talking, I'm going to do a walk around, just. Mm. For, for the tools that you use. Okay, first okay. tell us the tools that you use in the makerspace and then just show us your products once you're done with that. So I'm going to also walk around. Brian's gonna talk about yeah. how he uses the CFE mm. to actually create the product, okay? Um, I just wanna get back to the value offering. Um, so the value offering for me was introducing me to different kinds of companies and then also this is the markets. Companies like the beers who, 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 who were lucky, um, who I, who I was lucky enough to get uh, funding for over 100,000 Rand, and then also El Cabo and Ackerman. And some of the products, which I, um, products is from prototyping I made, this is like a post box I made, so it's a prototype, it's still printed. Mm -hmm. So software I use is CorelDRAW, RD, um, so CorelDRAW, Cura, and then to create this uh, lovely product, this was a prototype, so I was using that piece and three you see there, over there uh, that I used. And then the other products also created is some of the this tree of life. So I you also use um, Coral Draw for this one, and then RD Works create this product for um, customize to, to my client's specifications. Mm -hmm. And then also here yeah, I made some cell phone stands, certificates for Force by College. So this was just one of my prototypes. Mm -hmm. And this I made, this is a ruler I made for the beers last year. So uh, this product was designed here. And I just expo um, I just had it machine out and we did all the printing. Also the printing, but the design was 100 percent made by myself and then always mm -hmm. assistance from from the Bakasi. Mm -hmm. On the CNC router, last year we had an idea to create some lead boards mm -hmm. made of wood 
it can be used for uh, kids on the farmlands. Mm -hmm. They don't have access to any other place to sit and do their homework, either at home or it can be at school. So we created this board. So this I created. You can also do a um, solid cam. Also, yeah, solid cam, solid works, and RD works. RD works, coral draw. So yes. And then to come back to designing here, yeah, uh, this CFE, this place, just open your minds. And sometimes you go home, you can't even sleep because your, your mind is just full of ideas, full of ideas. And But the main thing is to get your thing on paper and speak to the necessary people like yourself uh, mm -hmm. for, with assistance to taking your product to the market and, and how you can um, develop it more or make it better. So, um, that is Brian Carolison, um, owner of Wild Lab. So he uses the makerspace a lot. So what I wanted to show you is just some of the equipment that he's using. I'm not sure if I can connect to my, um, to my video on the phone also. So if I can connect my video to the phone, um, let me just show you. So, um, if you can see there, that's the laser cutter that he is talking about. So, Brian would design on the software. Um, we were awarded or we were sponsored by Meekhead. Um, they gave us um, SolidWorks program for designing and drawing, and um, that's up to a value of about 10 million rands. So Brian would be sitting here and he would be doing his designs, and this is a 3D printer that he was sponsored by DBS because he creates a lot of gift products for DBS. He was busy with a project for a, a house that he's actually making. So he's making um, a home design for, for this um, laser cut, um, what do you call this product? So he will set them up in home decor. So that's what he's busy with as well. Um, so we've got also a vinyl cutter for the businesses that are in, um, you know, branding and apparel as well. So they would use this vinyl cutter. So, and this is a CNC rotor that he uses. And he was speaking about just to engrave and cut some from some of the wood products that he creates as well. So that's just how the makerspace looks. So I just wanted to, to you to have a view. So these are just some of the prototypes that the entrepreneurs were making. Um, just to see, this is a phone case as well. So they, they also sell some of these products as gifts for corporates and sometimes the college as well. And if you can just see, we've got some of the pictures of the products that they've created from the makerspace. Um, some key holders, some toys there, um, and some crafts as well. They've done coasters here, and some of the tables that they've done in the CNC router machine as well. So just some of the products that they create from this space. So remember, this is not the only um, in, in manufacturing and design space. We've got a welding and fabrication factory as well. Uh, and thank you so much. I'm just going to go back to our original video now. Uh, okay. So that is just the walkabout I wanted to do with you. So thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I just want to give you an idea of how can an entrepreneur, how can a student or anyone that, that, ha that has a skill in tech or that's been trained as an engineer or that's been trained as an artisan, how can they come and make use of the space? And how do they actually get access and what they can expect from the center and the hub um, with regards to that? So you would remember that in our country, we all know that our university cities are flooding with students. We've got graduates that are, you know, engineering graduates that are artisans, boilermakers, and just general, um, you know, graduates that are just 
at home sometimes, but we want to challenge those graduates today and, and say that you have a talent to come to spaces like this. I mean, we've got um, these hubs across the country, you know, so you can go to any incubator, to any hub and come and see how you can start a business. We've got what we call an idea generation, you know, program as well, where we speak to students about how to come up with an idea. How do you, how do you think of an idea? How do you now explore the idea? What questions you need to ask to make sure that this idea can be viable and this idea can be started as well. So it doesn't matter if you don't have an idea, just think about, you know, something that you can create and come discuss with us as well. Um, so we've got those um, that we're offering as well. So at the, at the CFE, you, you, you will get access to um, equipment and you will get access to technical advice and coaching as well. Okay. So we do not train students or, or, or um, people, but we expect them to come train already because we've got um, CNC machinery, we've got lathe, we've got welding equipment. So we expect people who are graduates to come and use the space. So we don't train any of them. We just help them in, with navigating an introduction to 3D printers, for example, I would spend about 15 minutes explaining to them how to get the machine started. I would give them a little training on using the softwares as well, the 3D printing softwares. And after that, you know, engineers are very skilled, they, they're talented. Um, once they learn one program, they can know every other program. So don't sit at home thinking that you don't know how to use a 3D printing software. And remember with the fourth industrial revolution, it's just a matter of how can you change a product from a picture to, a, 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 I mean, something from a picture to a product that you can sell. So you don't have to be highly skilled in designing to use the space. You just have to have a picture, you have to have a drawing and you can come and set it up at the center. So I just want to make it as easy as possible for you to understand that you don't have to be highly and heavily trained and educated to use the space but you must have an idea and you must be willing to learn as well. Uh, and, and so we've got a system where we, we lend um, tools to entrepreneurs for, for um, you know, off-site use, um, things like power tools, drills, um, you know, and all the little equipment that they need to go and install something off-site. So we've got that program as well where they can come and borrow a tool and go and use it off-site whenever they've got installation. Because we've got entrepreneurs in furniture making, in cabinet, and the, we've got entrepreneurs in civil and in electrical installations as well. So we've got that on access at the hub as well. So it's all access to technology as well. And we also make sure that we follow up with their income generation because we want entrepreneur students to use the space to make money, to build sustainable businesses and to create jobs. So it's not you can come and work and play and design something, but at the end of the day, you must have a sellable product. You must have income generated. So we do track how much money they've, they've made through using a facility and equipment um, in a quarterly basis. And I can tell you every quarter that amount increases. Um, so that's just some of the ways that we make sure that we help entrepreneurs start from um, creating the product and actually selling their product as well. So you will know that in our country, we've got a challenge of, of, of um, you know, job, you know, scarcity as well. But I'm challenging entrepreneurs, young people to come and use the space that we have here, okay? So the, the value that you will get from here is that you can start your business. And remember, this is rapid incubation. So you, you will be here for a year and you can have post incubation as well. But what we see happening is our entrepreneurs who, who enter the space actually grow and build their businesses. They buy their own tools. And in a year's time, when they about to finish the program, they already have some of their own tools. So our aim is to make sure that you grow rapidly. 
so that you can give space to another entrepreneur that's coming into, into our space and our center as well. So Brian was right, we do help them with costing as well. You'll find that engineers and artisans find it very difficult to cost their, their craft. Mm. They sit for hours and they design their work. So, um, you know, because I've got a, a design background and experience, so I understand how they can cost their products. So I'm, I mostly have coaching sessions where I can show them how they can cost their hours and how they can cost their design work as well so that's just the value of being in a space like this it is it is open to everyone who wants to come ask questions um you can always contact us as well we've got a facebook page also so you can search um center for entrepreneurship at Fallsway college and that is all about you know our maker space i want to um, bring back ab and just to say some parting words and some encouragement for our young entrepreneurs no, no, awesome i think we at the time we need to say thank you for the opportunity that's been created by dr norman clark and organization and we are so grateful to be part of the student entrepreneurs of week 2020 closing off zig zagler said the following words you don't have to be great to start I want to repeat that. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to hear via Facebook, via emails of interest of what um, your ideas are about and then how we can connect with one another. Thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to False Bay. An amazing presentation. Siggy, what's next? Yeah, that was really good. Um, I'm really excited to see where that platform is. Um, and Linda did mention that there's something coming in the future where students could utilize the platform to share their products. Because there's some stuff there that I would like to purchase and use myself. Um, up next, you know, being in this digital age, in this virtual world, it is important to figure out how do you start a business online? How do you launch a digital business? I'm um, continuing on our theme of creative entrepreneurship. We have a contribution now from Northwest University, and they'll be sharing with us how to start a digital business. Welcome to this session on how to start an online business. To provide you with an overview of the presentation, we will first look at an introduction of, of why an online business, then look at some benefits of starting an online business, where should your main focus be. We will touch on some mistakes to avoid when you want to start an online business, look at things to remember, what are the different options for an online business, we will also have an, uh, a, look, a short look at e-commerce platforms that you can consider when starting an online business, and then we will conclude the session. Before we start to look at what is an online business and the benefits of an online business, it's important to consider that there's roughly 966 million websites where WordPress alone is responsible for over 76.5 million blogs on the internet. More or less 100 million freelancers are currently successfully running small online businesses from home. Starting an online business allows you to focus on the very things that interest you the most. And what's also more, online businesses don't have the traditional hurdles that most new ventures face. If we look at some benefits of starting an online business, it includes first of all global access. So people have access to your business 24 seven from all around the world. You also have improved client service through greater flexibility because you don't just have normal office hours from eight to five, but you can now attend to client matters after hours as well, the quicker the better. It enables you to save some costs you don't have physical um, stores that you have to manage and maintain um, the main cost here would be the website you can manage it from anywhere in the world you don't have to be location bound it provides you with a bigger customer pool so you can attract more people it allows you to supply on demand so you don't need to stock inventory and it also allows you to space out but considering that you have to ask yourself, what will my main focus be? Your main focus will always, always come back to 
find a need and fill it. Before you start any kind of business, it's important to know what need you will satisfy with your customers. Along with that, you need to know how will you solve the problem or satisfy the need. So it's more than just knowing what need you will satisfy, but also how exactly do you want to do that. Very important, have a user-friendly website. This is the business or the store that the user or the customer will navigate. So it's extremely important that it should be user-friendly. Know how to drive traffic to your site. If once the store exists, it's important to know how you will get your customers to your store. They won't just find it on the internet. Establish an expert reputation. Let your customers know and potential customers that you know what you are talking about. It's always important to follow up with your customers in terms of their experience and then also focus on back-end sales and upselling. Now we need to look at some mistakes that you need to avoid when starting an online business. First of all, not having a plan of attack is a big mistake. You should always know what need will I fill, how will I fill it, and what will I do when things go right or wrong. Having the wrong focus, not focusing on the right things that will make you money at the end of the day. Then people will always say, don't worry for now about the money, but that's one of the big mistakes. You always need to worry about money, making it and spending it. Undervaluing your product. And along with that overvaluing, it's important to know exactly, sometimes when people start up, they want to provide their product or service at the cheapest um, cost possible. Um, but that's not a good thing. Do not undervalue what you are selling. Know exactly what the cost is of what you are selling and the value. And ask a, a price that speaks to that. Ignoring customer service. The one thing that makes that's a benefit of online um, business, doing online business, but also can become um, an energy eater is customer service. Because on the one hand, it now allows you to deal with customer service and customer issues any time of the day, but that also requires an urgent response. Um, so it becomes difficult if customers have issues late at night when they are shopping to attend to that, but you cannot ignore it because that's what's making you um, the best possible online business. Then give versus take. What you give and what you take from others must be in relationship with one another. Spreading, okay, just to clarify, give us a stake a bit better. Um, sometimes you have, you want to give away three things to drive traffic to your site, um, like free a free recipe, but then also make sure that you get something from the customer. So if you provide them with something for, for free, take something small, like for example, just the email address so that you can build um, a contact list to help you drive traffic to your site in the future. Spreading yourself too thin on social media. That's a very big mistake. Focus, know where your customers are. If you know that they use Instagram, then you mainly focus on Instagram. But if you know it's an older market that would rather make use of Facebook, then you would use Facebook. Avoid trying to be on different social media platforms if the customers are not there. Skimping on early hires. People want to save money by not employing people. And that sometimes is a big mistake. Hire people early on. Treat it as the same as you would a normal business. Underestimating what it takes to succeed. It takes a lot to make a success of any business. Don't underestimate it just because it's an online business. And then the last mistake to avoid is trying a one-size-fits-all approach. You know that you have a specific need that you want to fill, a specific way of filling that need, and a very specific customer that's on a specific social media platform. Do not try a one-size-fits-all approach. Know your customer and speak to the specific customer. Some important things that you need to remember when starting an online business. First of all, find a market niche. Make yourself unique. 
Along with that, it's important to be distinctive and identifiable. If you know that although you are in a niche, there are other competitors in the market, you need to find a way to be distinctive and identifiable, either through your business name, your product, the way in which you solve the problem, or even your branding. Use attractive images because that's what people see and experience on websites in the online business. Then your website, we talked about this. Have a user-friendly website that's easy to navigate and provides your customers with the information they want and need. Know exactly who you are and this again speaks to your branding. Digital marketing, do digital marketing, Use the, utilize it. You are in an online space. To market in any other way than digitally would not make sense. Save your stuff in the cloud. So many times before people have saved on external drives and then it still breaks or gets lost. Utilize the cl cloud and save everything that you do in the cloud. Then the two biggest or most popular sites that you can use to start an online website is WordPress or Shopify. Both very different platforms with different offerings, different ways in which you can use them. Make sure of what you want to do and how you want to do it before you decide whether you would use WordPress or Shopify or any other platform that we will discuss a bit later on in this presentation. Then it's important to have a community of potential customers. Get to know people. If they are not buying from you now, have a community of potential customers that in future you can convince that you will satisfy their needs. Have customer support available as well. This speaks to the things we talked about earlier on in the presentation about not ignoring customer services and a benefit of an online business, which is to um, provide people with more flexibility in managing their issues. With, along with that, it's important to have customer support on your website. If there's an issue with payment or adding to a cart, that there's someone available, readily available, that can assist them. And then use social media. That's one of the cheapest ways in which you can drive people to your website or even host your online store. What are the different options when it comes to online business? Now, you can first of all start a clothing line. There's so many people um, that out of desperation or even just the passion for clothes and making their own clothes have started successful online clothing stores. Um, you will find many examples of students who had their own style and couldn't find what they liked in stores and then started their own clothing lines. Or even people, um, women who made their own clothes to save money on their personal expenses and then went through a rough time and started making clothes to sell and now have successful businesses. Another option is drop shipping. Drop shipping, what's good about this, and you would find that most online stores currently do this, is they would advertise and they would have um, people that they are resellers for. So they don't have stock on hand. They would advertise it on the business site and then as the um, orders come in, they would then order from the suppliers um, and then only send it out. So you don't, what's good about drop shipping is that you don't have stock on hand that can pile up and that you need to get rid of and lose money. The bad thing of drop shipping is that sometimes they can place an order with your online business or store and then as you have to order it from the supplier, they might be out of stock. And that can have a negative impact on your customer service. Then, like I've said in the introduction, there are currently thousands of freelancers that's making um, or that's having successful online businesses. And freelancing can be anything from writing to photography. Then another big trend at the moment is flipping thrift store finds. Again, there's people on Instagram, both Instagram and Facebook, 
um, that look for vintage secondhand clothes, buy them, and then resell them. The same goes for vintage furniture. Then you can become a blogger. Again, I, I, I just want to say that this goes with using your skills, for example. If you know that you have a speci specific knowledge about a specific topic, then use that to start a blog. How do you make money through a blog? By advertising. Um, having space on your blog to advertise. Um, the same goes for um, looking for sponsorships. People will sponsor your blog for a month or so, and then with each blog post that you make, um, you provide them with a marketing option. So you would name them and you would give an overview of their product. Um, you can even do reviews for people on their products or services. Use your skills. If you again know that you have the skill to make beautiful jewelry, then use that skill and sell your craft. Another big thing at the moment is becoming an influencer. That's especially very popular on um, apps such as TikTok and even Instagram. You can sell your handmade crafts and then tutoring. Another example um, that I came across during lockdown was a lady who wanted to teach her children a love for books. She said she had this love for books and she, could, she realized that they didn't necessarily share it. And her main goal was to get them to love books. She started an online book club. And then it grew um, as she realized that there's more people out there who wants their children to have a love for books. And now she, are, she has a successful online tutoring business where she, she teaches children between the ages of 8 and 13 to write their own stories. We will now just have a short look on some of the platforms that you can use in starting your own online business. Now, if you have money specifically to pay for a well-built site, then Wix, Shopify, Squarespace and WooCommerce provide you with the most variety and the best options for your online business. However, if you don't have money to spend and you need to focus on cost saving, then you can always utilize face, um, social media to start your own business. The two main social media sites that provide you with options for online shopping is Facebook and Instagram. But then you can also use sites such as Pinterest, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok and Snapchat to drive people to your sites on Facebook and Instagram. Or even just use Facebook and Instagram where the one would feed the other one. So you can either use Facebook to drive people to your Instagram and start to grow your Instagram or you can use Instagram to build a community of potential customers on Facebook and drive people to your Facebook page. The same goes for the other social media sites such as Pinterest, LinkedIn, YouTube and TikTok or Snapchat where you can use the influencers on some of these sites or become an influencer on one of those sites and utilize it um, to market your products or services and drive them to your store on Instagram or Facebook. And the same obviously goes for utilizing all these social media sites to drive the community of potential customers and current customers to your Wix, Shopify, Squarespace or WooCommerce online site. Now to conclude this session, it's important to know that Whichever way you go in starting an, an, your own business, entrepreneurship remains challenging and full of risks. But the moment you get it right, you reach career freedom and build something of your own for the future and future generations. The internet changes extremely fast. What happens in one year in online equals about five years in the real world. That's the extent to which the internet changes. If you want to be successful, you cannot um, stay behind. You need to keep abreast of all these changes. But what's good is that principles of how to start and grow a successful online business won't change even though the internet changes. And you can't go wrong with the basics. With that, I hope that all of you who attended this session may sail the seas of online business with enough wind in your sails to ensure a successful journey. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much to Northwest University for that contribution. There was a point in that very last slide to make sure that you build the career that you want from the beginning. And I think that's such a wonderful thing to do. I mean, I hope that you walked away from that particular session with some ideas on how you can launch your business online. All you need literally is a cell phone and data and you can get started. So all the best to you if you're going to take that jump. Uh, so Kumsi, I believe your university has a contribution for us. Great stuff. I'm actually now an excited homeboy. <laughs> so upcoming is my home, my family. How are you homies? I hope you guys are tuning in, you are sharing, you are commenting, you are liking still on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, EDAG Student Entrepreneurship. Nelson Mandela University will be coming with a video. Um, coming in now. Welcome to the Nelson Mandela University Entrepreneurship Week. In line with the theme of creative entrepreneurship, we will be sharing inspiring entrepreneurial stories from our students and alumni, including the renowned Laduma from Matosa. As Nelson Mandela said, it seems impossible until it's done. We hope this will motivate you to realize that your ideas and dreams are possible. Laduma is one of the Africa's finest, most innovative fashion designers, cultural icons, and an innovative entrepreneur. He has created a global fashion brand where his designs have graced runways and been featured in numerous fashion editorials. He established the brand in 2010, Laduma, with a desire to explore knitwear design solutions that are cultural and heritage based. He has been featured in many newspapers and magazine editorials, serving as an inspiration. What I can fairly say is, um, I've gone and, 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 and spoke and, 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 and visited institutions around the world. Uh, I think that our design and art department have some of the strongest in the world. Uh, they should never doubt the credibility of their curriculum. So I started having a passion for fashion and textiles when I was young in high school. My old sister, which is the lady in a black jersey on the left image, um, used to make custom-made pieces for clients. I used to proudly, on the right, that is me, model for her. And um, the whole idea of being a fashion designer wasn't really there at that time. You know, I was basically making jerseys from home and trying to discover what this textile design that people often speak about. And not knowing that the knitwear that I actually had learned from my late mother was what would be the ultimate textile that I would have had an opportunity to learn about at a, at a very profound level um, through my degree at uh, Nelson Mandela University. Um, I grew up in a small community called Quadwis and um, I got a sponsorship from the Mohe, Mohe Board, uh, Mohe South Africa, and got sponsorship from Cape Wools South Africa as well to create the so-called project that I had presented to them that I felt it would make an impact in the design industry. And my primary focus was, of course, in Port Elizabeth, because PE is the hub of wool and mohe. We have the biggest mohe industry in the world and the biggest wool industry in Africa. And so I went on and pursued um, my thesis question and got a lot of help from my supervisors at the time, Rita uh, Filiumi and Glenn and various other um, 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 representatives from different departments. And they guided me and advised me to look into the museum, the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Art Museum that had a beautiful collection of traditional Kosa beadwork that, that, that they exhibited um, during the World Cup, um, 
so i went there and opened up a few caverns and started getting excited you know because i could explore a lot from these designs and actually create an aesthetic that can be interpreted in a multiple number of ways because as you might know with us Tosa people we have about plus minus 250 clans that we are subdivided to i am personally from the Mbondo clan and each and every clan has its preferential color combinations and patterns uh, for instance the ones that you see here on the screen i uh, they, they specifically come come from a, a group called Amantim, who preferred like a lot of pinks. So um, with, with those references, I then picked them up and started playing around with them in design and converted them in form of patterns and motifs and started e exploring a number of designs that were easily interpretable into various other um, forms of not just knitwear so i could anticipate using those designs as well in carpets and towels and clothes and cushions um, because that is the opportunity that a textile design provides so um, the ultimate objective was to not only make an impact in the design space I did acknowledge the fact that the textile and the clothing industry in South Africa has been declining since the early 90s and therefore it would be wise to create jobs within that space and revive it but this time around not specialize in manufacturing low price margin products but luxury pieces that would make sure that people get their money's worth uh, in terms of the salaries that we pay our people and also our management and also the prices that we pay for raw material in the value chain as well. So I did pencil in an ambition of opening up a factory and having stores um, and um, this was ultimately the result that we got out of the thesis project. Whoa. It got me an opportunity to be invited to speak at the Design in Daba um, conference in 2011. I remember vividly, it was February. I got a call and I immediately called the university and told them about it. They were super excited and um, they helped me put together a photo shoot and uh, that photo shoot was actually this image uh, where I had to dress up as a Tosa initiates including my mates we were not Tosa initiates um, we were Tosa initiates about like five years before that but uh, because we had the experience you know we, we played that role to showcase and show to the world that this is how our culture can potentially look at um, or how we envision it if our territory was never tapped with you know, this is how we see the bid work would have been evolved in our day and, and, and age and um, for me i wanted to create pieces actually that could be easily be wearable on a daily basis and not only on special occasions such as heritage day or when you have a traditional ceremony at home um, so basically I had to come up with a sort of a brand that people would recognize a brand that will be easily be easy to sell to the world a brand that has a heritage story behind it and for me I could not think of any better branding than a word Makosa, which simply means the Kosa people. But with that word, I wanted to tell the story of the Kosa people, but in my own context and, and showcased how, how beautiful we are. But um, after five years, after we've evolved, I then included Africa at the bottom because we were we, 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 with the shows that I've been doing around the world. 
um, a lot of people that saw our work identified it with Africa before they even knew about a cultural group in the deep down south of Africa called Amakosa. So um, we thought that we want to celebrate other cultures as well and also be inclusive when it comes to their aesthetic because um, in this current day as we speak um, our client clientele base um, is, is, is we have a very small number of Kosa people that actually purchase our products so we have Amatswana, we have Amazulu, we have almost all the cultural groups in South Africa that purchases our products and they proudly do celebrate um, 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 our brand without looking at us as trying to come across as being tribal. Um, and also as well, when we do shows, we try to include models from West Africa, East Africa, and different parts of the diaspora as well, you know, to showcase that um, the aesthetic that we are coming up with. Even though we are using a case study of the 1% of Africa's population, um, we are speaking on behalf of the continent and try to showcase that this is how potentially traditional aesthetic can be interpreted in different cultures and to inspire other young designers that want to find their identity and commercialize it. Not to say that they should only look at, interpreted, at interpreting them into patterns, but there are other multiple ways of a design that people can play with. Um, these are some of the examples of the images of shows that I've been doing over the years. And um, they've, with, 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 with repackaging a culture that way, um, it has been easy for us to be published and be written about in magazines because we had to reposition ourselves and, 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 and make a bold statement that we are here in the industry to carve a way in the in the african luxury space because we've seen a huge gap and that journey that we took um, attracted the likes of elisha keys beyonce or obonum zamo rakhub masegele and multiple other figures to actually want to be associated with that aesthetic as a way of them telling a story of where they truly come from um and then on to the part that people are always um curious about is how my family members became a great part of the business so um my old sister utina who graduated at the nelson mandela university uh, in, uh, in in fashion design um, and my young sister who graduated in uh, BTEC in public relations at NMU as well. Um, and my young brother did um, a little bit of finance at um, NMU as well. Um, five years ago, um, they individually sent me a message and said, we want to be part of your journey because um, we can foresee what you are doing going far. Um, my young sister, um, the PR one, was the one who was the first one to join the company. My young brother followed and my old sister Utina joined in as well. Um, but for me, um, I thought that um, the vision of building a dynasty, you know, begins with us bonding um, and making sure that we protect what is there here in front of us and also preserve it for our next generation and our community as well you know? and um, their industry know-how helped a lot in expanding the business because uh, to be frank i don't have a great passion for finance i do understand some of 
financial know-how, the income statements and balance sheets. I gave that role to my young brother who specializes in it. I don't have a great passion for logistics. He takes care of logistics and HR as well. Um, my young sister, Ulisse, who is the general manager, um, she's the person that um, um, calls the shots um, and disciplines staff to make sure that we are all operating in one vision. Um, my old sister, Utina, is the production manager that makes sure that the products are produced on time and they are, and they are good quality. And um, she also heads up our atelier department where we create customized pieces for our clients. And uh, these are some of the clients that have been voting with um, their money. And this is the type of conviviality that we built with them and created smile on their faces. Sister is one of them. Um, yes. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't get your picture of you and put it here on time. I will get it. <laughs> and, um, and on to our overseas clients. Um, 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 people have also a misconception, I don't know why, that we don't dress we don't create oversized pieces. You know? So this is a reference that we often show our clients that uh, we are inclusive when it comes to size as well. Macrosa is available in extra, extra, extra small, and extra, 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 extra large. Um, and this is the proud family um, of our manufacturers that we have, um, literally, 80% of our staff members are women. Uh, we believe in women empowerment and uh, growing our people. And uh, these beautiful ladies come from all over South Africa. As, as some of them speak Tswana, uh, that we are still learning here in Jobek. Uh, they speak Edi, Swati, some come from Zimbabwe. So we've got a melting pot of multiple cultures in, 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 in one space and trying to make sure that we share each other's cultures and celebrate one another. Thank you. Evan Zimba. Uh, I describe myself as a fashion entrepreneur. I've got a ready-to-wear brand called Walking Closet and a company called Wig Designs that houses the brand, manufacturing company, and a branding company. Okay. Uh, there's a brand itself, Walking okay. Closet. Yes. And there's a manufacturing, Wig Manufacturing, and yeah. there's a printing, Wig Print. Okay. Yeah. So it's a three-dimensional business. This yeah. is. So how did you come about this? Um, uh, innovative business that is able to cut itself in three folds? Well, initially I had the fashion brand. So the fashion brand is demanding a lot of money. So I needed to find other ways of making money while still pushing the fashion brand. Mm. So uh, where I used to print, it cost a bit too much. So I invested in purchasing the machinery and I lowered my costs and just the time in which I'll get the stuff to the clients. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, it turned into a business of its own where I could service other clients. And then the manufacturing was similar issues as well. Just to be in more control of the, the quality and everything, I've invested in the machinery. And then the manufacturing turned into manufacturing of its own, where I manufacture for other local brands, companies, and that sort. So I just managed to just try and keep it all in fashion, and then all those income streams feed the fashion brand. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, but we know you as an 8R student. How did we get to the fashion industry side? Ah. <sighs> I'll say more of the entrepreneurial side. Yeah. Um, it wasn't all this fashion. I've sold weaves. Oh. I've sold yeah, a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. But with fashion, people always ask me what I'm wearing. 
So I found it easier to sell because I just sell what I have. <laughs> Okay, so I'm a media student, um, majoring in languages and print media, basically. Uh, I'm also a poet. Okay. I am a natural hair enthusiast. Okay, how, how did this journey start? I mean, um, uh, as a media student, you said, mm -hmm. uh, when did you just decide about, actually, uh, my media focus should be on hair, and <laughs> how did that journey start? Well, it started with my own hair, actually. Okay. Uh, it was my own hair it's journey. It's popping, by the way. <laughs> Thank <So> you. <laughs> Better be. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, I experimented a lot with my hair. Okay. I went through a Rihanna phase. I think we all did. Mm. Throughout the end, towards the end of high school, basically, mm. I cut it, I colored, and the other thing was that I, I always had a sensitive scalp. So relaxer was never for me. At okay. some point, my scalp was bleeding. So it was hectic, mm -hmm. chemical burns, and the hair just wouldn't listen. Because mm. the hair just resists. And it's like you go through all of that pain for once, and then the hair still doesn't pop. And then at some point, I went to a salon to get my hair cut, mm. uh, to get it leveled out, because I had been doing all these tapered haircuts. And it was an experience that I think all women, I don't know about men, I know from a woman's perspective that we can all relate to when it comes to going to a salon and explaining what you want and having them do what they want mm. to your hair mm. so i was there protesting but mm. <laughs> it happened and i basically got like a buzz cut <laughs> mm. and i wasn't expecting mm. to get a buzz cut and i even got the corners mm. you know i'm like very the sensitive <laughs> about my hair i i i know i spoke that. up mm. and then they were like sissy sissy mm. we know what you want do the uh please refrain from let us do our magic directing us and i was never ready with your own mind <laughs> with your own hair of course they know best so i was never ready and it, it was a phase of experimentation with, with regards to color and how i wear my hair mm. and from there it gave me trust issues about other people you know working with my head so it inspired me to mm. look into how to look after my hair better my my own self mm. um so that's what I did. And even with the hairstyling, because first Weza's hair was uh, hairstyles, protective styling. So like braids and faux locks and yarn twists. And even there, you know, I had a tutorial. I went to a salon. I was like, can you do this? And they were like, yes. And it was something that was much tighter. I'm tender headed. And I think a lot of us are tender headed. So it was something much tighter with wool. And wool is very, there's a love-hate relationship with our hair with wool. If mm -hmm. you're too tight, it can damage. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of us have grown up with wool being used to grow our hair. Yeah. So it can be very beneficial. But mm -hmm. it wasn't used in that beneficial way. Mm -hmm. And I had myself to blame because I had the tutorial. So it just inspired me because I don't even like to sit for all those hours. So I just, I learned how to do my own hair. Okay. And people, you know, you come to Varsity and people are like, where did you get your hair done? You know, who did that? You did that? Can you do mine? And mm. that's what inspired the business side of things. Okay. Concept in essence came about as a result of identifying a gap in the market, mm. right? Uh, and that gap was particularly that you had a lot of delivery services, now, but these delivery services went for health-related products. Mm. Most of them were for fast food. Mm. Um, you find no Uber Eats, Mr. Delivery, and whatnot. And in essence, you know, in a space like a summer strand or where you've got you know a, a big student population and you've got a, a, a huge population of people who then go about exercising you know so some of the people you see them at the beach and the whatnot uh we then thought you know how about having a delivery service that delivers fruits and vegetables at convenient prices um and then at the time we started off with a combo right mm. 
uh, which was the 2000 combo. Ironically, we still have that 2000. Yeah, combo. that's our that's our <laughs> combo for life. <laughs> it's our combo oh, for life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the 2000 combo just had you know a combination of everything that you'd need. We say me, you know, from mm-hmm. peppers, guppy, me, carrot, you name it, e- mm. essentials. Like I said, yeah, bro. Mm. Uh, then eventually we sort of grew out of the combo thing uh, and allowed customers a bit more variety. But uh, the concept came from. Uh, in essence, how can I say, identifying a gap within the market. Hey, so my name is Sipoko Lema Diwane and I am born and bred in East London. So I'm from East London and I've been here for a good five, six years. And I was here um, obviously to study. So I was doing um, a diploma in the Nelson Mandela University. So I graduated and I did my advanced diploma. However, Ukwakuhle, who yo that's that's my baby that's my baby so it's a new newly established business so yeah still getting that okay. going mm-hmm. all right so um how would you say uh Kwakuse actually started what 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 um i'm sure there was one time when someone <laughs> was like hey perhaps you should uh start something here how did that start and it's actually like that just like you mentioned it's always been a thing of i've always loved cooking i mean I, i'm sure that's what we learn when we're young right our moms tell us hey, uh, uh, you need to start cooking mm. so for me it was it was more than just preparing meals for um the household however when it's a chore you feel ugh, I'm not enjoying this because you have to do it mm. every day at 6 p.m. My mom's expecting supper for the family, mm. so that's it. I knew that my love for cooking was going to be something that is beyond just preparing meals. When I was in high school, actually, um, in high school, I was selling muffins and I was selling other things. But however, every time where I tried to have a side hustle, it would always be kitchen related, ah. right? So I also did, um, when you had to choose subjects, I did physics and I did pure maths. Mm. However, I dropped out of physics the following year. So I started doing consumer studies. Ah. And I was like, this is home. This is home for me. As much as consumers is not just about the kitchen and it's not just about cooking, I feel like the subject itself molds you um, into, like you run a household. They teach you how to run a household, basically. So it's not just for the female. It's also for males. Mm -hmm. However, I'd always be the one going to my teacher after class. How do you do this? What is this for? Mm -hmm. Why? What is this utensil called? Mm -hmm. So as i was going as i was doing it i just knew that there was a passion there and then i had to do something about it so i had a very understanding teacher miss domini so yeah and then this year no actually last year i started i wanted to do the business i wanted to start last year but then i was working and i was doing my advanced at the same time so i thought let me not give it a time frame it's going to happen when god wants it to happen so I started, I continued working, but then on social media, I started putting um, posts up oh, and yeah. just seeing the reaction of Abandu. What are people going to say when they see these dishes? I started learning how to present my food in a more like aesthetically a please, pleasing way and all of that. And then it so happened that I stopped working and I grabbed the bull by its horns. <laughs> Nelson Mandela University always brings out the best, and we have the best of the best. <laughs> like a you, little biased, but okay. You know, like Lat Duma is doing amazing things yeah. all over the world. He's our Gucci man, you know. So thank you to Nelson Mandela University. So proud of the entrepreneurs. Let's keep on doing amazing things. Sigi? Yeah, no, definitely. You guys did do well. I'm really impressed with Makasa, um, the lady there at the end with her the show that you had i think was good morning with the match yes i will give it to you guys are doing good things we'll, we'll give you that and um, we're about to take a break we'll be taking a 30 minute intermission but in that time i want to encourage you to please um keep engaging on hoover so just a quick shout out to people who've posted selfies so Likotur posted one um there's also one there from Tlo. thank you guys so much can i ask you to maybe just repost that on social media at edhe student entrepreneurship and use the hashtag 
SEW 2020 um, and hashtag Afrotech because we're giving away a social media prize for 150 um, take a lot voucher for that and we won't be doing a selfie competition and then just a quick look at the leaderboard Hazra is sitting on number one and Hazra I trust will be holding that position for the rest of the day um, and we'll be able to give you a prize at the end of today but anything could happen um, I see Ndamululu, Ndamululu is chasing that but I mean you've won twice in D so you know let's give the other children a chance you know um, and then Sizwe and Piogu there you guys are still in the top five so you could if you engage more during the break and before we wrap up today make it to that number one spot i also do want to encourage you to go to our facebook page where you will find the link to our virtual um showcase and you'll be able to see all the studentpreneur projects um, and their businesses and you'll be able to visit the virtual stores um, and then before we wrap up at the end of today we will be sharing what's next with sew so please do stay tuned until the end of today's activities so you know what's happening next what do you need to look out for what do you want to apply for and how you can continue to engage with us and play your part in building the sew community we'll be back in 30 minutes
color as a color crayon. We were running through the fields. You had flowers in your hand. We were all chasing phantoms. Maybe you would hold them still, and I grab on. Yeah. Well, if you're scared of the dark, let the rundown street lights be your stars, and then picture swings in the park, and I'll swing with you. Sing it. Sing it. Sing it like a if you want to. The next time I turn around, you'll have grown into a woman in a single bound. I hope I never take you for granted. Spending time with you is all that I wanted. But I'll go back to when you were small, burning all our favorite records on the CD rom. We were splitting headphones in a hammock to a soundtrack we could get lost in. Sing it with me. Sing it with me. And we'll go howling at the moon. It's no use living if you're already dead. It's not worth saying if it's already said. Even if it all goes over your head, believe it if you want to. So keep your eyes on the road and your head in the stars. Follow it down the rabbit hole just a little while longer. You can change anything. It's no use living if you're already dead. It's not worth saying if it's already said. Even if it all goes over your head, believe it if you want to. So keep your eyes on the road and your head in the stars. Follow it down the rabbit hole just a little while longer. You can change anything if you want to. Welcome back. We're still continuing with our final day of the SEW 2020. I hope you had a good time during that break and you were able to stretch, get something to eat um, and engage with us on Hoover. A big shout out to Hazra, who's still in position number one. Um, a few more hours and the prize could be yours. I also want to just send your attention to the polls for voting. Um, we've opened up a few new polls and if you could just respond to that, we'd really appreciate it. So we want to find out from you, have you learned anything new from SEW 2020? Um, Please let us know which session you enjoyed the most. Um, we also want to find out from you what would you like to see in the future of SCW. And the final question that's up there is, did you find the event valuable? So if you head over to the poll section on the main page of Hoover, you'll be able to see everything and you can respond to each of those polls and we will share some responses before we close off today. So Kumzi, how have you felt about um, the session this morning? Uh, the session was incredible. Um, and I like how the different universities came in but I'm most impressed by the colleges yeah. false bay I love what mr. Um, Oliver said action then traction then inspiration 
Um, so I've just, I've just been mind blown and I, I wish that we can make copies of that false pay. Obviously we're in an <laughs> academic space, yeah. we can't plagiarize. Maybe I'll ask Nabagazi <laughs> if we can make copies. If you can help us out, yeah. But I mean, they were really good and it was wonderful to see our um, TVET colleges coming through this morning with their contributions. Up next, we have a contribution from the L University of Limpopo and they'll be exploring practice based entrepreneurship across various disciplines. Here's a video that we'll be sharing with you on that. Ralamagalago, the University of Limpopo Student Entrepreneurship Week 2020. Now, I am excited about this one. Good day and welcome. I am a media student at the University of Limpopo. I am also CEO and founder of Mesh Organics. Now, today it is going to be a very interesting day because we are going to be focusing on practice-based entrepreneurships. For more information about this Student Entrepreneurship Week, we'll be talking to our administrator, Mr. Mahali. Mr. Mahali, welcome to Student Entrepreneurship Week 2020 now. Uh, tell us more about this week. So um, this week we're going to be celebrating, or we are celebrating Student Entrepreneurship Week, which is a project by EDHE, which is a program by the Department of Education and Training, which seeks to promote and encourage students to pursue entrepreneurship as a career. So basically we want to show students that there's more to just studying, you know. You can study and yet become a student a student entrepreneur, which is what you call a student premier. So hence oh. we are celebrating this week. Yes. So why uh, practice-based entrepreneurship? So at the University of Popo, we chose to focus on practice-based entrepreneurship because we want to show um, students that there's more that you can do with your qualification. You, know, you can use your qualification to become more than just a practitioner, but an entrepreneur in your own field. Hence we are focusing on practice-based entrepreneurship. From your faculties in humanities, um, psychology, law, and the, all those kind of things. Want to show them that there's entrepreneurship potential in mm. those practices. All right, thank you so much. Uh, right now, we are going to go to uh, Mr. Tesh, who is going to give us more information about this week's theme, which is practice-based entrepreneurship. Um, so just to give you a quick uh, background on the, the hub itself and uh, myself and, 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 and my understanding around practice-based entrepreneurship, um, first things first, uh, my name is Tash Bodhi. I'm a project manager with the University of Limpopo, um, and I've, uh, I focus more on the projects uh, uh, and grants management of the university itself. And one of the projects that, have, uh, that we've managed to kick off uh, is around the entrepreneurship uh, activities within the university. So I've, uh, my background is I've been in uh, entrepreneurship development for a number of years. I've worked for organizations like PETA and the Innovation Hub um, various other organizations, and I've run my own consulting company uh, around business development. So the whole essence of um, entrepreneurial, uh, uh, entrepreneurial development and startup, uh, the startup world has always had a passion to me. So um, I wanted to bring that on and, and, and drive that initiative uh, within the University of Limpopo. So the idea of then coming about with the uh, LIT Hub, which is stands for the Limpopo Innovation and Technology Hub, uh, came about. Um, the hub focuses on digital skills uh, for entrepreneurs uh, and um, incubation services within that environment. However, we also do see that there as being, you know, uh, a beacon for, 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 for entrepreneurship within the university. Um, so it becomes uh, what the hub aims to do is to create an ecosystem of all the different entrepreneurial initiatives that are run through the university and then become this nucleus uh, of, of awareness and, and training and assistance to, to uh, student entrepreneurs and startups, SMEs, and our community and the uh, university as a whole. Um, when it comes to practice-based uh, entrepreneurship, it's a, it's a quite an interesting aspect, this, uh, especially when you come, especially when you look at it from a, from a university angle, and also with our current situation. Uh, for me, practice-based entrepreneurship, you know, some people, if you think about it, <laughs> it's just in the from a definition point of view in terms of practice based it feels like oh no no well it's it's, it's hands on entrepreneurship but also if you think about it from the other side of the angle is how are people that are for example practitioners or people that are practicing in a certain field uh, now have to become entrepreneurs um and you know for me it's a lot of times is that you're going to understand like um people are forced into entrepreneurship in certain angles and then there's people that are just natural entrepreneurs 
And when it comes to questions-based entrepreneurship, it's the point whereby you've got to identify that person's skill or that knowledge base and how it's, are they being able to now drive that basis, actually drive a business, because that is a whole other element on its own. Um, so it's definitely an interesting environment to be involved in. It's an interesting place uh, for, for entrepreneurs to start developing their, 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 um, their understanding of the fact that uh, entrepreneurship can become a career of choice as well, and not just within the field that they study, for example, that they can actually start becoming entrepreneurs in those fields as well. Not everybody is an entrepreneur. Uh, and, but it is important for, for students to start exploring that idea and start exploring that, option, uh, that opportunity. Um, so for me, it would be a point of whereby for them to become entrepreneurs, they need to start develop, they need to start evaluating their, their skills, start evaluating their, their own knowledge base, their own business skills, uh, if they have any um, uh, ideas or, or goals and stuff like that, that they want to actually start, start pursuing, and then find the business idea in those in those skills. Uh, find a business idea that that would suit them best. You know, the the the, the world of becoming of of, of 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 being an entrepreneur, it teaches you so much. Uh, it teaches you so much of, of hands-on skills, uh, critical thinking, critical decision making. Um, and I think that is that is something that students need to start, um, you know, tapping into that into, the, into that mindset. Uh, so you know, as a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you constantly got to be uh, problem solving. You got to have these problem solving abilities. You need to start thinking critically. You need to start thinking strategically. And how do I now, uh, you know, what is my next move? How do I operate my business? How do I structure it? How do I do those things? And if they can take those tools and techniques and ideas and apply it. To their, to their, uh, um, you know, current life or their current studying or stuff, uh, it, they can actually improve themselves a lot better. Um, you know, when it comes to the actual uh, point in terms of benefits of pursuing entrepreneurship, there's always the financial benefit. <laughs> there's always a, 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 that, that, that's always the, the, the best of, uh, part of it all. But I always look at it from the point of whereby you also have freedom. Uh, you also have the element of the fact that, you know what, I can I can be my own boss. Welcome back to the Student Entrepreneurship Weekend. It is still a uh, practice-based entrepreneurship. And today we have a special guest. His name is Moses Moreira. He's going to be telling us about his business in publishing. And uh, he's here. Hello. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I am well. So today we are talking about practice-based entrepreneurship. And um, I, want, I want to ask you something. Uh, tell us more about your business. All right. Um, publishing, we deal with production of books. Mm -hmm. We deal with what we call print on demand, which means we print as fast as possible. Within a few minutes, we can print over a thousand books because we use um, cutting edge machines. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we specialize in self-publishing after realizing that there's so much potential in storytelling from our local people who for the longest time have been struggling to score uh, publishing deals because of exorbitant costs that are involved because from editing to proofing to your typesetting to your graphic designs to all of those things, to your marketing, to getting to sell your books mm -hmm. to the rest of your world, to the rest of the world from online uh, facilities. So it happened that when I wanted to publish my own book, mm -hmm. then I've, I've met so many challenges and so many uh, gruesome uh, processes that one needs to follow. Then I realized that no, there is a gap that so many people go through this and at the end of the day fail to publish so i needed to bridge that gap that's when i, I went into publishing oh okay interesting so do you believe that uh, since we are focusing then on practice-based entrepreneurship do you believe that this, the curriculum is uh, is helping the students you know in terms of practicing um what they have studied definitely definitely um for someone like me who studied uh, media and communications um it comes in handy because in publishing, there is an element of editing, there is element of communication, there is element of graphics, there is element of branding, advertising, all of these things, creative writing, all of these things are incorporated in, 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 in the curriculum as we study. So I would say 
that was all in one for me because everything that I do now uh, as business stems from that um, information from studies. Okay, interesting. So I want to know what was your biggest milestone in starting your uh, enterprise? Okay, the biggest milestone was that um, I published my own book. So, so, so my company, the first client of my company was myself. And um, for that, I've learned so many processes of publishing, dealing with all stakeholders involved, dealing with uh, fleet in terms of distributing books to bookstores, in terms of editing, we do business writing and all those things. Mm -hmm. So that was to expand the, the scope of our, our, our operations. And the biggest milestone to date is that we've got over 900 titles and um, we are still crawling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes, we are not that old. So it, because the word of mouth, so many people realize that, oh, it's possible because we wanted the black child to tell their own stories. You know, you remember our parents, they used to tell so much folklore by mm. fireside. Mm. So we, we still have people who've got those stories, but they are unable to get them out there. Mm. So our biggest milestone is seeing people telling their stories through us. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the challenges that you have faced uh, in your business thus far? Uh, access to, to, to the market. You know, the, chain, the value chain, the supply chain. It's so strict that um, there's so much capitalism in it, the conveyor belt. For instance, um, most of the people who own bookstores mm -hmm. are the people who are in production. So when you say, okay, here's an offer in Limpopo, and the target market is in Limpopo, you go to a mall to find a bookstore and you say, can we put the books on your shelf? Mm -hmm. What are, 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 are your, 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 your criteria and stuff? They would tell you that you need to speak to the national office. They send you to Cape Town. Mm -hmm. When you go to Cape Town, now they send you to their own distributor. When you go to their own distributor, they tell you how much they want you to print. Remember, this, this so many authors are in self-publishing, mm -hmm. which means they do not have enough money to go through all of those processes because they are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. in, even the marketing side of it. So... Mm -hmm. The access now to take the products into the actual bookstores to expand the reach of, of, of uh, our clients. That's a serious problem because there's so much uh, red tape there. Okay. Well, in most cases, we get told that, okay, go to school, get a job, and that's it. But you overcame all of that, uh, the norms, and you started a business. What advice would you give to all media students who like to get into publishing but they don't know where to start? Oh, the fear of not unleashing all of my prospects was the biggest uh, push because I've realized that we have fear of fear in ourselves. So we fear the unknown that um, this so-and-so that we look up to has managed. Now they are a journalist, now they are editors and what, 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 what. Even how they teach us. They don't teach us to be our own bosses. They teach us to be compliant mm. in, 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 in practice. So I would say to those who are in the same field that study to become the best version of yourself. And that would not be an employee, but someone who creates so many opportunities through their knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because we are in unemployment fiasco now, simply because we all want to go through that belt of becoming a journalist, of working for so and so and so. If we were having this mentality that out of this qualification, I want to expand the sector. Then all of us are going to have that piece of the pie. Hmm, interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I hope everyone at home is learning something from uh, you because I, I am definitely learning something. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right, there you have it uh, from Moses Morera. I hope you guys are learning something from home media student. I hope you guys are listening and getting something from this experience. Continuing with our Student Entrepreneurship Week, we are going to be talking to entrepreneurs. And first on our line is uh, Basil Rabupala from Heavy Craft. Mr. Basil, uh, tell us more about your business. Um, my company's name is Heavy Craft, as you've stated before. Um, it's a GIS and related service consulting company that provides spatial analysis and map production. 
Okay, so how did you use your qualification uh, to start up your enterprise? A funny fact, I, I never even had an idea of using JIS as a tool to make my life uh, better. But then I had someone who came to me during my final year study who asked me to perform a spatial analysis for their company. So I basically scanned a particular map that they had applied a permit for, for possible minerals that are found there. And I believe that's what gave me the idea of saying, okay, this is something that you can make a living out of. And then I took the opportunity. So what was your biggest milestone in establishing your enterprise? Um, biggest milestone. Um, whew. I would say the first year of Harvey Craft, I didn't have a single client. That is, no money came in. It was only me using um, my own money in order to keep the company afloat. So mm -hmm. for someone who doesn't have passion, who is not persistent, who is not determined to succeed, it's, mm -hmm. it was going to be easy for that person to give up. So I believe the, the fire in me is what drove me to uh, continue doing what I did. Because if you have a company and you're not making any profits, that in itself is a glitch that will say, I, I'd rather go and find or look for a job. So what I basically did was I used COVID-19 and the lockdown to my advantage. Um, what I basically did was mm -hmm. to map uh, COVID-19 statistics maps on a daily basis and update on all social platforms, your Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook and also as a business. That way it helped me to gain traction and it made people aware of what I do and mm. how good am I. So I believe that also helped me because right now um, I worked on the biggest project for trading, for in trading and projects, which they basically needed me to um, to analyze the area that they had applied for um, it's a it's a project on water use license application. So I believe I did a great job because they didn't complain. Um, the service was excellent and the remarks also were good from the client and their colleagues as well. In most cases, as students, we get told that we should go to school and get a nine to five uh, job. So what uh, motivation can you give to students in your field uh, who would like to you know, start up something after graduating? We had an interesting conversation with Mr. Jimmy Mahali. Um, we spoke about during the course of us creating business plans, because he is the one who helped us. Um, we were speaking about dividends and salaries. So the difference is if you're going to work nine to five, you need to wake up early and go work, come back tired. You don't even have the energy to do what you want to do. You don't channel your energy in the right way. You're also creating wealth for someone else. Um, I believe it's it's not not impossible per se, but then it's gonna be harder for you to become rich or even to a greater extent and become wealthy if you are working for someone else. Um, the beauty about having your own craft is that you have to work your own hours all right, thank you so much for joining us at the Student Entrepreneurship Week. I hope uh, someone out there has learned something from you. All right, right now we are going to be talking to Mr. Terence Arapeta, who is uh, an attorney. Hi, I started my LLB with the University of Limpopo. Um, I'm currently the founder and, and director of MT Rapids Incorporated Attorneys. It's based here in Pretoria. Okay, so how did you use your qualification uh, to start up your enterprise? To, to just be an attorney, you need an LLB. And, and I, I can't say I used my studies per se as an LLB because that time when I studied, I didn't have the idea to, to actually start my own practice. It only yeah. came about post-grad when I actually went to further my studies and, and, and go through the process of being an attorney along the way. That's when I learned valuable skills that, that made me consider being my own boss. But the LLB itself, I, I don't think it, it, 
it 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 triggered that that eagerness that I had to to open my own practice. So, what was your biggest milestone in establishing your enterprise? To be honest with you on that, uh, finances are always an issue when you start up. Um, you are you are you are you are torn between having to to grow your business or paying yourself a salary. So, so finances have been a challenge, and it still is now, because you might have clients, but clients who don't pay. You understand? You mm. keep on, you keep on following up with people who don't want to to pay. It's 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 a struggle dealing with clients. It's a struggle, but mm. but I've managed I've managed to come up with a system where where we both uh, uh, benefit. I, I I have a plan. If you can't afford, I have a plan for my clients. You understand? I enter into agreements so that I can cater for both my company and for the client so that it, it can be balanced. In most cases, as students, we get told that we should go to school and get a nine to five uh, job. So what uh, motivation can you give to students in your field uh, who would like to you know, start up something after graduating? Just start, just start, just do it. Don't wait for, hey, I don't have enough money. I, just start especially in my field we are in a service-based field you can keep your overheads as little as possible just start you know we as attorneys we sell time you know you you sell your knowledge and time just start i would say to law students just start if you if you have the passion for it just start there's no use in delaying it money is not even 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 that bigger factor in our profession. You just apply your mind. All right, moving right along, we are going to be talking to Mpo Manama, who is a clinical psychologist at the University of Limpopo. Tell us more about clinical psychology. Being a clinical psychologist is a profession that works uh, around counseling, psychotherapy, and assessment. And it's basically around assisting people to deal more effectively with their emotions and be in touch with what they're going through equipping them with skills that will assist them to deal better with challenges that they meet along the way. Mm -hmm. And then how does one become a clinical psychologist? Post my grade 12, I did my junior degree with psychology as one of my major modules. Um, it was a three-year degree. I think BA in psychology in most institutions is three years. Um, post that, I did my honors in psychology, which was only for a year. Then I did my master's in clinical psychology. Um, the master's, it has both the practical part and the, the coursework. So I was at school for a year. Then I went and did my internship at um, specific hospitals. Then you also need to have a mini dissertation at the end of your master's degree. So that's how you ultimately end up uh, being a, a clinical psychologist. And the other route to become a clinical psychologist, you can do a four-year degree, your Bachelor of Psychology, they call it B-Psych. So you can do your Bachelor of Psychology for four years. It's, it's regarded as an honors degree, so you don't have to do your honors after that. You will go straight into your master's. Then you can go into your master's in clinical psychology. The same route of doing your coursework, doing your internship, and also finishing your mini dissertation. Then you will graduate as a master's, as a student in master's in clinical psych. Then after that, you need to register with the board, and you have to write your board exam. Uh, you need to do your community service. Community service, you do it immediately after you have done your internship and you within your community service before you can be hired permanently, you need to do, you need to write your body exam with HPCSA and it's 70 to 75% to pass the body exam. So one needs to be really prepared to, to write the body exam. When you write your body exam after you have passed your recognized um, clinical psychologist practicing independently with a practice number and under the guidelines of the HPCSA. So what are some of the milestones that you have endured uh, in becoming a clinical psychologist? It's imparting the knowledge that I have. 
as well as being in a position to assist people to deal with their emotional traumas. Because um, remember, in, 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 in our society, a lot of people are still not yet uh, comfortable in seeing psychologists. So the, the community projects that we get to be involved in making awareness to people about the importance of seeing clinical psychologists or just seeing a counselor for an individual to be able to assist them through their emotional problems. I normally give them this example, how much we take our cars for service. You know, it's, it's a norm. We are used to taking our cars to service. We know when they reach a certain kilometers, they have to go to their, to their manufacturers and they get service. But then who gets to service us emotionally as people? Where do you go to get that person to really assist you through and put the parts, align the parts accordingly and, 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 and make sure that your functioning is, is aligned? So it's very important that in our society, mental health is recognized, mental health is, 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 is realized, and also the importance of knowing whether you are at a good space or knowing that emotionally I'm not okay and I, 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 need, I need to go and get someone to assist me through and there's nothing wrong with that i know a lot of people view it as being weak view it as being a taboo to actually go and talk to other people about their problems but then uh, i would actually encourage people to take that opportunity as it comes and be able to go through that process themselves because at the end of the day they come out better people they come out stronger people they come out knowledge and then they they are at a position themselves to impart such information to the other people you know when when i was still doing my internship when it comes to age it's also uh, one of the things that people tend not to be comfortable with. You know, people, when they go to a psychologist, they expect this older person that's going to be assisting them. And when they get there, they find someone very young, but then very experienced in the, in the profession. So that was one of the challenges that I had to deal with in terms of, for real and poor, will you be able to assist us? But then with everything that I had learned and everything that I was trained, to be able to assist my my fans we were able to conquer that and at the end of the day people believe in what they see and how you have worked with them and they start believing in your profession the other challenge would be the stereotyped um, belief that people still have and how you we struggle a lot as psychologists to put people and assist people to understand the importance of the outcomes you know it's very um sad when you, you have done an assessment and then you have made a recommendation that the child needs to go to a special school and you find that the parents are still in denial of what needs to happen and they don't realize how much they are denying their child an opportunity to be taught in an environment that will be very fruitful for them. They will, they will still continue to take the child to mainstream only to find that the child is struggling with mainstream curricula. The child will actually benefit when they go to a special school. So it really becomes very sad. Three years on the line and you meet the child or, you, or the mother comes back at the very same institution, but with something different. And when, when they tell you, no, we've never really moved the child to another school, maybe it's because of the stigma. They are afraid of the stigma. They don't want their child to be discriminated, to be stigmatized because they are going to a specific school. And it goes back to the myth that surrounds our profession. It goes back to the the name calling that surrounds our, our profession. It goes back to how our society is still viewing um, the, the, the profession itself or how our society is still viewing children that are going to special schools. So it's very important that when we do awareness or when we are psychologists or we are psychologists in different communities, we make it our point that we, we teach or we educate the community about the importance of our services, we, we educate them about the importance of the outcome and what is it that the children will benefit from what we have recommended so that they, they ultimately need to be individuals, independent individuals in their caliber. And they can only do that if we allow them to function in an environment that is suitable for them.
whatever profession that you end up in, make sure that it would lead you to something that you're passionate about so that you are not only going to be an employee, but you can be an employer yourself. All right, thank you so much, Miss Monama. And I hope a lot of people learn something who are watching from home. All right, that's it from me. And of course, this wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for our communication and marketing team, Piladi Nakeng, Jimmy Mohali, and of course, Prof Nganyo. entrepreneurship across all disciplines. Thank you very much to the University of Limpopo for that amazing presentation. Now to our next video from Goldfields TVET College. So we need to work on our own, our own autonomy as an entrepreneur. A woman can do a good job just as any contractor can. Hello and welcome to everybody watching. My name is Udun Kasibe and I'm not alone. I am with the talented, multi-skilled creative that is and hi everybody, thank you to me and my name is Ula Pazifenge and welcome to the Student Entrepreneurship Week that is hosted by Goldfields, Tibet College and Center for Entrepreneurship in Dalma and welcome to everybody <laughs> Center for Entrepreneurship Rapid Incubation at Goldfield Stevet College. I'm responsible for day-to-day -day running of that particular center to oversee it, to, to run it very effectively for its own objectives. Our main objective is to change the mindset of the student from being the job hunters for them to be the job creators. That is why we ask the center is situated at, at, at Tosa and engineering campus, so that strategically those students, when they study, they are also in the program, so that when they graduate, they'll go and start their own businesses with what they've learned. We 
mentor, we coach, we support, we develop, and we also give them the shared service. I think they run their company, their companies from the offices, from the same center where they use the free Wi-Fi, our computers, and also for printers, and everything. I think their, their company's administration is done in that particular center. Yes, we have companies that are doing very well. We have Ntonga Arts, who started from zero. Those young boys, you know, they studied, they dropped out, then they went to go and join industry. In the industry, they find it very difficult and hard. When they heard about the center, they came back to the center. We transformed them, we mentored them, we developed them, we support them. They started with zero budget, but from now they have machinery that amounted to close to 500 grand, and they are operating on a daily basis, and they are doing very well. We also have young people who are also in gardening who use the space, who wanted to change the mentality of people that even the smaller space that you are having, you can start your garden. I think there's a saying that I always like that you always want to have farms, but you don't even know how to plant. So he started from the backyard and she's doing very, very, very well. I think the list is very endless. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're speaking with Matabelo Modau. I am the business development officer for the Center of Entrepreneurship, Goldfield Stevet College. I have called you here for one thing and one thing only, just to come and profile your businesses. I'm going to ask you guys to be yourselves. Do not panic. Uh, talk about your businesses. Market your businesses to the outside world. Um, my name is Cecilia Lepanakisi Menz. Um, I come from the company called Lepanakisi Craft. I'm Dino Halala, originally from Lesotho, but now I reside here in Belgium, Rich Park. And Dino is the founder of Kesut Supply. <laughs> my name is Tibato Etus Melifi. I'm based in Zawako, in the Free State. I'm coming from a company named Matthew Smith of Construction. Oh, my name is Nell Mohasho. I'm from Melody, Virginia. I'm doing art, paintings and drawings. I specialize in the construction. Okay, my name is Lagos Benge. I'm from Mekutano in Odinos Race. I'm a founder of a company called Lagos B. My name is Hoto Malwe from Country IPC. We are a security company specializing in asset tracking and asset recovery. My name is Lesiko Hongwe and I'm from Tabon Berko. The name of my business is I Speak Global Consultant and we do business evaluations and we also do management accounts. My name is Ketum Tobi and I come from a company called TaylorMade Trading and Projects. I'm um, in the mining sector. My name is Pierre Lomotis. Uh, Tomoa is a company that do graphic design, signage, video, and photograph. The brand Lepanaki started back in 2016, around September. Um, so what happened was that three months before September, I used to drink alcohol a lot. So every time when I come back from the bar, the clubs and so on, I always come back with like two or three bottles on my pocket. So this one Monday, um, I was at work. So I only had like two, two jobs to finish and the last one, the deadline was on the next day, which was Tuesday. So I finished all of them. I have a diploma in jewelry design and manufacturing. So I have like six months, six years experience also. I started by creating projects for learners at school, doing drawings for them. I also 
created projects for teachers and their assignments as well. Lawazi Lee started in 2017. When we started, it was just an accessories and we will upcycle material. Um, and then we make, we upcycle materials such as your rubber tubes, we, and then we make earrings from them and other accessories. And we, we also upcycle AMA materials cut off that we had to collect from AMA seamstresses around so that we can, actually it's an environmental safe, but not business, like we actually help the, with the environment so that we don't have to ban things since the climate has, has, has caused a whole lot of problems. And couches that remind me of young guillotines. This is hot. So uh, we started in 2016 with uh, fundamental research. Uh, this is basically where we identify the problem. Uh, after uh, fundamental research, we moved on to applied research, understanding how to monetize the solution. So. After that, we submitted our business uh, solution to different uh, competitions. The first one being a Free State Design Challenge, uh, we won first place. The business was registered in 2015, and uh, but it started to work on 2017, so we took a two-year gap because now initially we had to do a lot of research in terms of what we want, in terms of the vision and stuff. But that's how we had to define our value proposition to say that um, the business must do really business evaluations, uh, research, management accounts, and also the tax. Can you tell me how you've developed since you started your business up until this point? How has your business developed? Uh, back then it was not easy. I was working in Pretoria. So I was trying on Facebook and my WhatsApp to market my stuff. But then uh, the challenge was most of my clients or my customers were here in Malcolm. And I was working in Pretoria, so they have to wait sometimes because like you can't pay for um, a 50 rand something and then pay a 100 rand Korea or 150 or for just you see so they have to wait for me to come back visit a lot, lot, lot of lot of information they gave me a lot of project classes you know because I didn't have like a basic study of business yeah I'm only good in doing my stuff with my hands so I didn't have basic business studies and so on. So through CEDA, through CFE, I had to get classes whereby I can learn about business and some few basic things about business. And then, yeah. Wow, it, your tabalaza was an experience and it was a never ending though because I don't know how to pitch, I don't know how to, but it's easy and like your PowerPoints and everything, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? But when I got there, I represented, like, I did my thing and thanks to ECF, CFE and through Bocidas and the workshops that they normally, but they're very important, those workshops. People might undermine them, but they are very important and then they actually, so I was able to go and pitch in front of a panel of uh, a lot of people. First of all, it has developed, number one, my autonomy as an individual, as an entrepreneur. Number two, my business as well. Uh, what happened is uh, the enterprise development and entrepreneurial education has really deposited a lot in my business. Um, two, the synergies that we have built and the partnerships uh, that has to do with the incubators, uh, has created synergies that were very profitable for our business. Uh, number three, we managed to have a contract with the college, uh, which is doing fine right now. At the same time, um, we have a partnership with Molausi uh, Advisory Services, which is the auditors. Uh, in future, we we'll also want to do auditing as part of the uh, value proposition as well. So key partners were very really, uh, important in our business and it's key partners that we only got here in the incubation, none other else.
and what a you lot in terms of entrepreneurial education. It has really contributed a lot. Uh, but apart from that, I think pitching is quite a very important thing. Uh, it raises confidence into an entrepreneur. So what happens is uh, there was a course from UOFS uh, that we did uh, for a person who never went to an uh, academic institutions like your traditional UK, uh, UOFS, uh, you know, these big institutions. It was an honor for us to be involved in that course because um, it's, you know, it's an NQF aligned and you know, accredited course. So it really boasted our confidence as entrepreneurs going forward. And you know, more than that, it also, you know, the journey going forward, the Standard Bank um, incubation managed to take us from here. Um, that's why I did the eight months um, incubation for technology in Rose Bank. So if it wasn't for the resources that we have here, I would be able, number one, to have printing, internet, which is very expensive. So if it wasn't for resources and key resources that we get here, I wouldn't be where I am because those things are very uh, expensive when you are starting as a startup, as an entrepreneur. Now the centre has assisted us in terms of um, uh, partnerships, sourcing funding and educational um, uh, training too. The incubation and the people over the CFC, CFE in J, they actually, they'll build you, even when you think, ah, what am I going to do, la? There's internet, you can use it. There's offices that they can use. There's people that, if you don't understand something outside, or if you was going out, just come through to the center and booze. There's information that is basically it's needed, that is not out there, because not everybody can tell you as an easy Others, they keep to themselves. But if you come here, you get all of that. Just have the right questions to ask regarding whatever you want to do. Would I discriminate whether you are an art person, you or home to some and get office, or just come through to the CFC. So it works for everybody, for every business, for each and every entrepreneur. So yeah, thank you, CFC. CFE. <laughs> <laughs> It's not just the juice, man. I'm Francis Mashangu, uh, the principal and the director of uh, Goldfields Tibet College. Uh, my role at the college, I'm, I'm managing uh, the college as a whole, which is composed of four delivery sites. And the first site, which is uh, situated in town, Welcome Town, it's a Welcome Campus. There are quite a number of programs, but most of the programs are, are business studies uh, programs. So we are offering NAKET, which is normally known as uh, Report one and one programs from N4 to N6, which leads to a diploma. And then from there, we've got we are running an NCV programs, which is National Certification Vocational, which we are offering also quite a number of programs from level two to level four. And then the second site, delivery site, is based at Tabo, which is Tosa campus. We are offering engineering studies. We are offering engineering report 191 from N1 up to N6 and then we're offering also NCV program which is from level 2 to level 3 and then also we have introduced a new program which is a sort of an a bridging course PLP course is for year for, for, for one year it's for those students who don't meet the uh, requirements to enroll for level 2 NCV so those students, they, they do their bridging course. And then from there, we've got a satellite, which is an extension of Dosa campus, 
which is based at Milloding Camp, uh, Virginia, Milloding Campus. We are offering uh, engineering report 191, with level from N1 up to N3. So we are offering mechanical engineering and we are also offering uh, electrical engineering at Milloding Campus. And then from there we've got a site in the industrial area within the, the, the welcome town. So we, we are offering skills programs by skills programs or occupational programs we are offering mainly the short programs um, CETA uh, uh, accredited programs and then we've got also we are offering learnerships uh, at different levels we are also uh, offering apprenticeship so the center is it's, it's, it's also being accredited to run a quantum quite a number of programs and at the moment, we are preparing the site to be accredited as the 4IR center. So this is what is happening at the moment in terms of program delivery at Golf Festival College. We have uh, launched the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship at uh, Dosa Campus. Why Tosa campus? Because we were looking at it's nearer to, to, to the community of, 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 of Tabo, where we've got small business uh, based, uh, people. So we are assisting to make sure that people they can be able to start their own businesses and we give them support in terms of drafting their business plans, in terms of managing their finances, in terms of uh, making sure that the business are well run and they are taken care of. So at the moment, uh, the, 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 let me say that the, the, the center was launched by, by the Minister of Small Business and Development in 2017. So what is happening at the moment, we are, we are, we are offering quite a number of uh, programs to our small business uh, uh, people. So we have graduated in 2018, 16 companies and then this year we are looking at graduating 25 companies and then at the beginning we, we, we had a quite a number of, of, of other structures in place to assist which which moving towards the business sector but uh, we, we've got uh, currently in our incubation for small business we've got 42 companies so I can proudly say that uh, since 2017 up to 2020, we have, we have trained about 140 companies uh, for, for, for the field to the district. Yeah, this is Kim P. Archer, the only Archer that makes sense in Africa. So Lao Kazi and I um, are actually um, entrepreneurs that are part of CNP's incubation um, program and we had the opportunity of going to Durban to network and to rub shoulders with other entrepreneurs and for myself personally, that experience helped me to grow. And um, how was how that for you? Yeah, you know, maybe you know, I had fun. I enjoyed being there. Uba, I'm, I'm an artist that I'm not doing the same thing as I do, but we still see our upside game all of them. But different, different designs, different artworks. Yeah, so it was really awesome and eye opening because we cool it a lot and finding which there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there, especially our youth, that have these awesome, awesome ideas. So it was and they're very passionate about the two areas of us as I just How you doing? Hi Hello. guys. Uh, we are at ICC mm -hmm. uh, Durban EDHE Le Rota 2019. Yes. Uh, we are showcasing our entrepreneurial skills.
if you can all recall, we, we, we come from a difficult period now after the COVID, and it has been difficult, especially for businesses. And COVID has not only affected businesses, but it has affected everybody else, you understand? Be it all government departments, private sector, and yourselves included. In the COVID time, uh, by the time COVID-19 uh, was starting, um, most of the entrepreneurs started to experience some psychological disposition. And it's one thing that we as entrepreneurs, we never really uh, get our mind into. What I mean is, it was very detrimental because it was a time in which you could never do profit. Uh, every industry was closed and it led to us being depressed. I'm not sure if I'm talking to somebody. At the moment, we, we are offering them support. Uh, 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 which is a shared uh, service in terms of making them know we, 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 we allow them to use the, the center internet, they use the computers, and also we use the, 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 the printers because it's very difficult at the moment to get, uh, uh, in terms of social distancing. But we need to make sure that we can be able to assist them to have their meetings, to be able to submit their proposals. So we give them the, 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 the equipment and support from, from the college. On the other side of vegetables, Hayang affect our needs because in the Lina we able to be long run nebareka the vegetables how we look at our COVID, but our poultry farming in affect the because the lekka time is a quality business. Well, for me it was good, I don't want to lie. Um, COVID put my company on the map. Um, 2020 was my highest crossing year, yes, in the last four years. Um, with the fact that I'm in the mining industry, um, the mine was very badly hit because of COVID. So um, obviously they had to upgrade facilities to be able to manage the pandemic. That is where companies like my own were called in to come and do those refurbishments, those um, those upgrades, so like I said, pocket was very good for me. The highlight of my business career has definitely been discovering this baby right here and what it can do and the power that it has and how I can use that to change my life. It's a paradigm shift. We try to move them to the technology side so that at least they can try to do everything in a technology aligned position or aligned position. The first one being a first aid design challenge, uh, we won first place. We, we submitted our solution to a sales innovation challenge and we won, I think it's 1.2 million. You know the saying, the sky is the limit. It's not. Um, this year alone, I've broken all goals that I've set for myself. And every day, whenever it's tough, you know, I look from where I come and where I'm going. And I can always motivate myself and be like, "Can't we get up today?" You know. I was able to go and pitch in front of a, a panel of uh, a lot of people. So, and I sold my product, and I got second place, two hundred and fifty thousand rands, and I bought my machinery. Yes. <laughs> I love my machines. I love it, and I actually have something very interesting for young girls um, from teenagers 16 up until the age of 21. We, we basically take you in, we go and we clean up beaches, and we see what we can do from the waste from the beaches. So, if you want to find out more about that, you can just follow our handles and we can uh, tell you how you can be a part of that program. So, if there are any companies out there as well who would like to support our initiative of um, supporting having young girls part of that program and us also actually also cleaning up the environment, can you please also hit us up because we would also appreciate the support whichever way, whether it's financially, through donations, or whatever you may be able to donate so that that may be possible. We would really, really appreciate that. Durban was, Durban was a really, really awesome weekend. We really have. CFE to thank for that, for making that possible. It opened our eyes and our evidence to what's possible out there. And we also really
in and that recycling is really really big so if you're looking at going into any opportunities right now i mean it always has been but now it's actually becoming even more and more yeah because now i've got a touch it's more about recycling like you see kids are in big luggage because they come up with new ideas and actually it's at the point of view if you do have an idea or you think of something you don't even have to have an existing company Jerry just you know just come through with it thank you very much for listening and we're looking forward to your replies your response your comments and your likes yeah and a whole lot of hearts <laughs> so my name is Nijun Mukasibe uh, from Enumi Visuals and I am Lapazi Pele from Lapazi P Accessories and Clothing Designs. And we had such a great time with you guys and it was really an exciting week and good luck to every single entrepreneur out there, never ever give up. And we hope you're inspired by um, our video and good luck and all the best to everybody who was watching this. Mwah! <laughs> <laughs> we love you all. High five. <laughs> yeah, all the way. I also want to blow kisses and give high fives to the team at Goldfield TVET College. That was a fantastic presentation on what they're doing with entrepreneurship on their campus. And it's really fantastic to see so much buy-in, so much interest, and so much support for the studentpreneurs there. Up next, we have a contribution from Walter Susulu University, and they'll be sharing with us their experience with student entrepreneurship on their campus. My name is Rob Midgley and I'm the Vice-Chancellor of Walter Sisulu University. WSU, as it's known, is situated in the Eastern Cape Province, in more or less the most remote areas of the province. We've got four campuses, 30,000 students, and we are firmly located in the area from which our students come. We have a vision for 2030 which is that we would like to make a difference to our society. We see ourselves as a gateway institution where our students can come through our programs and they can then become globally competitive and, as I said, make an impact to the society and the area in which they live. Now, that vision is also located in the fact that we now live in a 4IR society. And that means that to make an impact, we have to have the skills that a 4IR situation requires, which is that we need to, to be agile, we need to be flexible, and we need to also to be innovative in the way in which we operate and the way in which our students will operate. Because it's only through those that they, those skills, that they will be able to make a difference. But there's also another aspect about the 4IR society that we need to be cognizant of. And that is that of the jobs that we see today, most of them did not exist 10 years ago. And of the jobs that we see today, most of them will not exist by the year 2030. And that means that whatever you are learning right now, you have to also concentrate on the skills. You have to have the ability to be able to do something different because the job that you are trained for might not be in existence in 10 years' time. And that means that you must never have just a, an approach where other people will do things for you. You also have to have an approach where you can make your own waves, where you can surf your own waves, where you can create an opportunity for yourself that did not exist elsewhere. And for me, entrepreneurship is an important skill that we need to have. But we tend to associate entrepreneurship with people who have got business skills. And we look at the 
uh, students doing a BCom or a BAC or something like that and say they are going to be the entrepreneurs in society. That's a big mistake. The entrepreneur, everybody is an entrepreneur or a potential entrepreneur. Every person is doing a degree in order to create a living for him or herself and also to make a difference in other people's lives. And so therefore, every discipline that you have, every program that you undertake is an opportunity to provide yourself with skills that will give you a competitive advantage over others. And so therefore, the fact that you are a scientist may make you a better entrepreneur because you've got skills that other people do not have. The fact that you are a doctor or a, or a lawyer may also give you that competitive advantage. So what we need to do is do not only think about the certificate and the courses that you are uh, doing. Think also about how what you are doing will provide you the skills to make a difference to other people's lives. And I want to come back to this making a difference to other people's lives. We also tend to think that entrepreneurship is just about making money. I disagree. I think that we tend to forget that there's also a concept such as social entrepreneurship. We, as I said right at the beginning at WSU, we want to make a difference to our society. And so therefore, there must also be entrepreneurship, innovative ways of making a difference and seeking social justice for people. And so therefore, the way in which I do my work has to be entrepreneurially so that I can be innovative and transformative in what I'm doing. And so therefore I ask everybody to please be creative in what you are doing. Think about how you can use your skills to make a difference. Now at WSU, people tend not to know that we have got graduates all over South Africa in top positions in the business world, making a difference and actually uh, succeeding in the commercial sphere. Why do they do that? It is because when they were here, they did not only get the educational skills, they also had those other skills that they got. They became streetwise. And somebody at WSU, when you come through the system, has that ability, because of where you come from, it made you think that I need to do things differently. And so we're very proud of the fact that we've got top class business people we call graduates, we've got top class lawyers that we call graduates. And so therefore, they also make a difference to where we are right now. And so, I'll come back to one last theme. Whether you're a lawyer, or whether you're an artist, or whether you are a doctor, or somebody who is busy uh, practicing medical prosthetics, each one of you is a potential entrepreneur. And each one of you can use your skills, not only to make a financial difference to yourself, but also to make a social difference to the people there. So I ask you, true to the values of Utata Walter Sisulu, let us not forget that there's a reason for us to be here, that we need to make a difference. And as he said, the battle will never have been won if Issues like poverty, unemployment, and all these social justice issues are but a distant memory. Our challenge is to use our entrepreneurial skills in a way that will benefit everybody financially and socially. Please be entrepreneurs. Don't wait for others to make a difference in your lives. Make a difference yourself. And I ask you, take that seriously. Thank you. Thank you. When we speak about innovation, especially uh, with the university context, uh, first we have to know that it's not everything related to innovation that can be revealed all at once. Some ideas are still within the proof of concept stage, and so perhaps I should just speak about those that are very close to commercialization uh, at WSU because those are already in the public domain and we can talk about them a lot more. Uh, we, we're making a lot of um, strides as Walter Sisulu University in supporting the innovation activities of our researchers. 
and some of these have in a way generated some attention nationally already. It's important to talk about innovation in this way because it is a complex terrain. I mean, it is one thing to do research, it's another thing to publish, but it is another thing to take the product of research to that other level, which is let there be something that actually changes something in society. It is complex because universities typically do not have resources to set up companies every time there is this kind of activity coming out of the product of research. And so once you have an invention, you're almost moving to a different terrain. And in many ways, universities are not very familiar with that terrain because you're going to be talking about industry. You're going to be talking about patents. You're going to be saying, so, uh, so what are the competing products out there? And those are areas that we believe, yeah, we can assist our researchers um, with kind of with support, but we also need investors from out there to come and come come to the party because there is only so much a university can do. We have to constantly pursue the route of doing the science, but once we have a product that has come out of that science, we really need other people to come in and put in resources so that our researchers can also see, if you like, reap the fruit of their labor. That's all I would like to say about uh, innovation, at, um, especially innovation that is nearing the point of commercialization. Commercialization is a very complex terrain and we haven't mastered all of it. We haven't got the resources to take our researchers around that particular bend. But it is a very exciting area to be in, to be able to say that we're no longer doing science just to explain a phenomenon. We're no longer doing science just to describe or explore a phenomenon. Researchers are now into actually fixing a problem, moving from science, from problem posing to actually solution finding. And that is what we are really investing our resources in. The university does have a directorate for research and innovation, and that, that directorate really goes all out in terms of looking for partners, seeking funding, developing the, the policy environment that will make our researchers to not only do research, but also to enjoy doing research, and not only doing research that leads only to publication, but research that actually can move and shift the frontiers of problem solving, because our society needs real products, real ideas that can fix existing problems. And the examples that I've just given you, the medical um, um, prosthetics program that has produced these two inventions, and the herbal teas that will be helping to solve some health problems, this is the way we want to go. And this is the way we want to really invest our resources. And we need a lot of support in this area. And by the way, I should also say that the two students I spoke about who were involved in the medical um, inventions of 2019, they have now set up a company of their own. And this is important. They have moved from just being um, student or postgraduate researchers or final year researchers into young entrepreneurs that want to take their ideas to the next level. You never know. Out of this simple innovation, we could be having the next Elon Musk. We could be having the next Bill Gates. That is where we want to go. And we are particularly focusing on literally every discipline to ensure that we no longer think science in the traditional way. In the 21st century, we want to think about solution finding. We need to find the solutions that will indeed, in a way, deal with the challenges that we face as a society. Thank you. I am Mfumi Omisobushi Tati. I'm a student at WSU and I'm an elected participant. I am here to represent Ignectus, all four campuses. What is an Ectus? That's the question that we get all the time. An Ectus is a community of students, academics 
and business leaders that are committed to using the power of entrepreneurial action to transform life and shape a better, more sustainable world. Inactus Walter Susulu comprises of four campuses, namely Mtata, Ibiga, BCC, and Queenstown. We currently have three projects, which are Project Greenfield, No Waste, and Green Room. Project Greenfield is an agricultural-based program that promotes organic farming. Project Greenfield aims at equipping businesses, the agricultural businesses in and around our community. To be, it was established by an Ictus student and in all respective campuses and this will be done by providing organic compost, seedling and a mini greenhouse with grow beds to improve the yielding for rural farming. The second project is Project Green You. Green You is a project that has been created with the intention to, of developing businesses that are youth-owned. The purpose of Green You is to equip youth in our communities with the necessary skills that they need to expand their existing businesses, the business ideas, so that they may turn it into solving the social ill that is existing in our respective communities. No Waste is a project that we are still currently working on. It's on research phase. It's a project that aims at minimizing the waste that enters the ocean as well as the rivers. As an Exus Walter Susulu, we have achieved the following. We have participated in a national competition and we have earned a crystal trophy. And we took second place also in 2019 in a triple bottom line sustainability project. In 2020, we got a Unilever grant for, for project, which was a 12,000 rand voucher. We participated in a virtual national competition, which also we earned a crystal trophy. And we also got a trophy for the most collaborative team award. So what's in it for us as students? We are recognized as the cut above the rest. We network with different students, businesses, business leaders across the globe. The best, we get bursaries, internships, and job opportunities, connecting with like-minded people, students from across, the, from across all disciplines. We get recognition and leadership development. My name is Sandy Swam Kolozeli. I am a 26-year-old female entrepreneur based in the Bakolo City Metropolitan Municipality area. I am an alumni uh, of WSU, which is Walter Susulu University. I studied both my undergrad and postgrad at Walter Susulu University in Public Relations Management, then also did my training at WSU, so my grassroots are with Walter Susulu University. I am at the driver's seat of a PR and marketing agency that well maintains an international footprint. We've hosted Forbes International Business Coach in the city and in other different cities in South Africa. And together with an interior design company where we do full scoped interior design projects and also manufacture furniture from scratch. On a day to day, I wake up and have to actually deal with you know different brands, clients. So we do above and beyond uh, PR and marketing for the PR and marketing agency, where we actually you know develop brands from start, um, going through to you know the general growth of the brand. We've worked with closely with the municipality um, and other SMEs that are on the ground as well. And then for the interior design business, um, it has been light business for me because there isn't so much competition on the ground. In as much as we had the pandemic as well recently, well, we're not completely out of the pandemic um, era, but you know the PR and marketing business was slightly affected by the pandemic um, because brands needed to prioritize you know, their growth and their employees as well so that they cannot close down and PR and marketing had to be cut out of budget. So it was a punch for us, but we literally shifted from that industry then back into the interior design business and it was doing quite well in terms of couch manufacturing because people were buying furniture left, right and center as they are sitting at their homes and it was a more contactless um, type of a business. So that's me in a nutshell. We have you know, won South African Heroes Awards Business Empowerment Category 2019 
and I am the currently reigning 2019-2020 BCMM Female Entrepreneur of the Year. We've also been nominated by Standard Bank for Young Achievers Award um, and also recently by Fair Lady and Santam uh, for the Young Achievers Award. So that is me in a nutshell. My name is Amanda Ndizana. I am a student at the Walter Sisulu University Butterworth branch, Evika, also known as. I am a studentpreneur. It's a new word. <laughs> I think they're planning on adding it to the vocabulary, which is a full-time student also running a business, which is an entrepreneur. If I may define to you what an entrepreneur is, an entrepreneur is someone who actually goes into business or businesses actually with the fin risking financially in order hoping for a profit. So that's what people like me, like myself, do. So I am, okay guys, I'm a carpenter, cabinet maker slash wood machinist. So to sound it, round it off, I'm a carpenter. I deal with furniture making, your kitchens, your wardrobes, your, your, your headboards in your rooms. I do that. I also design them. So the funny thing is that what I'm studying, I'm studying building, which is uh, credit surveying and contraction management. The road towards becoming an entrepreneur, it's something that you discover. And once you discover it, you should not give up on it and you should carry on going towards it. For example, I started uh, selling chips, uh, sandwiches, office to office at a very, very young age. I used to sell shirts, uh, work ties to workplaces. And that thing actually allows you to build your confidence and you become bold and you learn a lot about yourself and especially about your clients, which is people in general and how to respond to them, whether they're nice to you or not. So basically entrepreneurship on its own, it actually builds you up as a person, how to treat people in terms of being humble and remember that as much as you can be able to have money or capital to start a business, what is key is attitude and how your behavior pattern is. If you have a good attitude, you are really bound to become a good entrepreneur. So for me, I carry my tape measure everywhere. As I told you, I'm a carpenter. Whether I go out with my friends, I always carry this in my bag, just in case a client might call me to come and fix a door or to fix anything or to go and measure. They want a nice um, sliding wardrobe with the mirror. So that's what I do. So basically, the truth is that the journey towards entrepreneurship is not easy. It's not really meant to be easy because sometimes you lose and sometimes you win. So once you lose, you should actually learn from those mistakes that you've learned. For me, I learned a lot about myself. I used to be very stubborn and um, never used to say sorry, even if I'm wrong. So currently, because of I've learned how to deal with people, you do an introspection. Now I found myself that I actually have sponsors. Currently, uh, they'll be sponsoring me with regards to your workshop where I can be able to do um, fully fledged um, manufacturing company in terms of your wardrobes at home in terms of headboards because I'm specializing in joinery now I'm specializing with that so guys all I'm saying is that it's not easy because I am a full-time student and I have to balance the career at the same time so for example there's this lady called Mary Kenna it's a black American female she's actually the inventor of the toilet um, paper holder she's the, she's the one who invented it and she was a female and she was a florist. Her career was being a florist. However, she had so many innovative things that she developed. And to date, we recognize her as an inventor, of which that's where I am personally going to because I'm an innovator. I'm an innovative thinker. So guys, it's not easy. So you have to be able to balance this special time management. You have to be able to study because you have to get good grades. At the same time, you have to push your business towards what you want it to become. It's not easy, but it's very possible. And look at me where I am on my second year. I passed my first year running another site with uh, carpenters and also myself going there. So anything is possible. So you just have to carry on. And my mom always asks me what keeps me going. My answer is I have no other option but to succeed. My name is Tobekani Lose. I'm the center director for Center for Entrepreneurship Repeat Incubator at Walter Sassoon University. We call it CFE. This program is not limited only to students or to specific sectors. It's, it's too broad. All students who have um, the ability, who have ideas to start businesses, are welcome to our Center for Entrepreneurship. 
So CFER CFER follows a model which is general systems theory, which is has it has input whereby we will, we will come to our program and for the first six months we will train you, we'll assess your business, we'll uh, diagnose you, uh, we'll also see what skills or necessary equipment you need for your business. From the first six months you move to the 24 months period which is it's where we call it processes whereby we do business analysis, we do training, we do boot camping, we hire service providers that will assess your business um, objectives or what you want to do within the area that you want. From after 24 months we're going to move to six months which is we call it the post incubation period whereby we have to now to link you up with the market, we train your product, we, we try to link your, yourselves with our TTO office in terms of transfer of skills, in terms of business development, in terms of the go-to market strategies. So this all business incubation is the new phenomenon in South Africa because it's recently new. In other countries, it's been there, it's been proven, it's been working. So CEDA, um, with the support from the specialists within the industry and also the universities, we urge all students to come to our program. Even if you are at home, you are unemployed, this is what we do. This is what we train and develop entrepreneurs within Mutata. And also after we have launched the center, it's still in the establishment phase now. After we're done, we're also going to move to other campuses. We're trying to always create an environment and also trying to change the student mindset of job seekers into job creators. So within doing so, it is very important that entrepreneurship is very important with the economic development and also try to uplift the environment and the communities, particularly in rural areas. Entrepreneurship is very important. And also we shouldn't shy away from the fact that we, we try to make to help students to make money from that money they should give back to the community. So that's where the Center for Entrepreneurship Rapid Incubator is doing. And our vision and mission is simple. It's also to be a leading CFERI within South African CFEs. To do that, we have to try to minimize the risk for entrepreneurs to fail. As we all know that small business fail within their first three years. So the, the vehicle, which is Center for Entrepreneurship Incubator, is there to try to minimize the failure rate for students, the entrepreneurs, the alumni. So creating that culture for entrepreneurship in South Africa or entrepreneurial university, it's very, very new. So we're trying to change the mindset. During our time, we didn't have such opportunities, but now the government and the university is doing such vehicle to help students that are at home, that they can have um, a strategy to make a living. So entrepreneurship, as we know that, you don't have to have a degree to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to go to school. If you're at home, you have an idea, uh, you want to commercialize it, you're trying to take it to the market, we urge all students to come to our center. We'll try to assist them. And I, I must say this, uh, the center doesn't make you an entrepreneur, but it gives you the opportunity, it gives you the necessary skills, it gives you the conducive environment, so that you can try and although you need, still need more effort to do it because it's your business we don't know it but we just assist you we're not going to do business for you we're not going to create business for you but we're going to work with you on the journey because we know that it can be a lonely journey so the entrepreneurs that are there student entrepreneurs at WUSU CFERI we've done a number of activities we've been involved with Indaba 2020 we are involved in the HOTLA we also do awareness within the campus and the surrounding areas so that entrepreneurs can come and join our program. So we urge you at home, we urge you at the university, we urge you to your comments. If you have nothing to do, to come to our CFERI, to try and talk to me, talk to us about what we do. Come and listen to our program and training that we do at WOSU. So to us, we say to you, entrepreneurship is, should be a career of choice. And we try to promote academic entrepreneurs, student entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurial universities in South Africa because other countries have done it. So that's why we exist within the Student Entrepreneurship Week. We try to urge and promote, as you see, have seen that the VC has urged the student and the management are also on board to try and help you guys 
in terms of SME development, in terms of creating your businesses. And you can start, the tips is simple. Start with what you like, start with what you have passion for, start what interests you. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be whatever you can do with your hands. It can be digital, especially now during COVID. It is very important that we use our skills. You can go to YouTube, you can find mentors uh, that have done it or mentors that you look up to. And then that's why we're trying to spark you so that you can be an entrepreneur, you can be the next Steve job, you can be the next Mark Zalombian. So we urge you guys that you come and participate to our programs that are trying to develop and train SME within South Africa. I hope I'm going to get a call from you and I say thank you. My name is Sigukele Gumbo and I'm the director of the NEMISA eSkills Collab based at Walter Sassoli University. NEMISA is reporting to the Department of Communications and our mandate is to do different digital skills programs around the country. In the Eastern Cape from Walter Sassoli University, we work with different communities uh, especially rural communities and townships in order to roll out ICT related programs. The good thing is that some of those programs are actually relevant to entrepreneurs. ICT has become a need in our world at this moment in time. Entrepreneurs need ICT in order to market their business. At this present point in time, we have programs such as basic mobile literacy, which is available to, ro to rural communities, students, underprivileged communities, and the like. This will assist you in making your business even better. At this present point in time, NEMISA is actually about to launch Coursera courses, free Coursera courses to, in South Africa. If you visit the NEMISA website, you will find a link where you can register and be able to do free online courses that will assist you in your business because your business nowadays uh, will need the enhancement of ICT to make things better for you. It then also reduces the need for you to move from say the Eastern Cape to Gauteng. You can actually market your business from wherever you are. It doesn't matter what rural community you are, you become visible to the world. Uh, at this present moment in time, I'm also pleased to say that uh, ICT will assist you greatly. It will assist you in means that uh, were not possible before. With the advent of 4IR, we're making it possible to uh, make things easier. Of course, there is the conception that say the 4IR will take away your jobs, but that's not the case. If you're an entrepreneur, why not ride on the wave of ICT to make things better for you rather than feel that you have to depend on a job in order to, for, to to enhance your life or for your life in your hood. So all in all that I'm saying, what I'm saying to you as students and as potential entrepreneurs is that there are ways in which to enhance your business using ICT and on platforms such as those provided via NEMISA itself or via the Walter Sisulu University can help you enhance your business. My name is uh, Mzoli Sipai. I'm the director responsible for community engagement and uh, international relations at WSU. Um, we've heard uh, from all the different presenters uh, here the various uh, programs that we have at WSU in support of entrepreneurship. The VC made clear that all the students at WSU, irrespective of the academic program they are enrolled in, they are potential entrepreneurs. We've also made a presentation on the numerous support structure and programs that we have in support of student entrepreneurship. We've had student entrepreneurs themselves uh, who have really shared with us some of the exciting initiatives that started here when they were still students. Uh, the appeal, especially to all the students, is that you can also do the same. You have the necessary support at the university. We are here to ensure that.
Thank you very much to Walter Sisulu University. We are now going to go straight now to Mpumalanga University. We have online Dr. Kanayo Okujuba ready with a presentation. Dr. Kanayo, over to you, my good Thank sister. you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Very well, so you can proceed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you this afternoon for this event. And uh, like I said earlier, I will be sharing for 10, 15 minutes a brief on where we are with the center at the University of Mpumalanga. As you are aware, this is still a new center. We're just starting to build up issues since January, before the lockdown. So I'll just give you a brief on where we are, where we are heading to and the potential opportunities, challenges, and projects that we hope to latch on to get these things accomplished. So quickly, I'm showing the structure of our center, the Center for Entrepreneurship Rapid Incubator, where we have an advisory board at the top level, and we have a management committee. And you can see from that diagram that the management committee and CEDA stay at the same level. Why is this so? It is important to clarify this that our center has been developed before we got the CEDA grant. Our vision for the center is at the end of the day, it's going to be the business unit. It's going to form the business school of the University of Mpumalanga. So it goes way beyond the CEDA funding. But for now, CEDA is the only agency supporting us while we're still looking for other funds. So you can see that our monthly and quarterly reports go to CEDA, also go to the management committee, and also goes to the advisory board, which have an overarching responsibility to make sure that the KPIs, the MOU, and all that we've agreed to achieve with CEDA is another. And you can see we have two key positions there, the center manager, which I'm occupying, and the business development manager, another colleague of ours, is occupying that. So it's still a small unit, but we've laid down a framework that will help us achieve our ambition as a university. So what is the vision of the university as it were? To be an African university leading in creating opportunities through sustainable development, through innovation. And our purpose is to provide the space and services for small and emerging businesses. So we're not just about small and emerging businesses. We are also interested in growing the UMP students and alumni to nurture and grow their ideas in the medium and the long term. So we have the primary mission of developing students with business ideas entrepreneurs with sustainable business ventures. In addition, we're also going to be looking at our surrounding community where we can pick up potential growth of SMEs and help them actualize their goals and values. So for us, the success of the center will be measured in how many business ideas were we able to generate? How many business startups did we encourage? What is the business growth like in the, in the province? So for the first three years, next three years, we are looking at a broad term uh, drive where we want to develop students into entrepreneurs with sustainable business ventures, where we want to capacitate new and emerging small businesses to survive and grow. We also want to provide time and space for them to share, evaluate, and commercialize new business ventures. We also want the center to be a hub for collaborative networking where entrepreneurs can have access to information and contact with strategic partners. And we want to facilitate corporate social investment, as well as being an enabler for transformation into large businesses. What are the key strategies that we're looking at? New enterprise development service strategy, entrepreneurship awareness and capacity building strategy. We're also looking at collaborative networking strategy, looking at doing extensive research and development service strategy, looking at corporate social investment and transformation strategy, looking at a collaborative networking strategy to see how that will help us push through the vision and the goal of the center. So in summary, our business plan will be what? We're gonna be using service office space at affordable rates with flexible lease periods for entrepreneurs, whether they're student entrepreneurs or they're SMEs in the province. We'll be doing referrals and access to industry experts. We'll be matching incubates in our program with local entrepreneurs in a mentoring program we will support groups to share their ideas, experiences, frustrations, and services. 
we are currently developing a toolkit, which includes templates, samples, and listed resources that will help up and upcoming entrepreneurs. We also plan to have bi-monthly debates starting from next month, where topics that combine technology and business innovation will be discussed. So if you look at our timeline, we wrote our proposal to see that in November 2019. In December 2019, we got the grant. In January 2020, we signed the agreement. We kicked off February 2020. Uh, we started doing reference, uh, terms of reference for the management committee and advisory board, prepared our business plan and implementation plan. And in March of this year, we started marketing, aggressive marketing and database before the lockdown. And we'll be following the due, co the due process protocols necessary within the lockdown. So between June and August, we've done uh, quite a number of issues. We've been having our management committees, doing pre incubation agreements with SMEs that we've selected. We've done a workshop on preparing a business plan. We met with people from the industry that have shown interest to partner with us. And we have selected clients into the incubation process already. We've done several workshops on that. We've attended CEDA webinars. And we have met with local industries that want to partner with those that are already incubated in our program. So what is our program about? Now we are dealing with pre-incubation. After pre-incubation, we'll go to the incubation proper. And for us, at this pre-incubation, it's going to last three to six months for the SMEs we've taken. What are we doing with them? We are doing a client and business profile. We are developing a development plan for them. We are sourcing resources and expertise for them. After the pre-incubation, they can now go to the incubation proper, which will last to two to three years. But if you look at the client journey, service continuum of CEDA. You see that pre-incubation is important and that's why we're taking it seriously. This is where ideas are sharpened. This is where business plans are developed. So for us, we are currently looking at assessment, looking at opportunities. How do we fit opportunities? How do we match it with the market to the people that we've put on our incubation program? As we are doing this, we're also helping them to design a business plan that they can market design a business model that they can ask for funding, design a strategy that they can ask for partnership from local industry. This is where we are. And for us, this idea and planning stage under the pre-incubation, it's important before we go to the incubation proper. Now, these are the diagrams of how we want our incubation uh, center to look like. Our building is still uh, being processed. We hope that by the end of this month, we'll be able to move into the designated building. So this is a kind of uh, workspace arrangement that is ongoing in our center. Now, what is the basic challenge establishment of the center? Because before, before the lockdown, we were about to kick off and the lockdown happened, which slowed down the renovation of the building. Funding is key again, because we do not want to hope to depend on CEDA alone. We want to move away from CEDA funding soon enough because CEDA funding is not sustainable. Communication with clear zero law has been a challenge. We all live in this country and know the challenge that has been to communicate with people. But thank God we are coming out of it. Now, what is the summary status of where we are, what we want to do, and where we want to take back the situation to? So we're looking at young entrepreneurs and startup businesses to start with the pre-incubation process, then enter the incubation process with the end product over the three years being a sustainable business. That is important for us. So those who take on now, for the pre-incubation, we hope that three years from now, it will be a sustainable venture. We just do not want to talk about numbers, how many we are taking on or how many we don't want to take on. We want to look at sustainability and effective uh, effect on the GDP of the province and the country generally. So we hope to achieve those things once the people we have on the incubation program passes through the pre-incubation and moves to the final stage of the incubation. So what are we planning? We are planning to procure computer and office for the center, office equipment for the center. We're trying to install marketing area for the products and services that we're gonna be selling. We're already writing some MOUs now with the industry partners that want to support us technically and financially. So we're expanding the database of our clients to make sure we get there. So for us, it's still in the early stages, but we can see light at the end of the tunnel. And for example, from the 18th of this month, we'll be partnering with CIDA in the province to do the first uh, mentoring and coaching program of SMEs that require mentoring and coaching in, in the Pumalanga province. We'll do a three-day boot camping. And after that, do one session monthly for the next 10 months for them. So these are some of the ideas that we're coming up with. And we're still open to other ideas from our student entrepreneurs and from SMEs in the province, how best we can help them. 
So this is in a summary is what we are doing, where we are and where we want to be. Thank you very much. And I'll be willing to take your questions and comments. Dr. Dr. Ganayo, this is an incredibly properly planned presentation. You are really the epitome of if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. This is a proper solid plan. But I, like, I would like to ask you, because I like how it's detailed, where you have the market research, where you have your challenges in place, because you are real with yourselves. And also where you speak about future plans and the, the heat that you guys had on COVID. Can you, because you spoke about one sponsor being CEDA. Um, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, 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 in terms of who have you spoken with in relation to the private sector? Because my understanding is this, with this entrepreneurship center, you're not only looking in one discipline, you're gonna have all disciplines. And, I, and I'm sure private sector represents all the disciplines in the Pumalanga University. So my question is, have you spoken to other private um, companies or the private sector to lobby them to fund your center? Thank you very much for that question, which is a good one. It is important for us to also note here, which I didn't mention earlier, two private sector organizations are part of our advisory board. It was done on purpose. They are part of the advisory board. So we have about three uh, entities supporting us from the private sector. One deals with agriculture, the other one deals with metals and manganese, and the other one is on the aviation. So we have private sector people working with us and they have representatives on the board as advisory board members so we are thinking about this in the long term like i mentioned earlier in the next five years or seven years we want the center to be a small unit of the business school of the university so for us our ambition and drive is bigger than where we are with cedar but we're looking at in the next seven years that this center that is of incubation will become a small unit in the business school so we have private sector people working with us and we are expanding the database and we are speaking to provincial governments and the federal government at the moment to see how we can partner with them. And also on part of our advisory board, we have international people being part of it. Some universities in the UK, Malaysia and Germany being part of the advisory board. And we hope to tap in technical resources and possibly financial resources from there to grow the center. Thank you. Good news, and I really like the, the composition of this network that is coming together to create this center. One of the things that you mentioned in your presentation was around um, a tool that you're creating to help capacitate entrepreneurs that will be part of this particular center. I'm interested to find out, you know, how will, will this be available to just the students that are coming into your hub, or is that something that you're looking to open up to um, other entrepreneurs in the area that might want support from the university? Sure, it's not going to be limited to our students. It's going to be opened up to everybody within the area that wants support. Like I mentioned, 18th to 28th of November, we'll be doing a boot camping for entrepreneurs in the province. The university is hosting it. Our center is hosting it on behalf of CEDA. And after that, every other month for the next nine months, we'll be doing a one day monthly session for entrepreneurs in the province. So it's going to be open to all. And when our toolkit is ready, it's something that we'll be willing to share with other centers across the country. It's not going to be limited to us because we want to share knowledge. We want to capacitate entrepreneurs wherever we can because this is key to the growth of the economy of this nation. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Kanayo. We, I'm really blown away by your enthusiasm, by your drive. Um, I'm, I'm actually interested in the team you're working with in terms of students. Are you able to inject this enthusiasm you have, the spirit that you have? Like, do you have people that are, because I feel like you would be someone that I would love to be mentored by, because you have a drive, you're so prepared, and I'm feeling like you're also a person that can execute the, the plans that you have in place. Do you have a team of students? Because I always believe that we must build future generations of leaders. We might have incredible leaders, but we must look into the future. Who are we going to leave this baby with? Because, uh, Dr. Kanai, let's be realistic, you're really brilliant. Maybe another university might give you a better post, but who are you going to leave this baby with? Do you have people that you're training, people you're working with, in terms of taking this to the future? Very good question. We Currently, we have students who are very keen, some set of students who are willing and desirous to take this to the next level. But the COVID slowed us down.
to show them how they can be entrepreneurs in the long run. So it's part of our program to do a university-wide campaign and drive to educate people, to show people the potential of logging into the entrepreneurship dream. So we have students who are interested, who are pushing us, but we also have a plan to make sure that when students are admitted into the university, whether at the diploma level, whether at the undergraduate level or postgraduate level, they have a week or two where we interact with them on the benefits and potential of entrenching and embedding entrepreneurship in whatever we do. So we're looking to becoming an entrepreneurship university. So we want entrepreneurship to go through all our programs at the Faculty of Social Sciences, Economics, at the Faculty of Agriculture, at the School of Hospitality and Tourism. So we are doing all we can to make people get interested in this. Apart from the few students that are showing energy, that are showing interest, we also have a marketing plan to make sure that students of UMP are interested in entrepreneurship and see it as the only way out. That way, we're going to have a cohort of people who will drive this to the next angle. That's absolutely fantastic to hear, and it speaks to a lot of what we've heard this week at a number of different universities um, where we are looking at expanding entrepreneurship to other disciplines as well. You know, so it's not just the commerce students who will then go into entrepreneurship, but students who've studied other disciplines as well. And that, for me, is a really great start. I'm curious about the students who are joining us virtually today and who are within the Bumalanga area and they are thinking this definitely speaks to me and they want to be ready for when you launch. What is the process to apply and is there specific criteria that they need to meet? Well, there, there are, yes, we have some criteria set, but we are not rigid on them. Uh, we will send out information using the, the, the email address of the center to the students. So we have set of criteria we want them to meet, but we're not rigid on it because we know that this is up and coming. So we are flexible. Even if when they don't meet up to the criteria set up, we will still admit them into the process because we see this as a learning curve that is steep and they will come out because this is the first time we're having this. So we are open, yes, we set criteria. However, we are not dogma, dogmatic about those criteria. We still allow students with opportunity, with ideas, with the thinking, with a desire to be part of the process. I really respect that approach to have your doors open and to be available to all entrepreneurs, especially the students who are interested in being part of this, what sounds like is going to be a great project. I'm also interested to find out from you when we're looking at taking entrepreneurship across all the different um, faculties and disciplines, what has been the buy-in for um, the other faculties and you know, how have you gone about selling it to them, especially in spaces where people um, have a very traditional mindset about what should be done once you've completed a particular qualification and might not um, normally consider entrepreneurship as a viable option? Very good question. And another thing One strategy we adopted is to make sure that the management committee of the center have heads of schools of the different schools of the university as part of the management committee. So it's no, it's no longer news to them. They are part of what we are doing. They're desirous. And at the second stage, again, below the management committee, we've been engaging the program leaders of the different to see how their programs can be interwoven within the program of the, the Center for Entrepreneurship. So we have a great buy-in because from the one, we made it clear, this is not about the discipline that you are reading in the university. This is about after school, what next? It's about after graduating, what next? It's not about whether you read entrepreneurship or hospitality or economics or agriculture. You can be an entrepreneur in any discipline. So what we are doing is to show them the direction, the, the light, the potential and opportunity for you to be your own boss. We are trying to de-emphasize the pursuit of white collar jobs that you just want to work in a white, in a government setup, a private sector when you leave. You can be your own boss with a degree. So there's a great buy-in across all the schools. I've been speaking with the, the head of schools, I've been speaking with the program leaders, and the COVID slowed us down. Now we are back gradually. We will start intensively again our campaign across all the across all the schools, all the faculties, to make sure that students see the center as a place of opportunity. And another point I need to mention, the center, the building that I've been allocated to us, is not inside the university. It's our opposite to the university where it is so spacious, so big that you can also walk in on a Saturday, on a Sunday. You can walk in on any other day the school is not a session because we are going beyond what has been happening in the school. So the, the buy-in is tremendous. The support from the vice chancellor, from the members of the advisory board, from the members of the management committee, from colleagues across the faculties is tremendous. And students really have been showing interest what they can do, how they can be helped. 
And we've also put it out there to the student entrepreneurs on campus. Tell us what you think. Give us your own idea. How best can we help you? And they've been sending these things in and we've been converging them together, coming up with an appropriate documentation plan for the next three months. And by December ending, we'll be telling the school again and the student population and the university community where we are going from January 2021. So it's already there. So the buy-in is tremendous, it's increasing, and I think I'm happy to inform you that we are getting all the support we need from everybody on board and the university. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ogwijupa. You know what um, I think it blows me away is people who raise things from the dead. You know, like um, Dr. Um, Ogwijupa, you seem like one of the people that are pioneers, like Dr. Nora Clark, Karen Seyman, Kujo from UKZN. Um, I'm, I'm really mind blown by the fact that you are, you are pioneering this. I'm also thinking that there's already an existing database of students. Can you share maybe a success story from the existing database of student entrepreneurs? Like you just shared now, there are entrepreneurs that you are getting market research from. Like is there a success story of um, a student entrepreneur that is already in existence? Or like a, a, a student entrepreneur that just blows your mind away? Because I'm sure you have, yes, you have enthusiasm, you want to do this, but I'm sure there are students that inspire you to keep on keeping on every day. Yes, I might not have the data with me, but as you're aware, the, 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 does this competition of students get into about uh, entrepreneurship at the university level? UMP students emerged runners, runners up on the first position during the last event. So we have about four identified, I'm not looking at it right now, that are very, very uh, successful in what their projects look like, in what their thinking look like, that we are currently working on to harness. They are part of the incubators that we have, that we are working on developing their, 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 their business profile because we want to develop it in such a way that they can use it for further marketing, for further loan procurement from the bank or any other angel investor. So we have about four of them, but I'm not looking at documentation now to tell you specifically what it is. But one is in agriculture. One definitely is in agriculture where it looks like this is going to be a big bank and they are currently working with us in the incubation program to develop their profile further. So that CEDA have also promised to help. And they, they, our other partners in private sector have also promised to deploy technical and financial resources to help them stand. So we do have such, which is also pushing us further to help others to come to that level. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ogunjupa. Um, I'm so excited for you guys at the University of Mpumalanga. And I would like to wish you all the best in your future end of all. Um, Tiki, I feel like now there's going to be um, an exciting, exciting end to our SEW 2020. Um, I, I just want to talk to like to our student entrepreneurs. Guys, continue on social media. I, I, I feel like you should be excited in how we are about to close the show now because you are going to be mind blown. Tune in Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, share, like, love, because you are about to be blown away. Thank you so much, Sakumzi, and thank you so much to all of you at home who have been engaging and have joined us virtually. I know some of you have your exams, some of you are studying in between, but it's really wonderful to see all the engagement from you. And I want to say a big thank you to all the universities and TVET colleges who have come together to share their insights, to share examples of what's happening on their campuses and how they are supporting studentpreneurs. We're going to go into our final session um, and give you some reflections of this week. And before I let Sakumzi go so I can speak to Dr. Nora Clark. So Kumzi, I want to know from you, what is your reflection from this week? You know, what are your feels about, you know, what's been happening? Sure, that's not fair. <laughs> Anyways, because I cannot like pick, you know, I'm like a, a child now, like in a toy store or like in a candy store. Like I'm, I'm just incredibly blown away by how different universities are breeding like a, a generation of entrepreneurs that are just disrupting and are, are dreamers even within this, because you know what the Chinese say, they don't look at a problem or they see a challenge, they see a, an opportunity where can, they can create solutions. So what stood out for me um, in the whole week 
was the fact that there are young people or the universities and there are people out there that just look at problems and be like, haha, we can make money out yeah. of this, <laughs> we can bring solutions, we can help people, we can change the world. I think that's what stood out for me. Thank no, you too. Definitely. Um, and it is very true. The word for opportunity and challenge in the Asian language it is the exact same word. So it's nice that you say that. And just to reflect on the polls, we asked that same question to our students and we wanted to find out from you which day stood out to you the most and 50% of our audience said day two was the one day for them that they were like okay this is juicy this is where the meat is at and they really enjoyed it so thank you so much for responding to that and just looking at um, a couple of other responses that came through from our poll uh, we asked you guys if you are a student entrepreneur um, and about 80% of you joining us said yes you are um, a few of you said that you were researching about entrepreneurship and that's why you were attending the event some of you said you were currently working on your startup and you just wanted to see what else is out out there um, and some of you also said that you are in between so you're studying you're working you're trying to start a business um, you're doing the whole thing and that's really what entrepreneurs do most of the time now I'd imagine as a student entrepreneur there's a lot more to balance uh, we then also asked you to, to let us know what stage of business you're in and 80% of you indicated that you are currently in your early startup stage um, a few more said that you were at the stage of growth um, and about 3% of you said that you were fully running and ready to jump to the next level. So it was wonderful to have that feedback from you. Um, and then we, we did ask a little, you know, tongue in cheek question. Maybe we wanted to find out from you what you want to see from SEW in the future. Um, and later on, before we wrap up, I am going to be speaking to uh, Linda Jalto, who's going to highlight with us some things that are going to be coming through from the community of practice for studentpreneurs. But you guys said that you want to hear more about funders. You want to have a live and virtual event. And we're definitely working on that. As soon as COVID is over, I think our future events won't just be in one place. You know, you'll be in a particular venue, yes, but we'll also have a virtual aspect to that. Um, another, some other people then said that they wanted to have more student TV at colleges. And looking at today's program, I think that's definitely something that's going to come through a lot more. Um, and some of you said that you're also interested in exploring more opportunities for youth. And if you're interested in unpacking any of these topics further, please do go to our community engagement session. We are going to be wrapping up the event, but the conversation still continues. And I see there's a meet up here that's set up for 3.30, where people are going to be talking about what is social entrepreneurship. There's another one set up for 5.30, where people are going to be talking about uh, social entrepreneurs in Pretoria. There's another one happening at quarter past six this evening, and you guys in that session are going to be speaking about business planning. Um, and then at half past six, there's another one on from concept to practice to profits. And I really like wow. the sound of that particular session. So there's definitely so much more engagement happening on Hoover. So please do keep this alive. The physical event might end, but the virtual event continues to live on. Going into our final session now, I'd like to welcome virtually to our studio, Dr. Nora Clark, who is a director for entrepreneurship for entrepreneurship development and higher education at USAF. Good afternoon, Dr. Clark. Good afternoon, Tiki and uh, Sakumzi. Good to see you both there. And uh, it loved in, uh, this, uh, this program today. Wow, how fascinating. Wasn't it great? It absolutely was fantastic. Um, I, I must say that I put Sakumzi on the spot to ask him what his favorite was, but I can't pick between all three days. I think everything was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. I want to find out from you, you know, being the director of entrepreneurship, and we are now experiencing this event, but this event first happened in your mind. Uh, so I want to know from you, what is your reflection from SEW 2020? Ntsiki, I think we have started something in a new way that we need to continue. And I think the benefits of what universities and TVET colleges had brought to the program uh, these three days will be shown and will be visible much longer than the event itself. I think the fact that we now have content recorded and I know students are out there really uh, you know, biting the bullet for exams and uh, studying, finishing up, uh, some of them are finishing up with the, with the last work of the semester, others are already in exams. And I know students can't necessarily participate right now, but the good news is that the content will be available long after the event. And this is how we need to do things in future, just better and better every time though. We definitely do get better and better every time. It's the fourth year, if I'm not mistaken, of the Student Entrepreneurship Week. And I want to find out from you, since its inception, how has SEW grown? 
Well, it's, it has grown really in the beginning from just small pockets of, uh, uh, of programs and, and pro, you know, activities hosted at different universities across the country in the first year uh, with only a few students attending and, you know, marketing has always been kind of our, our big barrier because uh, you know, need to have a very clear marketing uh, strategy and we did not have that in the beginning and uh, this was more on an institutional level that things had then grown. The year, the second year, things were bigger and better, more universities participated. And by the third year, everyone was doing something. And that was very, very encouraging. Across these uh, three years, we've also seen TVED colleges here and there participate, and then somehow, um, you know, being occupied with other things again. And the big celebration that we have at this stage is to see uh, that despite the pandemic, 20 universities participated in uh, ACW 2020, along with four fantastic TVET colleges leading the pack. I mean, that was just uh, wonderful to see and such fascinating presentations and contributions as well. So uh, th th it's grown and uh, it has to grow much more because we know ultimately in Tsiki, SEW is there for, to raise awareness of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial activity among all students, regardless of the disciplines that they're studying in. No, that's true. And I must say, I did really enjoy the presentations that came through from the TVET colleges. So I look forward to seeing more of them um, joining Eddie and being part of the next SEW. And a big thing for me was just seeing how they've been able to take entrepreneurship straight into the community because of their proximity and their location. And that's an exciting um, prospect for me. Um, I also want to find out from you, you know, uh, SEW was birthed out of the Lokhotla um, as something to specifically focus on students. From your perspective, uh, where does SEW sit? and where do you see it going? Well, I'd like to actually just show you a, a few wonderful um, uh, uh, just ideas that we have for the future. And uh, I don't know whether this is the right time to now quickly take you through a, through a few slides to just show the students. Yes, please do share yeah. those slides with us um, and those exciting projects okay. as well. Okay, because there are some interesting things coming and we want to make sure that students have a way of participating in entrepreneurship focused activity in their institutions, but also nationally. And uh, we, we really want to make sure that every student is, is given the opportunity to uh, participate in uh, uh, entrepreneurship activities at their institutions. So I'm just quickly sharing something here with, that I brought along and uh, that I want to share with you. So uh, let's just go for that. Let's see, there we go. Right, so uh, just some, I know you, you, you guys see, see presentations all day long, every day. So I just wanted to just make it visible to you why we are doing this, why we are engaging with you uh, in the way that we're doing through SEW. And, uh, and I'm, th I'm thinking that uh, we want you to know that you have to be supported to become economically active. Whether you are going to be in employment or not, you need to know that as a student, you have options. And our work in EDHE or in EDI, as we call ourselves, is to make sure that, that you have considered the different options there are out there uh, in terms of participating in the economy. The first thing that is coming up that you need to just keep an eye out of, an eye open for and uh, be on the lookout for is uh, the finals, the national finals of the Entrepreneurship InterVarsity. Just three weeks from now, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be streamed live uh, again and uh, on Facebook so and on YouTube. So just be sure that you watch those things. Then there's something special that's happening for the first time at that event. And that is that the 28 finalists in the InterVarsity Going, are going to be meeting and greeting a select number of CEOs from businesses uh, across the country who will be just engaging with and networking with the 28 finalists. Now, that in itself is quite a prize for the finalists in the InterVarsity. 
And then, of course, when will the, in, the winners be announced is on the very next day at the Eddie Awards. That's like our really our gala event where we also celebrate other big achievers in the EDI space and in the entrepreneurship in university space. So what we would like you to do from now on, as you think about maybe engaging with us further or you know, becoming more active in positioning yourself for entrepreneurship, is you need to consider becoming an, a member of EDI. So if you look at the EDI website, www.edhe.co.za, you will see that there is a tab for, uh, by the name of membership. That is where you go and that is where you then sign up. You get to choose whatever you want to do, one thing in your institution that you as a member commit to doing to advance entrepreneurship in your university. You choose, no cost involved, that is your membership fee. And for that, you, in, you are becoming a VIP in, in the EDI community and you are getting access to a whole number of benefits that we will share with you. Secondly, we would like you to find your allies. You're in the university and you're like, who else is even involved? What's this EDI? What's this EDHE? Who's involved there? Um, who, who do I even talk to? So it's very simple. EDI has a number of communities of practice and they consist of people across the, uni the, the country, at the universities and some of the TVET colleges and they are the people who are really championing entrepreneurship development. They, they just drive the change. And you will see there in the uh, top line, in the top row there, you will see the three goals of Eddie in red. But below that, you will see six blocks that represent the communities of practice. And the ones in yellow are the ones that are there to look after the interests of students on the one hand, and of alumni, graduates, on the other hand. So look at those two yellow blocks. The second one, as you see there, is a new community of practice that is going to be established. Because we know people graduate and don't necessarily have a job straight away, but what do they then do? So we are establishing EDI community of practice for alumni next year. So keep uh, your eyes open on social media, we want to include all the entrepreneurs who are out there and who are graduates of universities and TVET colleges. We want you to come and join forces in this alumni community of practice. And then of course, the studentpreneurs community of practice that you see there is the other one. Now the studentpreneurs community of practice is a national forum consisting of 26 studentpreneurs maximum. It's just like a closed, very select few people. They are nominated by the institutions to represent the institution as a student and an entrepreneur. And we listen to them, we work with them, they advise us, but they also decide what are the priorities that they want to drive and look at nationally. So they play a really important role. And Linda is going to tell you who the people in your institution are that you need to align with the person in your institution who is the representative of your institution. Then there's also the community of practice for student entrepreneurship. So there's a small, small difference in the name, but a di big difference in what they do, because these people are staff, members of staff at institutions, and they advocate for student entrepreneurship within the institution. They also organize things like the InterVarsity and uh, Student Entrepreneurship Week in their institutions. So they do really important work and we will also be sharing their names with you. So go and meet those people. They are the ones who, who are on your side in any case. Then thirdly, we want you to participate and learn. So the first learning opportunity, of course, is SEW like we've just had, but it happens annually. So later in next year, you will see SEW 2021 happen. And uh, once again, we want to, to invite you to come to the table for this, come and join the action. And hopefully that will be a blended event, both online and on campus. Then your other opportunity for learning is if you are already a student entrepreneur, if you're a studentpreneur, you already have a business, then you cannot miss the Indaba 2021. 
that's a networking and learning opportunity for student entrepreneurs who already have businesses. And when you see notice, uh, notices about the Eddie Lechotla 2021, know this is aligned with that event and it will be taking place in the first week of August, hosted by the University of Pretoria. Also a blended event at the stage, COVID permitting. Step four, you need to make your business visible. And how you do this is, of course, by participating in the entrepreneurship intervarsity. So if you, if you see this year, now in three weeks, if you look at the finals, you'll see what the competition is. You'll see what the others are doing. And next year is your opportunity to enter and participate. But then there's something really important coming up that is new. And that is any woman, any woman focused activities. And the first and most important one at this date is temporarily named Sweep. And we, we're not sure that this is the name that's going to keep because not everyone uh, enjoys the, uh, appreciates the uh, domestic association with it. So don't worry about the name, rather look at what we aim to achieve. We want to establish and we are, have approval to establish a student women economic empowerment project. We see that student women are, the majority of, of students are women, the majority, the vast majority of graduates are women but we see that women are cautious when it comes to business and we want to make sure that all the barriers are removed that prevent women from participating in business because we know that women who generate their own income are less vulnerable they have more options and they are better, better positioned to become leaders in society so sweep is a safety net of transferable and practical skills and opportunities backed by the foundation of academic studies, ensuring options in the economic participation of student women. So there you will just have to keep your eyes open for this. This is coming ladies out there. We need to do some big business together and we're looking forward to engaging with you. And that without any further comment, just our invitation to you is join Eddie in working towards ensuring that you and all students are equipped to participate in the economy. And that, Nsiki, is what I wanted to share with students. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. I have a little bit of FOMO um, that I'm not a student at the moment and I'm missing out. So I'm quite happy to see the new um, department has been set up for um, alumni people. So as an alumni, um, I hope I'll be able to engage with all the fantastic projects that you have coming up. But thank you so much for um, paving that road for us and showing us where we are going. And it's wonderful to see, to see that focus on women. And it's wonderful to have a specific focus on students on both sides of being in university and out of, um, that you know you're able to be part of a safety net and a community where you can continuously grow. I wish you all the best in making all of that happen. Thank you so very much. Now, if you've missed this week for whatever reason, here's a quick recap of what happened on Monday, which was day one of our SEW 2020. What's happening today is we are here to celebrate the National Student Entrepreneurship Week 2020, as we call it the hashtag SEW2020, hashtag AfroTech. We are doing things differently this year, where we are doing things virtually. Universities have submitted content from uh, what they are doing differently in their universities to celebrate uh, and drive entrepreneurship on their different uh, campuses and institutions. Uh, so we put that content together and we are coming live to you from Pretoria. 
I am looking forward to more student engagement. Today we saw over 600 students, um, you know, joining us online virtually through the Hoover app to, um, you know, connect with us, to view some of the footage that has been shared, to listen to the different messages. And currently as we speak, there's a lot of messages, networking sessions that are happening on the Hoover app. So I'm absolutely looking forward to the different engagements from the different students uh, in the, um, from, from the 26 universities. To the first day has been going well. I must be biased and say my favorite session was um, Dr. Nora Clark's panel discussion earlier on about um, entrepreneurship for the social good, the common good, um, and just being somebody who really likes social entrepreneurship. That was like my favorite. I love jacaranda trees, and like Pretoria has an abundance of jacaranda trees, so that's like my exciting point about being in Pretoria. <laughs> until tomorrow I'm Zigin Kize and it's been an absolute pleasure hosting with you and with you for yes. today. Thank you. A big thank you to our host partner, the University of Free State, who would have been the place where we physically had our event, but because of COVID, we couldn't. But they came together, they set up a virtual studio on their side, and they were able to make Monday happen and share fantastic projects on their side. And we had some great interviews listening to studentpreneurs uh, from their campus. Joining me live in studio now is Mrs. Zana Boso, who is the project manager for EDI. Uh, Zana, how do you feel, right? As project manager, it's like, who? Crunch time, crunch time, crunch time, and mm. the event happens, and you know, once we go action, it's out of your hands. Yes. Are you relieved? Are you happy? Did it go how you planned? Ntiki, I, I think this year, so many things were unprepared for. Um, so a lot of surprises this year. But I think um, SEW, um, our first virtual collaboration with you know, 24 um, institutions, and we've included our TVET colleges. So from my side, I'm very excited. Um, the fact that Eddie only goes bigger every year gets me excited, which means this, uh, no if this one it. was good, <laughs> next year's going to be better. And um, we hope to see everybody and more people um, participate in next year's SCW. Looking at yes. the engagement, I'm pretty sure we will. And speaking of next year, um, we also heard Dr. Clark mentioning future events to come. And I believe yes. you have a full program for us. Um, yes. So for those who are interested and they want to mark their calendars already, what is happening in 2021? So Ntiki, um, I'm going to very briefly take everybody that's watching through the uh, student focus projects mainly and then other projects related to that. Um, as Eddie, we have such a full uh, program and calendar next year, uh, which we are very excited about. But um, from a project manager side, it's important for us to plan ahead. So I'm ready to, to put things in my calendar and Eddie's ready for our calendar. So um, first up, what we have in store is obviously our uh, EDH Entrepreneurship InterVarsity, uh, which will be launched on the 24th, 25th of March next year. Our program is aligned to the academic program of, of next year, which uh, starts a little bit later. Um, as we understand, the academic um, calendar will start from mid-March, mm -hmm. so we are extending things a little bit, and I think uh, we would like to use this platform to, to let everybody know what they can expect so that they can also plan their calendars. But So we have, firstly, our InterVarsity launch, then um, together with that, from InterVarsity side, we also have obviously our internal rounds and our regional rounds. Uh, those will start from March up until September. Then the national finals will hopefully be um, in the end of Octo October, which would um, ideally be the 29th and the 30th of October. And then obviously our SEW 2021. Uh, the dates are going to shift slightly for next year, but we are aiming for um, mid to end September, uh, hopefully the 20th till the 24th of September. Then we have our very exciting student in Daba and um, 
you know, that is usually our event that we, that we host together with our annual Iriachi Um So we have, our, we have very exciting news and um, the University of Pretoria, we've already had our meetings and they're very excited and we are hosting that to, together with the University of Pretoria and we have confirmed the dates. So next year's event is already scheduled. Um, from the 2nd till the 8th of August. So the students in Daba, for all our student, uh, for our student audience, book the 2nd of August in your diaries. Then we also have the EDH annual kickoff event, which is a, an event, a com combination event, where we collaborate or include um, a couple of things. Um, this is aimed to be the 24th till the 26th of March. That's one of our first events taking place next year. Um, and part of that is our train the trainer workshops for our academics, uh, our support professionals, and then also we bring our four communities of practices together. And they meet, they have workshops, and they share best practices and also plan for the year to come, all their activities and their projects. And usually at that event we also launch our InterVarsity, so it's, it's a nice little event that we launch. Then, um, very briefly, our Community of Practice workshops will also be taking place at the Lechotla on the 4th of August, um, where they will also meet and greet and plan halfway through the year. And then lastly, something that is also interesting just to mention is we also, as Eddie host executive leadership workshops, our ELW, for our DVCs and our executive um, academics. And this is an opportunity for our DVCs to basically um, engage on the subject of entrepreneurship at universities and uh, discuss policies and things like that. So, Ntiki, let me not uh, take too much time. That is all I have for you now. The rest is to be confirmed, but there's a lot of other things lined up. No, I can imagine, but it's wonderful to hear that you've got this full program set up, that you are ready. Um, yes. But I'm very encouraged to hear that there's so many things that are focused for students or for the community around them to support yes. them to grow as studentpreneurs. So thank you so much, Lana, for sharing that with thank us. You. If you didn't have your calendar handy and you're a little stressed out, don't worry, okay? We'll share the stuff on social media and it will also be on the Eddie website, so you'll be able to go look at all those dates. And of course, closer to the time, invitations and all of that will go out, so you will not miss a thing. And if you are listening to some of the stuff and you Think, hey, I want to apply, I want to be part of this. How do I get into it? Don't worry, we're going to be speaking to Linda Zanza a bit later on to give us more details on that. For now, here are some highlights of what happened on day two. So I loved it. I loved today. Uh, I loved our presenters, the entire team behind the scenes is also fantastic. We have uh, our AD team pulling strings behind the scenes and, it's, and the program is looking great. So love it, love it, love it, love it. Today was incredible for me. Um, the fact that different universities are in support and are providing resources and spaces for even entrepreneurs to fail but get back up again. So, but I was really impressed by the launch lab at Stellenbosch University and the fact that it's not only mainly just to push you to be an entrepreneur because there was an incredible story of a lady there that had a failed project but then she became an intern now. Now she has an amazing job in a space company, something that she's passionate about. So that was a highlight of my day. The one thing that did stand out for me was UCT's contribution and they had Prof. Pekeng speaking a bit and encouraging student entrepreneurs. I think that it's encouraging to see that the VCs of the different institutions are also taking part and taking lead and you know leading those conversations and leading in those spaces to encourage entrepreneurs. So I believe in doing this we are dropping little seeds all over South Africa and there's going to be a great, great ripple effect. We will harvest a lot of students where we're going to meet them one day. So you know because of SEW 2020, I'm I'm now growing an incredible business. I'm now global. I've employed about a thousand people. So that's what is exciting to me. And, and I believe that this is a purposeful or a rather purpose-driven event and a purpose-driven conference where we, we are going to create or encourage and inspire young entrepreneurs to just take on the world and disrupt and grow and go to the global market, learn and just be big and big and big and big. And big. W, 
it's incredible to think how much happens in a day. And some of the stuff you kind of forget about it, then you see a highlight and you're like, wow, so much happened in that particular day. Uh, so I hope you were able to join us on day two and you enjoyed the content that we shared. And according to 50% of you on Hoover, um, when we asked the poll, day two was your favorite one. So I trust you enjoyed that highlight as well. Coming in um, from their virtual office, maybe it's at home, maybe it's at UFS, I'm not sure. We've got our partner from the University of Free State. I'll be speaking to Mr. Harat Karov, who is the director for contracts and innovation at the University of Free State. Welcome, Gerard. Um, you guys were supporting us in putting this event together, and it is a pity that we didn't, um, we weren't able to physically be at your university due to COVID, but I want to find out from your perspective, how do you feel about SEW 2020? And TC, thank you for this uh, opportunity, and yes, I, I'm really excited, and uh, when I uh, pinned down some, some thoughts on, on this week, I that first and foremost, I must say that um, in South Africa, our government uh, is always fiercely criticized. And if I just see what the Department of Higher Education and Training has done in, in the way of uh, EDI, but then also the Department of Science and Innovation, uh, those two departments really came to the fore uh, over the many years with um, uh, initiatives to support entrepreneurs and technology development and so forth. And that is very important uh, in that there needs to be an entrepreneur, there needs to be a very good idea that uh, can be taken to market. And then the last point there is that there needs to be access to market. And here I would like um, to take this conversation a step further. You said that the entrepreneur without access to market um, will have always will always have some difficulties to, to, to be successful. And in that regard, um, I'm willing to assist uh, Nora and, and, and the team to, to engage with departments like uh, the Department of Agriculture, for instance. Um, the speaker from Mapumalanga just before us um, pointed that out too. So, so in this region, agriculture is extremely important. Uh, in, in my region, Free State Province, it's also very important. And I, I can just see that if two government departments can get it right, get entrepreneurs going, get the the um, initi initiative going, training, etc. Um, surely we can get the third or fourth government department also on board and make sure that um, these entrepreneurs get access to market. Yeah, and that would be a great thing to see. Um, it also came out in the questions that we asked the studentpreneurs throughout the Hoover app that a lot of them did say they wanted access to markets and they wanted more opportunities, especially for youth. And I'm very encouraged after the presentations that came through from the University of Free State on Monday, the day one of our conference, to see the work that you're doing I and mean, what's happening in your incubation hub and how you've been able to support studentpreneurs. Um, I'm also curious to know from you, going forward, what are some of the key things that you would like to see coming out of SEW, especially for your specific campus? So for, for us, um, our entrepreneurship program, uh, we refer to it as uh, awareness, engage and activate. And uh, we've already done that uh, to a large extent is to align all your initiatives with Eddie's uh, initiatives. Um, it just makes uh, life much easier for us. And then it's interesting that the incentive of uh, having or, or, or entrepreneurs having the, the additional platform of the Eddy uh, InterVarsity competition, it just makes absolute sense. So the way forward for us is uh, to collaborate more and more with Eddy and to make sure that all our initiatives are 100% aligned. And I can even go as far as to say that uh, we have got some spare capacity to assist Nora and the team to, uh, to make this really a big thing. I like that alignment and I definitely like the sound of capacity to assist. I'm um, speaking of virtual students that are listening or people who are young entrepreneurs within the free state who are like, this university sounds great, they're doing wonderful work, I like the sound of the incubation hub. Are you guys open to um, other youth entrepreneurs in the area who might want your assistance? Uh, yes, um, in, in that regard we are already talking to local government uh, agencies, uh, this tier is, is, is one. And uh, we, we tried to, we already collaborating with our neighbor university, Central University of Technology, uh, because they've got uh, a very competent team of product development uh, people, uh, for example. And then our uh, TV at colleges as well. There's, there's a forum in the Free State uh, province already where all these uh, education institutions are 
meeting to see how we can uh, pull our resources together. But yes, uh, we are open for business for uh, all entrepreneurs, uh, although um, students is a remainder main fo focus. Fantastic. Karal, thank you so much for your time and just reflecting with us and taking a moment to say goodbye. And we want to say thank you very much to the University of Free State for partnering with us to make SEW 2020 a reality. Thank you so much, Karal. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. Coming back into the studio now, I have Linda Tlala, who is the Student Engagement and Communications Officer, and he's joining me live in studio. Hi, Linda. Hey, Tiggy. How are you doing? Very well in yourself. I'm good. So this is your baby, really. You know, you're the one engaging with students. You're the one that, you know, everyone's always crying and shouting in <laughs> your ear. How do you, you feel about how SEW 2020 has gone? I think, you know, like Dr. Clark mentioned, it was a new way of doing things. Um, I'm really excited that we were able to come together with our universities to be able to make this um, event happen. Uh, so very grateful to all the coordinators, uh, our champions at the different institutions who, you know, when we made the call, um, sat together, put up the content, put up the uh, information. No, can we change the video? We want to add something else. So I think we went through a number of videos and presentations before we finally had the, the presentation, um, you know, final footage. So I'm really excited to see what, are you, what is happening at our different universities. When we travel, we only get to see it. But now we've given an opportunities to our uh, institutions, not only universities, but TVET colleges as well, to shine and to showcase what is it that they are doing on the ground as well. Fantastic. Now, I mean, we've listened to Dr. Clark earlier on. We had Zana just before, and she was sharing with us the calendar for 2021. And I'm sure there's students sitting at home, and they're like, everything sounds so good. I want to participate. So you're the man who's going to tell us how to participate. Yeah. What's happening with the community of practice? What's happening with InterVarsity? What do our studentpreneurs need to be looking out for? So indeed, the most important thing, um, the question that we get always is, who do I speak to at my university? And that was one thing that Dr. Clark mentioned uh, when she made her beautiful presentation yes. there. So mine is not going to be <laughs> as great as hers. But, you know, so to inform our students on who those coordinators are at their different campuses. So at the um, UNISA, University of South Africa, you can engage with uh, Ms. Juliet Mokoka. Um, she's a wonderful lady and is always willing and ready to assist. At um, the Northwest University, Anneli Stienkamp, who is also there that students can engage with. At uh, the University of Forte, you have Dr. Tendai Chamucheka, who is also ready to assist at any time. Uh, Dr. Patrick Ebeo at the Twane University of Technology. Um, at WUSU, Dr. Nebegazi Galata, who has just been joined by uh, Dr. Tobegani Lose. So they work together hand in hand. So you can engage with there. And one thing about WUSU is that they are currently working on a center for entrepreneurship rapid incubation. So we're waiting for that invitation. As soon as it's, um, it's up and running, we definitely will be there to, to congratulate uh, WUSU and, on that great achievement. Uh, at Durban University of Technology, at the Midlands campus, students can engage with U Mamnontogos on Ngobo. And at the main campus, they can engage with U Sisnon Tukanyile. Um, she's always ready as well to assist the different students. At the University of Cape Town, uh, a lovely lady, always uh, ready to assist. She is the convener of the Student Entrepreneurship um, COP, and her name is Madame Nadia. Madame Nadia. Madame. She knows that very well. <laughs> I always call her Madame Nadia. And then at uh, UKZN, there's a lovely team there. And uh, we usually work with uh, Uli Linjila, uh, who is also there. And just to mention Dr. Tia van der Weistensen, who is always, 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 always ready as well to assist whenever students call upon her with any questions. At the University of the Western Cape, uh, students can engage with Ms. Lana Franks um, at that university. At the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, students can engage with An An Anel Mayer. At Nelson Mandela University, uh, they can also uh, engage with Ms. Karen Sneiman, who is the co-convener for student entrepreneurship, co-community uh, of practice. At the Stellenbosch University, students can engage with Mr. Bre Brandon Pascal, who is the VP Innovation at uh, the Launch Lab. 
at the University of the Free State, uh, which is our hosting university. Students can engage with uh, Ms. Ayanda Ma uh, Makanya. At uh, Soap Lighty University, students can engage with Ms. Gail Mutlawudi. At the University of Mpumalanga, students can engage with Dr. Ferdinand Nimbanari, Nimbanira, who is always, always ready um, to, to, to assist as well. And just to uh, inform you that this Friday, uh, UMP will also be holding their internal um, Student Entrepreneurship Week. So we wish them all the best in that. So students from UMP, please engage and support your institution as they put the Student Entrepreneurship Week uh, together. At the Central University of Technology, uh, they can engage with Mr. Kareli Kutwana. At University of Limpopo, they can engage with Professor um, Tobega Nganwa, uh, as well, who is supported by Jimmy Mohale. At the University of Zululand, uh, they can engage with Mr. Tamsanga Umshengu. At uh, Sifako Mahato Health and Sciences University, they can engage with Mr. Taurai Hugwe. And at the University of Johannesburg, they can engage with Ms. Karu Badendach. And at, the un at Rhodes University, they can engage with Professor Tidi Muhapelo. Uh, so those are just uh, champions uh, at, the, at the 26 universities that we work with who support us in all our projects. In the different COPs, uh, they get very uh, involved. And just to mention the EDAG Studentpreneur Community of Practice, these are students that advise AD. Uh, they call us, they, they come and visit our offices. At times, uh, we have at the Central University of Technology, there's Mr. Sipe Zenane. At uh, Nelson Mandela University, there is Mr. Sandilem Jamba. And at um, Sifako Mahato Health and Sciences, we have um, Lerato Mpachele. And I know that Lerato has a lovely video there. All right, sorry about that. We seem to be experiencing audio on that video. Uh, so we move along. At the Twane University of Technology, there is uh, Mr. Trevor Shihundla. At uh, University of Mpumalanga, there is Mr. Tuso Chilwane. At University of Pretoria, there's Mr. Kamuhelo Maleka. At the University of Free State, we have uh, Ms. Refilwe Mohale. At the University of South Africa, we have Mr. Tabang Mufukeng. At the University of the Western Cape, we have Mr. Sia Guanya. At uh, Val University of Technology, we have Mr. Mordecai Ndrovu. At uh, Durban University of Technology, we have Ms. Nobutula Mavela. At the University of the Witwatersrand, we have Ms. Petam Kunu. At the University of Venda, we have Ms. Penduga Koni. At Mangosuthu University of Technology, we have Umiste Wandile Sihua. So Ntigi, these are students who are on the ground uh, and students who would like to uh, engage with EDAG and they're looking for someone to, um, you know, to work with on their different campuses. We'll make sure that this information is also available on our website so they can just visit www.edhe.co.za and we'll, uh, they'll be able to find out who to engage with at their university. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Linda. And I want to say congratulations to you for a successful event as well as to the whole team here at Eddie. Um, and I also want to say a big thank you and a big shout out to all the studentpreneurs, um, everybody who is part of the community of practice and supporting students yeah. as a champion in advancing student entrepreneurship on your campus. We really appreciate you putting up your hand. So thank you so much for that. We've come to the end of our event and we're going to wrap up, but obviously we need to tell you who won. Um, and I'm not going to wrap up by myself. I'm going to have my co-host, Usa Kumsu, who's been with me since you know day one to come back in you know and give you some wise words from Umchi Dose PE. Uh, so while we get Usakumzi back into the studio, a quick look at Hoover. I know a eh, hearts are palpitating, people are wondering if they're going to end up on the leaderboard. Hazra girl, you have done it. Okay, a big congratulations to you. You are number one on the leaderboard for today. So you walk away with a 150 Rand take a lot voucher. Um so 
Liquateur Maka. She's number three today, and she was number one on Monday. So congratulations to you. You were the, you were Monday's winner. Um, Damulelo, you were our winner on Tuesday, and Hazra, you were our winner for today. So congratulations to all of you and your 150 rand take a lot voucher. Um, someone from the team should have contacted you, but if you haven't spoken to anybody yes, please, yet, please just send a message to Zamaswazi on the Hoover app, um, and then we'll get your details and make sure that, that that information, that we get your information so we can get the gift out to you. And then looking back on our photo competition, our winner for the photo competition on Monday, I'm hoping we have his image so we can share that with you, but he had a very creative way of showing us how he was engaging with the event. Um, I'm just trying to find him in the photo section. Um, a big congratulations to him, and you um, will get a take a lot voucher from us as well, and you'll also be getting 150 Rand. And then for yesterday, in Damulelo, you were our photo competition winner, so congratulations to you. And we did run a social media competition uh, for people engaging with us, and we want to say thank you very much to uh, our winner for that, who's been engaging across all platforms. Um, and you put up a really nice post. Let me just check, at Belzua17, so Bezula Baltic, I hope I said that correctly. You are our social media winner, and you'll also be receiving a 150 Rand Take A Lot voucher. And he posted on Twitter today saying, it was nice having to attend the online SEW 2020 hashtag AfroTech Hashtag EDHE, big up to UFS Web and to EDHE students for hosting this event. I have learned a lot and I thank you. We thank you, sir, for engaging with us. Please also go onto the Hoover app and um, send a message to Zamaswasi, who's one of our organizers, and she'll make sure that you get your 150 Rand Take A Lot voucher. Um, and then also we'll just also follow you on social media as well to make sure that your voucher gets to you and that's it for all our winners guys thank you so much for engaging with us on social media thank you so much for engaging with us on hoover if you want to pick up on anything that you may have missed uh, we do have the live stream available you can catch us on our youtube page you can catch us on facebook and um, for some recaps but also hoover will stay open so you can always go back and look at um, a number of different things and as i said previously our community groups are still engaging. So while the virtual live stream does end, the virtual engagement doesn't. So please do continue to engage, connect, and speak to people via the Hoover app. So Kumzi, wow. we've come to the end. Binch, what is your final word for the people before we send you back to the Windy City? And hopefully you can take the gloomy <laughs> weather with you as well. Thank you very much, Ziggy. For me, it's all thanks. Thanks, Bayad Danki, Darabuwa, Nkosi. Thanks to everyone, thanks to the universities, thanks to the heads, um, thanks to the student entrepreneurs, thanks to the champions that keep on keeping on making entrepreneurship a cool thing. Entrepreneurship should be a cool thing. It should be a fashion, it should be a slag, it should be, you know, we must make a trend as much as we make every other thing trend. And I think if like, we're gonna take entrepreneurship anywhere, it's gonna be us, the youth, um, where is stock or real stock or is us having stock to sell. And what was your hashtag? Hashtag Iluantombo. <laughs> Come on, Ilo guys. Ilo, Ilo boy. Ilo entrepreneur. Ilo entrepreneur. <laughs> Make things happen, yeah. you know. Fight where you are. Use, like I've been mind blown away by many entrepreneurs that have used their own money to start their businesses to keep them running. So basically, for my end, um, is a thanks. Thanks also to the EDHE team. Thanks to MSM Productions. Thanks to everyone. And thanks to you. Hey. Hey. You see the energy Come I have. Come on, bitch. Look at me now. <laughs> Look at me now. We started from the bottom. Now, now we're here. here fam. It's now all we're you. Here. You know, so thank you very much, Ziggy, for everything and the energy and the vibes. So to everyone, thank you very much. Sakumzi loves you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sakumzi. It's been a pleasure hosting with you this week. And thank you so much to our sponsors who did make this event a possibility. Thank you to University of South Africa, to EDHE, Entrepreneurship Development and Higher Education, to the Department of Higher Education, as well as to UCDP and University of Free State, who was our co host we really appreciate you coming together to lend your voice and lend your support in growing the student entrepreneur community i just want to say to you that from the words of john c crosby mentorship is a brain to pick an ear to listen and the push in the right direction and if you're serious about entrepreneurship go out there and find yourself a mentor so that you can get that push in the right direction i'm thinking he said this is SEW 2020The University of the Free State is one of the oldest higher education institutions in South Africa. Established in 1904, 
we produce sought-after undergraduate and postgraduate students in seven faculties across three campuses situated in Bloemfontein and in Kwakwa in the Eastern Free State. Apart from being a university that excels in teaching, learning and research, we focus on making a social impact on society. Our character of caring and diversity provides the best university experience to students in the heart of South Africa. We are proud to welcome you to the first virtual Rectus concert at the University of the Free State. The performance you've just heard was by the Odeon School of Music Camerata, performed in the Odeon Theater on our Bloemfontein campus. This year, we are bringing you the talent of staff, students, and alumni to any location in the world. That is why the theme this year is so fitting, virtual virtuosity. I am Carmenita Redcliffe, and I will be your program director. A special welcome to our host, the Rector and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Francis Peterson. Now some background on this special event. Being presented for the fourth time, this concert was initiated by Professor Peterson in his endeavor to create a platform where staff, alumni, donors, friends of the university and other stakeholders can be entertained by the very best that Kufsis has to offer. I would now like to call on Professor Francis Peterson to welcome you. It is my privilege and honor to extend a heartfelt welcome to you. I am delighted that you could join us for one of the highlights on the university's annual calendar presented to you for the first time in a virtual format. Music inspires, gives hope, makes us believe in something greater and binds people and cultures together. These are valuable words, especially during a time when South Africa and the world are experiencing exceptional challenges. Included in this program, 
is a variety of individuals and groups that will perform items from various genres. Thank you to everyone who contributed to the success of the program. To our sponsors, Standard Bank and the Arts Trust, thank you for your continued support towards the musical programs of the university. Your support is deeply appreciated and valued. I invite you to enjoy the performance. Thank you, Professor Peterson, for your kind words. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome to the stage our next performers on our program, Cornel Miller and Manette Nokia Bowen, the Odeon String Quartet, and Simple Stories. Can you feel it rolling, baby? That's when hearts, when hearts collide. Can you hear them calling? Can you hear them echo inside? Can you feel the thunder? Can you feel it rolling, baby? That's when hearts, when hearts collide. Lives. 
What could have been My mind filling up with doubt But my heart believes with everything Why am I so afraid My dreams are too big for me oh, But this fire builds inside again I can do anything oh, Don't let your dreams come crashing down on you Whoa. Just know your dreams are the Whoa. ones that make you true This one's for the haters They try to shake us One's for the dreamers The true believers Fire deep inside us Nothing can stop us Oh, what's for the dreamer? Yeah. As I look in the mirror now, my reflections all that I can see, I can see, I can see, and I can't better look at how. These walls are closing in on me. No, no, no. But I can't give it all up. Whoa, My dreams are too big for me. Oh, but this fire feels inside again. I can do anything. Oh, don't let your dreams come crashing down on you. True believers, fire deep inside us, nothing can stop us. Oh, what's for the dreamers? Ha, one more time, let's go. Whoa, what's for the dreamers? Wow, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will agree that these performances are of the highest quality. 
please welcome to the stage some more wonderful talent. Tabo Longwane, Lucy Sehlolo, Ella Kotsa, PDA and Free State Youth Wind Ensemble. I don't 
Ladies and gentlemen, they say that all good things must come to an end. It has been a tremendous honor for me to be your program director. To all the performers, thank you for making this a special event. Let's give our artists a final opportunity to ensure that we all remember the spectacular concert. Thank you, stay safe, and take care of yourself and your loved ones. So close and now gone, and still so afraid of love. Oh, see, yes, oh, see, yes, see, so figure with Baba no man. Oh, see, yes, oh, see, yes, see, a good man of Baba, see, a well, la peche.